section one of discoveries essays in literary criticism this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org discoveries essays in literary criticism by john middleton murray the nature of poetry and now it seems to me intolerably presumptuous that i should have chosen this title for the little i have to say i chose it in a moment of excitement when i was possessed by the curious exaltation that comes to a critic as he begins to disengage as he believes the central golden thread of a poet's being you know of course you know the small wise sentence of anatole france to the effect that criticism is the confession of the adventures of a man's soul among books the older i grow as a critic the more essentially true does that sentence seem to be whether it is that i have some special liability to such adventures or that my mind is such that the adventures i do have take a peculiarly exciting form i cannot say but the fact is that there are moments when criticism of a particular kind the only kind that i care for utterly absorbs me i feel that i am touching a mystery there is a wall as it were of dense warm darkness before me a darkness which is secretly alive and thrilling to the sense this i believe is the reflection in myself of the darkness which broods over the poet's creative mind it forms slowly and gradually gathers while i read his work the sense of mystery deepens and deepens but the quality of the mystery becomes more plain there is a moment when as though unconsciously and out of my control the deeper rhythm of a poet's work the rise and fall of the great moods which determined what he was and what he wrote enter into me also i feel his presence i am obedient to it and it seems to me as though the breathing of my spirit is at one with his these are vague words i have none better to offer at this moment but i believe that this condition i have so roughly described marks a crucial point in the process of understanding an author's work in one sense it is then and then only that you know the work in this sense you will never know it more it has now grown into your deepest life experience you have entered into a secret communion with the master spirit and a strange possession has been made yours for ever but in yet another sense that is the moment at which you know the work least of all for when apprehension is most direct then is it most mysterious not in literature only but in all things throughout the universe of life of which literature is the symbol and the flower in all things the directest and truest apprehension we have is a sudden communication a sudden communion rather between mystery and mystery this is true of the attitude of the man of science towards the ultimate constituents of reality there is in all great scientific discovery a sudden and unexpected accommodation of the mind to something which is by the process which brought the mind to that point strictly unthinkable there is a mysterious change in the very nature of thought in order that it may make a closer contact with the nature of reality we may call it a sudden leap a sideways leap it is the prerogative of the scientific genius but in things simpler to understand and more common to the general experience the same great process holds the understanding between those who truly love each other is beyond the reach and scrutiny of their conscious intelligence they love each other but they do not know why or how the relation is at once too simple and too strange to be understood of the same order is our knowledge of a work of literature it is when it is most perfect a simple apprehension it may have taken days or months or even years of labour to reach it a time during which we are held to our task by the fascination of a tale or the incidental beauties of its telling when we live as it were from hand to mouth with an almost childish delight in the succession of sights and sounds unfolded before us it is perhaps only an instinctive presentiment that there is more to come or a dim awareness that there is a spiritual obligation upon ourselves to try to dominate a work which so obviously seems to dominate us which keeps us reading and re-reading ordering and arranging 
half consciously following half apprehended clues patiently yet almost blindly until we have a sense of the whole work as the tangible garment of a living yet intangible spirit just as beneath the stone drapery of one of those headless and heroic goddesses of phidias in the louvre after long and patient contemplation we feel we seem with our bodily eyes to see the divine and hidden limbs subtly stirred by the breath of life this is the moment of knowledge when all the words that a poet has spoken all the characters that a novelist has created appear to us as things in themselves no longer but as the inevitable conditions the necessary garment of invention through which a living yet secret reality was compelled to manifest itself in the material world there comes a moment when we seem to break through these conditions to that which is beyond them we seem to make contact immediate full and mysterious contact with something for which we have no single word we shall describe it if we belong to that class of human beings which is driven to describe things in order to be able to evoke them by their names when the reality is departed according to the context established beforehand by our habits of mind and soul we shall call it god or a deeper reality or the music of the spheres or the love that moves the sun and the other stars i prefer just at this moment to call it a rhythm of life for there is motion in it there is growth there is fullness there is a downward plunging to darkness and an upward soaring to light it is a vital motion in the greatest writers there is something grand and terrible in the sheer magnitude of this rhythmical upward and downward sweep of their secret path in the lesser it is constrained and circumscribed but in all writers who can claim a permanent validity the governing rhythmical motion is there there are great waves and little ones waves of the ocean and waves of the land-locked sea an immediate contact with this motion as it governs a writer's work a sense of it so close and so instinctive as to be well-nigh physical as though the great wave had caught us away from our personal selves and bore us with that part of its substance in its thrilling and sickening rise and fall is i believe the appointed utmost of our knowledge of a writer then we know him indeed with the knowledge that time cannot diminish we have lived with him but with him impersonally with what he was not with what he appeared to be all that we can do if we are by nature fordained to this form of wrestling with the ineffable is to try to make partially explicit this knowledge that we have to try if we are critics to show where the temporal garment is thinnest and sits closest to that which is beneath to indicate the moments when the motion is most visible to follow out in the very structure and detail of the work the secret pattern to which we have the key moreover i think that we are bound are by our own nature compelled to wrestle more and more with that which is greatest after all i believe that criticism is a personal affair and that the less we critics try to disguise this from ourselves the better on what excites and attracts and fascinates us in pursuit of our own completion in obedience if you like to our own secret rhythm which we also must have if our work is to be vital at all on that alone we shall have something to say worth hearing if criticism is indeed as i believe it is the confession of a soul's adventures among masterpieces then the greater the adventure the greater the interest and value of the confession a record of trivial encounters in books and in life must become merely boring if the recorder himself found them trivial perhaps the best critic is the one who finds no encounter trivial i can admit it and still be content to not acknowledge that i am not of that kind we are what we are and though we come to the knowledge late we come to it with relief with something of the same audible relief with which jean jacques rousseau in his confessions declared j'ai pris mon as yet i have taken my stand and we hear behind it the muttered implication i will no longer be bothered with that which does not interest me i will no longer torment myself to be like other men this lecture is supposed to be about the nature of poetry you will say that it seems to be about anything else rather than that about criticism and statues in the louvre and queer semi-mystical things called the rhythms of life i admit it at all events it is true so far and it is true so far precisely because when i re-read the substance of my lecture a little while ago it seemed only too likely that you might think it true at the end 
i began this introduction with the desire to apologize for any disappointment i might cause you but it is only too plain to me now that my nature is incorrigible instead of making an apology for trying to blaze a sideways trail i have merely been at the old game again with the pleasant and paradoxical result that in comparison to this irrelevant preface the substance it was designed to condone is almost relevant i might as well have begun at the beginning after all if i had i should have said that i was sorry but a lecture which i had firmly intended to be one on the nature of poetry had turned out to be a rather unorthodox speculation on the nature of shakespeare's poetry it was not exactly my fault when my head is full of a certain kind of thoughts i cannot turn them out to make room for others you know the latin line naturum expellus furca tamen usque recurred you may heave nature out with a pitchfork but she'll be in again before you can say knife not otherwise with me and i feel that if i had offered to lecture on keats or reparations or the fascist movement it would have turned out to be the same old thing shakespeare would have been the burden of my song so that compared to the enormity i might have committed mine will be a venial offence for after all shakespeare is simply the greatest of all poets and if it turns out that i have anything of import to say about the nature of his poetry i shall in fact have said it about the nature of poetry in general in a recent book of critical study sir henry newbold casting about for the emotional cause of poetry and the cause of its emotional effect upon ourselves discovered it in the poet's longing and our own for a land of heart's desire although we may at first feel that this conception is as romantic as its phrasing yet if we have an eye to the reality beneath the words and consider how much of memorable poetry seems to have been inspired by a longing for the things that are not we may finally be surprised at the scope of sir henry's conjecture shelley was made for it of course what does keats find in his nightingale and his grecian urn but a voice and a symbol of a more perfect condition far away from this world of time here where men sit and hear each other groan wordsworth fits it well with his blank misgivings of a creature moving about in worlds not realized and so in our day does walter de la mer dreaming of the shadowless asphodel of a kingdom where neither moth nor mortality doth corrupt but even poets much less averse than these two accepting their fate as sons of earth reveal in their songs a longing for the things that are not catullus wememus mea lesbia atque amemus my lesbia let us live in love was once perhaps a poem of triumphant love and it may be only our knowledge of the bitter sequel which makes us read it as a pathetic prayer for security in a passion where no security is but we do read it so love poets are but seldom the singers of happiness and love and the greatest love poet of our own times thomas hardy has given an expression that is immortal to the intolerable anguish of desiderium with some good show of reason we may say therefore that the characteristic emotion of poetry is a longing for the things that are not for permanence amid change for security in unrest this evermore unrest as shakespeare called it for eternity amid mortality and this emotion is not peculiar to the romantic modern soul it exists in classical poetry as well as in our own it is in homer it is in virgil in aeschylus and euripides and theocritus and nearer poets have perhaps done no more than make the longing more conscious and give it a more definitely subjective expression bright star would i were steadfast as thou art is only a more personal statement of a theme than is truly secular to poetry it seems to have been more natural to the poets of old to voice their longings through the creatures of a created world so that aristotle looking upon their practice could define poetry in terms that seem to us strange as an imitation of emotions and actions at first there seems to be an unbridgeable chasm between this definition and sir henry newbolt's description but the gulf narrows the more steadily we look into it the greeks saw chiefly the thing that is made the modern sees chiefly the temper that goes to making it and the gulf is bridged altogether by that english thinker who stands midway between the old world and the new the poet says francis bacon submits the shadows of things to the desires of the mind and again the use of poetry hath been to give some shadow of satisfaction to the mind of man in those points wherein the nature of things doth deny it 
the one of bacon's sentences explains the fascination which poetry exerts upon us the other describes the poet's activity the poet does not merely give utterance to a desire for the things that are not he submits the shadows of things to that desire there is implicit in the brief sentence a precious distinction between the methods and perhaps between the values of lyrical and dramatic poetry which is more often felt than formulated and perhaps something more valuable still is concealed within it granted that we feel there is in bacon's phrase a peculiar appropriateness to our own instinctive surmise of the nature of poetry suppose we were to attempt to apply it we should distinguish between the poetry of shakespeare and shelley somewhat after this manner shakespeare far more than shelley actually does submit the shadows of things to the desires of the mind there is an objectivity a substantiality in shakespeare that shelley did not achieve and again while we are conscious in both of the desire of the mind in shelley it appears much more as a desire perpetually unsatisfied even as a desire by nature incapable of any satisfaction the desire of the moth for the star we realize the difference most clearly if we consider the one sole poem in which shakespeare's inspiration seems strangely akin to shelley's the phoenix and the turtle is platonic and mystical it can be compared to shelley's sensitive plant the only reason why we do not think immediately of shelley when we read it is that in spite of all apparent similarity of conception the quality of shakespeare's poem is absolutely different from that of anything shelley wrote shakespeare is secure and serene in his poem we can detect no tremor of the agitation by which shelley is incessantly disturbed the phoenix and the turtle is mysterious but it is crystal clear we can express the difference only by saying that what shelley longed for shakespeare at that moment possessed it would not be easy to say with confidence what the phoenix and the turtle is about on the face of it it is a requiem over the death of a phoenix and a turtle dove who are the symbols of a love made perfect by refinement from all earthly passion and become virginal there is surely no more astonishing description of the highest attainable by human love hearts remote yet not asunder distance and no space was seen twixt the turtle and his queen but in them it were a wonder but the poem floats high above the plane of intellectual apprehension what we understand is only a poor simulacrum of what we feel feel with some element of our being which chafes in silence against the bars of sense and in the poet's own imagination it is reason itself which makes enchants the dirge reason baffled by the sight of perfect individuality in perfect union reason in itself confounded saw division grow together to themselves yet either neither simple were so well compounded that it cried how truest twain seemeth this concordant one love hath reason reason none if what parts can so remain whereupon it made this dream to the phoenix and the dove co-supremes and stars of love as chorus to their tragic scene beauty truth and rarity grace in all simplicity here enclosed in cinders lie death is now the phoenix nest and the turtle's loyal breast to eternity doth rest leaving no posterity twas not their infirmity it was married chastity truth may seem but cannot be beauty brag but tis not she truth and beauty buried be to this urn let those repair that are either true or fair for these dead birds sigh a prayer and we feel in some inexplicable sense that the poet's claim that reason bows its head in this poem is a true one there is an absolute harmony in the phoenix and the turtle which can easily appear to our heightened awareness as the necessary gesture of reason's deliberate homage to a higher power through it we have a glimpse of a mode of experience wholly beyond our own and touch the finality of a consummation this veritably we might say if we had the courage of our imaginations is the music of the spheres this is indeed the hymn of that celestial love which moves the sun and the other stars 
for reasons which evade expression in ordinary speech the phoenix and the turtle is the most perfect short poem in any language it is pure poetry in the loftiest and most abstract meaning of the words that is to say it gives us the highest experience which it is possible for poetry to give and it gives it without intermission here for once it seems shakespeare had direct command over an essential source of inspiration here he surrendered himself completely to a kind of experience and to the task of communicating a kind of experience which elsewhere he conveys to us only through the shadow of things for a moment he reveals himself as an inhabitant of a strange kingdom wherein he moves serene and with mastery beside the unearthly purity the unfaltering calm of this poem even the most wonderful poetry of his dramas can sometimes appear to us as stained with mortality this is the harmony of which broken and tumultuous echoes accompany the destinies of his heroes this is the knowledge of which the memory haunted macbeth or M macbeth's creator when he cried she should have died hereafter to-morrow and to-morrow and to-morrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time and all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death out out brief candle life's but a walking shadow a poor player that struts and frets this hour upon the stage and then is heard no more it is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing there speaks a despair beyond macbeth's it comes like a moan of wild and superhuman music into the play a divine visitation it is a despair beyond macbeth's for it is not the despair of crime but of mortality not of a murderer but a victim and it could have come even more truly from the greatest and noblest spirit in the world there is a potent reason therefore other than our own instinct for regarding these lines of macbeth's as expressing with a peculiar intimacy shakespeare's own thought and emotion they overcharge the play and are too powerful for the character or the situation to bear they do not contain the mood or the thought or the vision of thwarted ambition or detected murder they do not belong to macbeth therefore we must believe that they do belong to shakespeare and we have an exactly similar sense of emotional disproportion when we read the no less famous passage from the tempest and like the baseless fabric of this vision the cloud-capped towers the gorgeous palaces the solemn temples the great globe itself yea all which it inherit shall dissolve and like an unsubstantial pageant faded leave not a rack behind we are such stuff as dreams are made of and our little life is rounded with the sleep sir i am vexed bear with my weakness my old brain is troubled as in macbeth it is the sheer magnificence of the lines alone which prevents us from seeing them as dramatically inappropriate we feel and perhaps rightly feel that poetry so splendid can never be wrong after all if an archangel should interpose in a mortal argument we should scarcely charge him with irrelevance nevertheless these lines of prospero's are dramatically irrelevant they are unexpected and unprepared for and in order to value them at their true worth we must allow full weight to the fact that shakespeare quite deliberately represents prospero's vision of the unsubstantiality of the world as due to a disturbance of his mind prospero has had a sudden fit of anger against caliban ferdinand looking upon him sees vaguely that some passion works him strongly miranda who knows her father better declares that never till this day saw i him touched with anger so distempered but she is mistaken there is no anger in the vision it is resigned and serene yet with the suddenness of a flash of piercing insight and all the tumultuous agitation of a beating mind even more definitely than before we have a warrant for regarding these lines as belonging more nearly to shakespeare himself than to the character who speaks them the lines from the tempest are strangely similar to those from macbeth similar first in that both alike belong to what we may call the superhuman poetry of shakespeare of which the effect so greatly eludes our analysis and the felt meaning so far exceeds the meaning understood that in order to describe it at all we are driven even against our own will into semi-mystical metaphor 
and still more strikingly similar in that the sentiment in both passages is almost the same in both the poet suddenly sees the insignificance of human life and cries there is nothing serious in mortality but there is a difference between them whereas in macbeth he is angry embittered indignant and contemptuous and speaks with the gall of a man writhing with self-loathing for having been the victim of a long deception in the tempest the voice is quiet with resignation between the two kindred passages there is the great gulf which lies between rebellion and acceptance let us leave these clues for a moment to turn to another kind of passages in shakespeare's poetry which constantly exert the same hyperdramatic power passages of which he seems most constantly to be impelled by some force of his nature to express thoughts and feelings beyond those which the dramatic situation demands no poet in the world has dealt so vividly so lovingly and so strangely with death as shakespeare it is of course inevitable that any tragic poet should be largely concerned with death yet shakespeare's reaction to the thought of death seems to be wholly different from that of any other tragic poet it is a reaction quite peculiar to himself and so evidently beyond his conscious control that it appears with the same elemental force in an attempt at comedy like measure for measure as in the tragedy proper claudio betrays at the prospect of death the same queer mixture of horror and fascination as hamlet himself shakespeare we may say longs for finality in death and he passes from a condition of doubt to a condition of assurance of that finality as he grows sure death becomes to him more and more a triumph over life not at all or to be accurate not at all obviously in the christian sense of more jadnois because death is the gate of light but by the virtue of its mere cessation it has for him a meaning of which an echo has escaped into sir walter raleigh's phrase o oh, just eloquent and mighty death the thought of death as a period to mortality fills him with an exultation which finds its most characteristic utterance in cleopatra's it is great to do that thing which ends all other deeds which shackles accidents and bolts up change which sleeps and never pallets more the dug the beggar's nurse and caesar's and from shakespeare's middle period onwards the imagination of the death-bed as the marriage-bed continually recurs man the bridegroom will encounter darkness as a bride i will be says antony a bridegroom in my death and run into it as to a lover's bed the stroke of death says cleopatra is as a lover's pinch that hurts and is desired and to those who object that we are imputing to shakespeare himself sentiments which belong to the characters of his drama we shall reply that the fact that these sentiments invariably surge up through the smallest chink of opportunity proves that they are due not to the exigencies of the creation but to the habit of mind of the creator and we shall also reply that when at, as at the end of antony and cleopatra shakespeare's obvious effort was to lift his characters up to a pinnacle of truth and nobility these were the thoughts and feelings with which he naturally endowed them and further that those passages of his poetry which awaken the deepest and most disturbing echoes we are compelled by an instinct to reckon peculiarly his own the strange thing about these characteristic utterances of shakespeare is their compulsive power we may ascribe this to their extreme beauty but that is only to solve a mystery by a word and we are left with the same question in another form why are these utterances so mysteriously beautiful a vision of the insignificance of this life may indeed be the occasion of beautiful poetry but the poetry we expect from it is sombre and sad these utterances of shakespeare are neither the one nor the other even when as in macbeth there is anger and contempt in the rejection of life there is exultation also we are not cast down but uplifted by them it is hard to translate a feeling so mysterious into words without playing it false but we might attempt to render our reaction to these passages of shakespeare by saying that we feel that his rejection even when angry and indignant is not negative but positive he rejects this life because he knows of something better and truer even though the knowledge be against his will 
when he has pronounced that life is a tale told by an idiot full of sound of fury signifying nothing he is not left as other men would be naked to the cold wind of eternity he has some secret knowledge of which he cannot be dispossessed and of which he cannot dispossess himself he has a memory of some kind of experience beside which the actual experience of life is indeed trivial he had been too deeply in love with life to deny it easily and he was condemned throughout what is called his tragic period to hover between rejection and acceptance of an experience which transcended it it is true that he is in a sense the most human of all our poets but he is also the strangest and it is a mistake in proportion to minimize the strangeness and exaggerate the ordinary in him what then if we were to resign ourselves to a mysterious explanation of what is mysterious and to suppose that shakespeare had access to a plane of experience beyond our own and that he had apprehended as realities a truth a harmony and a love apprehended them as one and not as three which are not to be found on earth and are not to be fully expressed in terms of earthly happenings this apprehension in all its purity we should regard as fixed in the phoenix and the turtle where it appears for causes which we may look for if we will in what little we know of shakespeare's life as a symbolic vision of perfect and celestial love through which the white radiance of eternity shines without spot by what stress of soul shakespeare attained to this experience we do not know we can only guess but after this experience which was valid only so long as it lasted he was bewildered having seen something beyond the world he was bewildered in the world we can explain the preoccupation with death which entered into his work with the plays of the hamlet period hamlet and measure for measure followed immediately after the phoenix and the turtle and we can explain the apparent cynicism with which they are pervaded by appealing to the actual experience which is recorded in the sonnets what we cannot explain in such terms is the strange quality of this preoccupation with death the sudden extension of his poetic range and his production of effects which we most naturally describe as superhuman his command let us say of a new majestic and unearthly music from this time onward shakespeare rejects life and he never accepts it again it is true that there is something which is often described as serenity in his latest romantic plays culminating in the tempest but to insist on this quality indeed to describe it by such a word is to exaggerate it and to distort the total effect of shakespeare's work for the serenity of the final period is not of the same order as the tumult and despair of the great tragedies the acceptance that is in them is not an acceptance of life it is something quite different it is an acceptance of its own rejection of life he is no longer rebellious against the discrepancy the utter hostility between the thing he knows and the thing which is he has tried to reconcile them shakespeare's tragedies are essentially nothing but the repeated attempt to express his knowledge in terms of this world that is why they are terrible and moving as no other tragedies not even the greatest have been we feel within them an overstraining of the human soul not for nothing does madness and hallucination count for so much in their structure shakespeare is torn asunder by the effort to express a perception which is not of this world in terms of events and characters which are they derive their mysterious potency from the double tragedy of which they are the record the tragedy of the characters and the tragedy of shakespeare who invented them in vain in vain not for our purposes but for his own intentions and in spite of the magnificent triumphs he was to achieve in spite of the incomparable victory which is represented by king lear and antony and cleopatra in the kingdom of art shakespeare's great tragic period ends in failure for himself he has attempted the impossible he has come nearer to achieving it than any other human being we know but the impossible remains the impossible and shakespeare fails perhaps you will understand from this brief indication what i mean when i say that the so-called serenity of the final period is not of the same order as the tumult and despair of the tragedies the acceptance that is in them is not an acceptance of human destinies but of the fact that human destinies are incommensurable with the experience that is beyond them there is a tremendous difference all the difference between winning a victory and accepting the necessity of defeat the tempest is no answer to macbeth or king lear it is rather a turning aside from an avoidance of their problems a giving up of the attempt at victory and as we have seen the most moving passage of the tempest stands clean outside the dramatic argument and is the most personal and the most resigned of all shakespeare's many variations on the theme 
there's nothing serious in mortality what is i believe a far more moment in shakespeare's final period than any apparent serenity is first his general listlessness his manifest lack of interest in what he was writing and second his constant awakening out of this indifference to portray an ideal of youthful love of youth itself which fascinates him his perdita his marina his miranda his florizel his imogen represents something more than a new fashion in romance i should say that their creator was trying to embody in these youthful lovers striving to make real to himself an imagination that a new race of beings might be born for whom the knowledge and the love expressed in the phoenix and the turtle might be not a metaphysical but an actual and lived reality they represent a final attempt to solve the problem by conceiving a generation for whose consciousness the problem shall no longer exist the beginning of the hamlet period i have said marks shakespeare's rejection of life this rejection of life is maintained to the end it is voiced by prosper at the last as well as hamlet or macbeth or cleopatra and in language as compulsive as theirs what governs the subtle and various modulations of mood which so deeply colour shakespeare's plays when the early period of confidence is past is not the attitude of rejection itself but the varying emotion with which the attitude is held in the hamlet plays the emotion is bewilderment as it were at the absolute incompatibility the sheer hostility between one one life one mode of experience and the other and at shakespeare's knowledge that he himself belonged to both on the one side the perfect virginal and suprasensual love of the phoenix and the turtle on the other the sheer luxuriance of the sensual riot in measure for measure in hamlet the crimes and disgusts of this world tearing to pieces a soul whose affinity is with the other in macbeth the emotion is blank and deadly despair irrevocably dark total eclipse but the despair is thrilled and made more dark by tremors of another experience macbeth is satanic the work of a lucifer who has seen some majesty and is tortured by the memory of it a black ninth of wave of loathing for human destiny surges through the play in king lear tremendous and awful tragedy though it is the black despair is lightened in no other play is the purely superhuman note more miraculously sounded and it is surely no accident that shakespeare uttered it through the lips of a foolish fond old man who wanders driven by the malignant cruelty of evil beyond the confines of reason in this one of the two greatest of shakespeare's plays we feel that he communicated more of his secret knowledge through human symbols than elsewhere in his work and that he forced the capacities of the poetry which is an imitation of emotions and actions to their breaking point through the fury of the elements and the fiercer fury of evil souls we hear a divine music an assurance of that which can be only by virtue of the forces which seem to deny it as far as we can assign a spirit which shines through the whole of king lear to any particular part of it it seems to radiate most intensely from the figure of cordelia the angry and gusty fire of kent's loyalty burns in cordelia to a pure essential flame the utmost sublunary destinies can carry of the more perfect fidelity which shakespeare had apprehended in the final act and by reason of the mutual disaster which is to engulf them lear and cordelia are lifted up into the condition of the phoenix and the turtle lear's very words we too will sing alone like birds in the cage contain a trembling mortal echo of their song and reason might chant over cordelia the dirge it chanted over them beauty truth and rarity grace in all simplicity here enclosed in cinders lie death is now the phoenix nest and the turtle's loyal breast to eternity doth rest loyalty i believe became for shakespeare more and more exclusively the earthly symbol of his highest experience it seemed to him that this relation between human beings could express with least distortion an image of another relation that he knew this relation more than any other seemed to vindicate the existence of some connection between the world of his apprehension and the world of human life and the diffusion of the radiance of loyalty through king lear and antony and cleopatra sets these two plays apart as the pinnacle of his expression in literature they mark his greatest triumph as an artist for the artist is the man who communicates his intuitions of an ultimate reality intuitions which have in themselves no shape or form or likeness through symbols chosen in the world of common experience he clothes his knowledge in the garment of invention antony and cleopatra is shakespeare's triumph as the artist waste after waste in antony and cleopatra finds its justification is somehow redeemed and explained by loyalty after loyalty Enobarbus, Eros, Antony, the great queen herself, Charmian and Iris, 
one after another make the sacrifice as though all the fidelity of which the human spirit had ever been capable were crowded in a magnificent crescendo into this single story in no other work of literature that i know does the spectacle of constant disaster make me conscious of such a profundity of calm and in no other play of shakespeare's is death so constantly presented as a sweet and longed-for sleep hamlet's torturing thought of the dreams that may trouble the sleep of death returns no more there is no railing against life like macbeth's but a tranquil acceptance of its end the true great characters speak in instinctive harmony at their taking off antony's unarm eros the long day's task is done and we must sleep and cleopatra's dost thou not see my baby at my breast that sucks the nurse asleep chime together on the full note of the play and it is there so amply sounded that even prospero's words for all their beauty are no more than a twilight echo of a midday plenitude in so far as we may speak at all of problems and solutions in shakespeare's mind it is not the tempest which resolves the knots of the tragedies but rather antony and cleopatra for antony and cleopatra does seem to answer the questions of the real world as it were in terms of the real world which the tempest does not and yet of course this answer is no answer loyalty and sacrifice suffering and disaster and death may indeed be the conditions under which the human spirit comes nearest to manifesting its kinship with a more mysterious reality but it remains the old paradox which has haunted men through a whole epoch of the world's consciousness ever since christ came on earth speaking strange words the greatest human minds have moved in obedience to their rhythm true life can only be won by the sacrifice of life he that loseth his life shall save it the appointed end of a perfect human love is death greater love hath no man than this that he lay down his life for a friend and christ's own crucifixion is the archetype of all shakespeare's tragedy the purest reality the purest beauty the purest love cannot by its own nature manifest itself here on earth without disaster but in disaster it can just as christ's earthly defeat is his triumph so the death of cordelia and cleopatra is their victory the paradox remains but it is a paradox which in some secret chamber of our being we understand i hate in speaking of shakespeare to talk of problems and solutions you cannot apprehend a living mind by such rigid methods but we have to expect that our vocabulary should be weak and uncertain and approximate when we are dealing with suprasensual things we have to reconcile ourselves to the knowledge that in whatever terms we talk of the essential shakespeare we shall do it wrong being so majestical to offer it the show of violence but indeed instead of talking of problems and solutions it would be nearer the truth to say that king lear and even more immediately antony and cleopatra themselves composed the tumults they awaken the security of a purer experience illuminates and calms the riot of mortal issues in them the magic of shakespeare's poetry touches its zenith being constantly quickened by an apprehension of a reality which transcends and informs it a mysterious effect of surpassing genius by which the characters seem ultimately to be governed in their act by the beauty which is manifested in their speech their lips at last merely utter the cadence of their deeds when the god hercules whom antony loved forsakes him to the sound of music under the earth a more potent music enters into possession of his soul and leads him unerring to his destiny then this achievement poetry can go no higher for remember the word of aristotle though it is not the whole truth is true poetry is an imitation of emotions and actions only because it is that can it make its universal and permanent appeal the world of the poet must be a continuation of the world of ordinary human experience but that is not all poetry is also a submission of the shadows of things to the desires of the mind this imitation of emotions and actions is only a means by which the profounder intuitions of the poet can be realized and made communicable and in this description of shakespeare that i have attempted i have tried to show how in the greatest of all poets this twofold process was accomplished moreover i believe and perhaps you will have gathered why i believe it that precisely because shakespeare was the greatest of all poets he accepted his own essential and inevitable failure because his intuition into reality was deepest his was the deepest consciousness of the impossibility of ever fully and truly manifesting it through the imitation of emotions and actions no man has ever done that if ever it can be done the world and the human mind will be changed and this and nothing else i believe is what shakespeare is saying when he has given up the struggle with the impossible his perdita his miranda his marina these new-born creatures who look on the world with a new vision and cry like miranda o brave new world that has such creatures in it are merely 
the form of speech with which the great poet utters the truth of the great prophet except ye be born again ye can in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven and further i believe that it was because shakespeare also had by his own way attained to that knowledge that he cared not at all what happened to his great work and it was left to the pious offices of two fellow actors to save the most magnificent poetry of the world from oblivion poetry is relative but the intuition and the knowledge from which poetry is born is absolute and there is no reconciling them the greatest poetry is a compromise and shakespeare had reached a point where compromise and the effort of compromise had no more interest for him he was in a sense the ideal poet and he reached an ideal conclusion the more we understand him the more we can understand the essential laws of poetic genius and the nature of poetry itself poetry i have said is relative in order to be universal and comprehensible it must be but there is a poetry that may almost be called absolute the phoenix and the turtle belongs to this kind of poetry it is the direct embodiment through symbols which are necessarily dark of a pure comprehensive and self-satisfying experience which we may call if we please an immediate intuition into the hidden nature of things it is inevitable that such poetry should be obscure mystical and strictly unintelligible it is too abstract for our comprehension too essential too little mediated there is not much poetry of this kind because it is too personal and too esoteric to gain the general ear and it necessarily hovers between the condition of being the highest poetry of all and not being poetry at all but wherever in the scale we place it it gives us a clue to the nature of poetry itself for relative poetry which is practically the whole of what we call poetry is born of the adjustment of the human soul to the knowledge and memory of such an experience it comes of the effort to communicate this knowledge through a world of symbols and the highest among this relative poetry is that in which the symbols chosen from the world of our human experience are most completely saturated with the quality of this intuition i do not mean that all poets conform to the type of shakespeare after all he is too great to be used as a standard a smaller poet may have neither the power of direct intuition nor the genius to create a whole world through which to express it he may be chained to the world of the particular certain things may move him strangely and the emotion they arouse in him may pour over into his description of them then they also become symbols of an intuition which sees beyond the object into a deeper reality what i say is this that although speaking strictly there is no poet like shakespeare to every true poet whether great or small the process which was so tremendously exemplified in shakespeare must occur in some degree you must not hope to find in all poets the same terribly complex process of adjustment in keats who was a great poet it is ever so much simpler to understand in wordsworth the whole movement of his mind is almost transparent in smaller poets if there are true poets the effort of understanding their rhythm and scope is simpler still but these all belong essentially to the same kind of men and their poetry to the same kind of poetry shakespeare is only the greatest and most mysterious of all if we understand him we can understand all poetry and i feel that it was at any rate a right instinct which impelled me to devote this lecture to a consideration of him alone the nature of shakespeare's poetry is the nature of poetry i wonder whether i have persuaded you that this is so End of section one. Section two of Discoveries Essays in Literary Criticism by John Middleton Murray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Significance of Russian Literature. Significance is an imposing word, it is also a vague one. It may mean importance, it may mean merely meaning probably it is most at home and therefore most serviceable when it stands for something between the two let us say then that significance is important meaning and that in trying to discuss the significance of russian literature we are trying to elucidate the meaning it has which is of importance to ourselves and here again we may easily be vague ourselves are fluctuating nebulous things at best and even when we compel them to a shape the shape has many facets i for instance am a man and also a writer and russian literature has an important meaning for me in both these capacities it has taught me as a writer that the conception of art which still dominated english literature when i commenced apprentice is founded on a quite modern and one-sided emphasis on a single formal element in literature an exaltation of what 
pater called the qualities of mind at the cost of what he thought the more precious qualities of soul in other words russian literature has a quite peculiar significance in the purely literary evolution of modern times it has done more than any other single influence to diminish the prestige of the french conception of literary art that is without doubt an important meaning of russian literature but the importance is a special one if we were to analyse it we should probably find that it was only an outward visible sign of a significance of another kind nevertheless it exists in and for itself what we may call in the widest sense the technical influence of russian literature has been already considerable and is only beginning but the significance of russian literature as i understand it is far greater far more direct and far simpler than that the selves for which it has importance are the simplest most naked and most essential selves those elements in our nature let us say though it is rather unfashionable which desire before all things to be good russian literature is absolutely permeated saturated through and through with a sense of the problem of conduct not merely the great writers have this problem forever fermenting in their minds but the smaller ones also it not only directs the creative impulse in a tolstoy and a dostoevsky but in a gogol and a chekhov also now perhaps it might be said that this in itself is nothing new though i believe that the concentration of the whole force of a literature on such a problem is very new but what is undoubtedly new is the directness with which the russian writers naturally approach the problem the problem they are tormented by is the problem of conduct the question that is always present to their mind is how shall we live and the spirit in which they approach it is one that can only be described as a spirit of complete loyalty to humanity by that i mean that the russian writer holds it instinctively as an axiom that a way of life to be truly satisfying must be based on a harmony of the human faculties heart and mind must be at one there must be no piecemeal realizations if the claims of the moral nature of man are in conflict with the claims of his intellectual nature then the house is divided against itself and must fall what is good says the russian must be true in essence i suppose this is the greek attitude but the mere thought of comparing the greek attitude with the russian seems fantastic not perhaps because the attitudes themselves are so profoundly different as because the vehemence with which they are held is there is also another reason for the obvious unlikeness but of that later the first is a difference of vehemence no doubt some of the causes of this lie deep within the russian temperament but one at least we english are well fitted to appreciate the russian has been always denied the proper political satisfaction of man the greeks had that we have that the russians never now there are two principal gains to be had from the natural exercise of political activity one is the absorption of a great deal of spiritual energy which has to find an outlet somewhere the other the habit of compromise the practical sense of allowances to be made not so much for other human beings as for life itself the instinctive knowledge that life cannot be perfect that it can be at the very best only an approximation to the heart's desire that it is an oddly imperfect mixture and that we have to accept its imperfection the russian on the contrary had a vast amount of spiritual energy not thus employed and he was not compelled by the inherited wisdom of centuries of experience to acquiesce in the imperfection of life he employed his energies in scrutinizing it passionately passionately yet in a sense abstractly in the tiniest detail yet speculatively the mere fact that he could not touch the pattern made him the more convinced that it ought to be perfect i do not wish to lay too much stress on this contrast it is important i believe but i also suspect that in regarding this peculiarity of the russian spirit as the consequence of its political history we may be taking for a cause what is really an effect what seems to us as englishmen a failure in the russian to evolve a political system which could satisfy his energies may not be a failure at all 
it may simply be that the russian is not deeply interested in the kind of life which we regard as natural to man we have for example to reckon with the fact that so many great russian writers either made their peace with the autocracy or declared themselves indifferent to political reform as a thing of no spiritual consequence for the moment we may take our choice either the peculiar intensity of spirit which finds expression in russian literature is the consequence of the denial of normal political satisfactions or the cause of their absence the old autocracy and the inverted autocracy which has now taken its place may be symptoms rather than causes of a spiritual state which is strange to us the strange spiritual atmosphere is there and we must try to define it further perhaps we could get nearer to it by considering another paradoxical element in russian literature the most casual student of russian literature during the nineteenth century and one great fact about it is that it all belongs to the nineteenth century is struck by the immense contrast between the creative literature and the criticism the criticism even of men like bielinsky and Bigailovsky, seems oddly inadequate to the literature they seem so different as to be almost incommensurable the russian critic is forever judging an author by the political views he expresses or this seems to be the most fearful crime of all by the political views he omits to express this is if we reflect intelligible enough under the censorship of the autocracy it was inevitable that literature should have to carry the weight of meanings and interpretations which are primarily political it was the only medium of expression a book by a great writer was a political utterance and if there was a studied absence of political intention in it it was and perhaps more fundamentally still a political utterance we can understand the phenomenon but what makes it more interesting is that the russian writers themselves accepted criticism of this kind they regarded it as natural and still more remarkable when they turned their hands to criticism themselves it was criticism of this kind that they wrote if you have read dostoevsky's novels and you have also read the journal of an author the regular periodical criticism which he wrote during the last established years of his life you will surely have been struck by the strange discrepancy between them here is an author of novels which for sheer psychological subtlety have never been surpassed writing criticism that is a compound of elementary ethics and visionary politics in the intervals of composing the brothers karamazov and there is the same paradox to be seen in tolstoy this appears a paradox to us and i puzzled over it a long while i forgot to take into account the position of the observer i forgot i was an englishman with a natural habit of looking upon politics and in a way upon ethics also as practical affairs i forgot that separation between the practical and the contemplative which is the source of our political strength suddenly it dawned on me that for the russian mind this separation did not exist that for it the temporal government of man was really only a symbol or parable of the spiritual and if i may be forgiven an imaginative flight into history that holy russia was really the modern embodiment of that strange half real half legendary institution after which our imaginations groped through the mists of the dark ages the holy roman empire into which charlemagne was inducted long centuries ago by pope hadrian then also the division between the temporal and the spiritual did not exist then also the political unity of mankind seemed a necessary conception simply because all men had immortal souls because they were brethren in christ and on earth must be the equal children of the two great vicegerents of god that some may say is a mediaeval conception it is but it is not less sublime for that the holy roman empire as the mediaeval mind conceived it lasted but a little while the holy russian empire has lasted but a little while i do not want to point the parallel between them but only to suggest that by imagining the holy russia 
of the nineteenth century as in some sort a recurrence of the holy roman empire of charlemagne by realizing that their strangeness is in some essential qualities deeply similar we can perhaps more easily appreciate the peculiarities and importance of the russian spirit and the literature in which it is expressed for one thing the closeness of the correspondence which was in the time of charlemagne's empire expected between the spiritual and the temporal condition of man is disconcerting to us we separate them utterly whole periods of our history have been engrossed in divorcing them religion we say is a man's private concern no doubt that is a valuable practical lesson we have learned how valuable we may guess from the fact that the rest of the world has come to us for it but the point is that it is only a practical approximation religion is not altogether a man's private affair if one religion enjoins upon him the duty of brotherly love and another to spoil the egyptian the political tradition of the west is to make a man's religion indifferent by preventing him from spoiling the egyptian we fix the rules of conduct according to our practical knowledge of what men will do if they get the opportunity and feel that we can safely leave the motives of their conduct to themselves we are wise in this generation we live under the reign of law we are so used to it that we do not even notice it perhaps i can put the strange difference in the temper of russian literature best by saying that the russian mind does not naturally live under the reign of law the act has not for it as it has for us a fixed and final importance in itself the act is only a manifestation of a thought or a belief or a desire and often conversely what a man thinks or believes that must he act just as the spiritual and the temporal were inextricably knit in the russian empire under a caesar who was himself the embodiment of state and church together so in the individual russian act and belief were one there is no separation between the practical and spiritual man therefore what i called roughly the problem of conduct which underlies russian literature is not as the phrase suggests to us chiefly a practical problem it is not so much a question of how shall a man act as of what shall a man believe and when the famous russian critics seem to us to be putting crude and rather irrelevant questions to famous russian authors they are in a sense speaking in parables a political dogma has for them a whole background of religious or spiritual conviction the russian mind i have said does not naturally inhabit the kingdom of law for it an act is not a definite discrete thing it is as it were merely a facet of a thought and immediately there emerges the reason or at least one reason for a quality of russian literature which impresses the most casual reader the moment you take the emphasis off the act and put it on the mind expressed in the act the inclination to definite moral judgment diminishes and not only the inclination but the possibility also only so long as it is viewed externally or legally does an act remain a thing which we can judge right or wrong with the same positiveness that we pronounce a pillar box red begin to consider acts as parts of thoughts and certainty vanishes thoughts and beliefs may be wrong of course but right or wrong they have a look of inevitability you begin to feel that a man cannot help thinking in a certain way any more than he can help the color of his hair if you can make instinctively what is for us the difficult leap which separates the act and the thought you cannot help going farther and seeing the thought as an aspect of personality and personality is a thing given ultimate irreducible and in some way miraculous and sacred you have given to the practical and spiritual nature of man a unity which you cannot again divide by a moral judgment the russian mind or at least the mind of russian literature is not merely free from moral prejudice but profoundly averse to moral judgment of any kind it has what some people would nowadays call a scientific attitude towards the conduct of men but it did not reach it by way of the scientific outlook and as a matter of fact the spirit of russian tolerance is in quality as remote from scientific indifference as it is from the english spirit of toleration the russian eye sees humanity in a warm light science in a bright but cold one on the other side our english toleration is a practical virtue 
we hesitate to interfere but do not hesitate to condemn the russian hesitates to condemn but he would not hesitate to interfere our wisdom has been acquired by centuries of political experience and experiment the wisdom of the russian mind of another kind than ours hangs round it like a cloud of glory and cometh from afar hence you have the further paradox again only apparent that a people which has more than any other a spirit of tolerance almost divine has only the most rudimentary conception of personal freedom as we understand it i hope these distinctions will not seem to you tedious why are drawn and almost casuistical in a way they are subtle but i believe that they are also fundamental to me entering into the russian mind is like entering a world of another spiritual dimension there is a strangeness everywhere everything is exciting and everything is odd and one is conscious intuitively of a logic which holds this unfamiliar universe together yet one finds it hard to give a clear statement of its laws i mean that the difference between the russian attitude and our own is at once both simple and profound we have only to look on life with changed eyes but to render an account of the change that is necessary is perhaps more difficult than to make it the instinctive suspension of moral judgment which i have tried to explain leads straight to some strange consequences the russian as much as any and more than most is conscious of the presence of pain and evil in the world but he is far less able than another to ascribe it to guilt in the individual he is forced to believe in an evil and a good which are absolute rather i should say this is what he desires to believe in this is the kind of certainty in which his mind could rest and the desire to discover such a certainty is i believe the driving impulse in those great russians whom their countrymen so simply and superbly named god seekers dostoevsky lavished himself upon imaginary conceptions of this type men who deliberately violate the moral law who consciously trample on their own conscience in order to discover whether retribution will follow will god punish them to prove that he exists behind it all is the feeling if man may not condemn god must if god does not condemn there is no god ah yes it may be said but the russian idea of religion of christianity is less terrible than that the real christianity of russia is based on the belief that god is love that also is true the russian mind does instinctively fasten on the figure of the christ who is in a sense the incarnation of the highest russian morality but the distinction which all men in some measure feel between christ and god the russian pushes to an extreme they set such value on christ the man that they cannot truly conceive him as christ the god christ is a morality but god must be a truth the god for whom the god seekers spend their lives in searching is he to whom christ called at the last my god my god why hast thou forsaken me these remarks on religion were inevitable because the figure of christ has a cardinal importance for the russian attitude tolstoy and dostoevsky whose imaginations were haunted by him were in this as in so much else only the great types of the russian spirit the great russians are so often men of whom dostoevsky's words hold good they love christ so much that christianity is impossible for them still we may regard the impulse of the god seekers more generally as a single form of the russian hunger for an absolute i would almost say the russian hunger for absolutism the russian mind contemplates a world in which it cannot judge and cannot condemn some one must however judge and condemn if life is to be practicable at all so the russian mind is often content in temporal affairs to leave the power of judgment and condemnation to an arbitrary power it is prepared if need be to find a spiritual justification for it as dostoevsky did and two other great russian writers tolstoy and chekhov were in their hearts political indifferentists this attitude of theirs it seems to me is only a practical manifestation of the desire which is constant in the russian mind the desire for a certainty which cannot be questioned life as the russian mind sees it is infinitely fluid not a checker of black and white of good and evil but a vast expanse of shining gray in life the russian mind takes everything for granted it sees the excuse for everything but it makes up 
for this instinctive tolerance by an amazing dogmatical rigidity where we should least expect it in intellectual things a political theory can become in russia as sacred as the divine word and we have lately seen one propagated with all the inquisitorial appurtenances of fire and sword again dostoevsky could be monstrously unjust to turgenev simply because turgenev believed that russia might learn a good deal from western europe and yet again tolstoy could be monstrously unjust to the whole mind of man simply because in his hunger for an absolute he had decided to find one in the soul of the peasant any one who reads tolstoy's what is art or dostoevsky's attacks on the westerners without knowing their novels would conclude that a great russian was necessarily a great bigot he would be wrong hopelessly wrong the intellectual dogmatism of the russian mind is in inverse proportion to the tolerance of the russian soul it is also as i have tried to indicate a consequence of it the russian pardons so much that when he does try to condemn he cannot be judicial the attitude is foreign to him but russian dogmatism is a secondary quality it is peculiar and disconcerting and for that reason worth attention but it is not an essential quality of russian literature it is the product of a desperate intellectual reaction of the russian spirit against its own instincts the russian writer grows weary of accepting everything he feels that he is removed only by a hair's breadth from accepting nothing that universal sympathy is next door to nihilism as it is and he clutches at a certainty in the hope of repose but he finds no repose the russian spirit cannot repose it is restless and wanders over the face of the earth seeking a home in vain when dostoevsky said that the russian wanderer needs the happiness of all men wherein to find his own peace he spoke the truth but the truth is double-edged we may regard it either as a statement of the deep disinterestedness of the russian spirit or of the utter hopelessness of its efforts a man who depends for his happiness on the happiness of mankind is doomed to misery he will be all his days a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief and here i think we touch upon the central reality of russian literature the secret of its fascination and its significance complete acceptance nihilism these are the poles of the russian spirit they belong to each other they are aspects of the same reality and both alike are strange to us the range of russian literature is greater than that to which we are normally accustomed i carefully refrain from saying that it is greater than the actual range of english literature for reasons which i will try to give i can perhaps put the relation best in this way there are notes at the upper and lower end of the octave which are not habitually sounded in western literature and these are constantly sounded in russian literature these upper notes have a direct relation to the lower notes they depend for their existence upon each other but it is difficult to sound them both except in literature that is representative that is in the drama or the novel in pure poetry it is possible only to sound the upper notes when english poetry had its most comprehensive form when it was dramatic you have both the upper and the lower notes sounded in shakespeare supremely but in some of the other elizabethan dramatists also in marlowe at moments in webster at moments but in our other great literary period at the beginning of the nineteenth century which was a period of non-dramatic poetry you get only the upper notes and we do not pay a great deal of attention to them because they are isolated the upper notes here have not the dark volume of the lower notes evidently behind them to drive their significance home to us i will return to this and try to make my meaning clearer but for the moment i will only say that the habitual range of russian literature which is almost entirely a literature of representation a novel literature is greater than the habitual range of our own perhaps we have no writer save shakespeare who has expressed in the sense in which tolstoy and dostoevsky and chekhov express it an attitude of complete acceptance that is to say an apprehension of human life as something which in all its manifestations exists in its own right do not forswear the beggar's wallet or the prison says an old russian proverb and though we may think of many western writers besides shakespeare who have not forsworn the beggar's wallet or the prison if we think of them again we shall find that they were conscious in spite of their seeming acceptance of the underworld that it was another world than their own 
they may have crossed the dividing line but they never forget that the dividing line is there separating the sheep from the goats the good from the bad the successful from the unsuccessful they are aware of their own condescension but the russian writer is not his difficulty is not to forget that the dividing line exists but to believe in its existence at all to judge between good and bad between successful and unsuccessful says chekhov somewhere in his letters would need the eye of god you must take that literally it means that a man precisely because he is a man cannot judge that sounds familiar enough in our ears we have heard from our youth up judge not that ye be not judged we know the words well enough just as we know i say unto you love your enemies but the reality beneath the words what man of the west has ever dreamed of believing in that or who among englishmen has ever left the judgment of the wicked or the punishment of his enemies to god why our whole civilization is built upon the very opposite of such beliefs and rightly so built we feel that such beliefs do not work indeed they do not work but it seldom crosses our minds that in putting aside beliefs that do not work we have prejudged the issue we never say to ourselves perhaps the truth may be that the importance of these dark sayings of the founder of the christian religion may be precisely in the fact that they do not work that they are utterly and absolutely impossible in practical life that they mean that the man who would see god has to take hold of life in his two hands and throw it into the abyss that a complete christianity is a complete nihilism now i do not want to make out that russian literature is completely christian in this mystical sense but i do want to persuade you that it is more christian than any literature has ever been it is fantastic and strange and fascinating to us in the same way as the sayings of christ are fantastic and strange and fascinating one feels that the spirit which moves it is always making towards a desperate gamble with human life that it will take any risk in order to have ultimate certainty in order to see god tolstoy's end his wandering out into the darkness to meet his death alone his throwing away from him in a final symbolic gesture all the happiness of that life with which we are chiefly concerned is characteristic of a central impulse in russian literature it is the feeling that there is a secret of life which can be discovered only by a strange sacrifice and that life must remain unintelligible until it is discovered men of science also talk of the secret of life but for the secret of life in that sense the russian cares little or nothing he is tormented by the desire for an answer to the question why is the world of men what it is and his torment is more intense because he knows better than most men exactly what the world of men is he has looked upon it without blinkers without rose-coloured spectacles no other literature brings us into direct contact with life as russian literature does tolstoy on the one hand dostoevsky on the other seem completely to have explored the universe of human action and thought and it is precisely because they see so much and so clearly that they are haunted by the question why now the christian answer i should say more generally the religious answer to this question is that god has ordained it so the man who can truly accept that answer is the religious man but only he can truly accept who has truly seen the russian writer does not accept the answer herein he shows what i have called his loyalty to humanity if god has ordained it so then he replies like chekhov i must see with the eye of god if there is a harmony then it must be a harmony that is visible to man if it is visible to god then man must be able to be god this torturing debate goes on and on throughout the works of dostoevsky dostoevsky more obviously than any other russian writer set out the argument in an intellectual and imaginative embodiment you have it completely uttered in the brothers karamazov ivan karamazov returns god the ticket if there is a harmony he says he will refuse to accept it the pain which has been suffered by one single child will make a discord nothing can atone for it even if one day it were to be revealed to him that there was a harmony says ivan he must make haste to refuse it in advance he will not pay the price for it nevertheless precisely what ivan refuses his young brother alyosha experiences directly and because he does actually experience the harmony ivan's gesture of refusal is impossible for alyosha there is no logic in this consummation it is a miracle ivan's refusal holds good so long as this miracle is withheld even though ivan himself acknowledged that strange love in his bowels for the sticky buds 
but that instinctive love of life and the intellectual rejection of it could never be reconciled nothing short of a change of consciousness a new way of apprehension could serve the new way was open to alyosha the passage which begins with these words is familiar to all readers of dostoevsky he did not stop on the steps either but went quickly down his soul overflowing with rapture yearning for freedom space openness the vault of heaven full of soft shining stars stretched out vast and fathomless above him the milky way ran in two pale streams from the zenith to the horizon the fresh motionless still night enfolded the earth the white towers and golden domes of the cathedral gleamed out against the sapphire sky the gorgeous autumn flowers in the beds round the house were slumbering till morning the silence of the earth seemed to melt into the silence of the stars the mystery of the earth was one with the mystery of the stars now the particular form in which this ecstasy of acceptance is expressed is peculiar to dostoevsky but i think you will find the process of mind of which it is the culmination and the culmination itself even more wonderfully expressed in shakespeare shakespeare's final period the period of pericles the winter's tale and the tempest is often called a period of serenity i do not believe that it was any more serene than dostoevsky's final period or tolstoy's or beethoven's i do not believe that the greatest men of genius are ever serene what happens to them i think is that they give up the struggle to understand perhaps i am rash to generalize but at any rate i should like to point out the strange likeness between shakespeare's serenity and dostoevsky's if you consider shakespeare's last plays you will find that common to them all is an emphasis on youth and a wistful half certain faith in it perdita imogen marina miranda ferdinand florizel these are the figures which haunted shakespeare's mind as it was growing old further you will i think admit that these plays of so-called serenity which are so often supposed to answer the problems of the great tragic period which began with hamlet and culminated in antony and cleopatra do not in fact answer those problems at all the plays of the final period are smaller in scope the general effect is something as though the beethoven of the ninth symphony and the great mass had finished up as mozart beautiful magical but as it were dancing aside from the full shock of human destinies so shakespeare in his final period turns aside from his own problems we feel that he is weary of them that he has found them unanswerable in terms of the human existence from which they arise what he does is to create a new generation of beings who trail their clouds of glory with them still young hearts about which the shades of the prison-house will never close minds for which the burthen of the mystery for which the heavy and the weary weight of all this unintelligible world is lightened is more than lightened has ceased entirely to exist shakespeare looked forward in imagination to the birth of a new race which like miranda would look upon the world with the rapt eyes of wonder o brave new world that has such creatures in it shakespeare's mirandas and perditas are the counterpart of dostoevsky's alyosha we cannot tell how far either of these men of genius believed in his own creation perhaps less than we do but the meaning of the creations is the same i point this parallel in order to show what i hinted at before that the preoccupations of russian literature are not really different from those of our own and perhaps this truth has been accidentally confirmed by the fact that the condition of mind from which dostoevsky sought an issue has been most naturally illustrated by a quotation from wordsworth i might equally have sought the illustrations in the strange disturbing text of the final version of keats hyperion the preoccupations of the russian spirit are not peculiar but universal what differentiates russian literature is the clearness and directness with which these preoccupations and the condition of mind from which they arise are expressed the way in which the creative energies of a whole literature were focused and concentrated upon them and the comprehensiveness with which they are presented the english genius in its highest manifestations not less responsive to these supreme spiritual issues rises more gradually than the russian from the realm of the practical consciousness the sudden speculative flight of the russian embracing the temporal and the spiritual in a single sweep the instant readiness to set the whole of earthly life at hazard the deep-rooted feeling in the russian soul expressed in the words of a russian critic that any answer is better than none these qualities are not quite central to the english genius and if they were precious qualities of its own would have to make way 
for them the difference i say is chiefly one of concentration the russian has not passed as we have through centuries of history spent in perfecting an existence wherein ultimate questions should not enter to disturb he has not the weight of inherited social wisdom to study from one point of view to retard from another his abruptness in questioning the whole scheme of things therefore the tempo of the russian spirit is different from ours and we are sometimes slow to recognize with our minds though we have recognized it quickly enough with our hearts the close affinity between the underlying motives of great russian literature and our own indeed russian literature is historically a fulfilment of our own the mastery which was ours at the beginning of the last century passed indisputably to russia but the problems which tormented our three great poets of a century ago wordsworth shelley and keats and more crudely byron are the problems which were taken up by tolstoy dostoevsky and chekhov in their simplest form they resolve into this how shall man be reconciled to life is reconciliation and acceptance possible byron presented the problem or rather himself embodied it in an imposing dramatic way which struck the imagination of europe and the father of russian literature pushkin is the direct descendant or disciple of byron though his poetry is far subtler and more magical than byron's ever was but byron was compared to the other three english poets i have named superficial and stagey he holds a larger place in the literature of europe than he does in our own his grandiose gesture was designed to be seen at a distance for a profound handling of the problem we must go however to wordsworth keats and shelley each of these men though two of them died mere boys fought out the issue to some sort of solution what the particular solutions were there is no time to discuss here they are to be found in tintern abbey in adonais and in the revised induction of to hyperion speaking roughly wordsworth found the answer in a direct intuition of an essential harmony in the human universe when with an eye made quiet by the power of harmony and the deep power of joy we see into the life of things so did dostoevsky's alyosha shelley's answer is really of the same kind though he uses the language of platonism that sustaining love which through the web of being blindly wove by man and beast and earth and air and sea burns bright or dim as each are mirrors of the fire for which all thirst and keats's answer is in his vision of monita from the height which none can usurp but those to whom the miseries of the world are misery and will not let them rest let me read the description of monita for that goddess is a wonderful symbol of the harmony apprehended by a great poetic mind then saw i a wan face not pined by human sorrows but bright blanched by an immortal sickness which kills not it works a constant change which happy death can put no end to deathwards progressing to no death was that visage it had passed the lily and the snow and beyond these i must not think now though i saw that face before her eyes i should have fled away they held me back with the benignant light soft mitigated by divinest lids half closed and visionless entire they seemed of all external things they saw me not but in blank splendor beamed like the mild moon who comforts those she sees not who knows not what eyes are upward cast an apprehension of harmony which includes and by including justifies all evil and pain is the end to which those three great poets strove and the quest was taken up by the great russians such a harmony if it exists is a thing of which the human soul under the present dispensation can have but fleeting glimpses and even in those who have it the moment of vision is followed by the moment of disbelief after he is told of the moment in which we see into the heart of things not even wordsworth can refrain from crying oh if this be but a vain belief the same doubt troubles them all so some of the great spirits like shakespeare and dostoevsky imagine a new race of beings whose vision of harmony shall be constant from whom the glory shall not pass away another giant tolstoy believes or tries to believe that the miracle will happen if he can throw his life away and face like lear the elements alone this titan who was of the earth earthy sees the most naked manifestation of evil in death in the cessation of the life which had been poured into him so abundantly and he passes more and more under the spell of the strange teaching of christ it is the most mystical and incomprehensible elements in that teaching which fascinates him utter humility and non-resistance to evil 
the man who was by nature the realist of realists who had the gift of recreating physical life as perhaps no one not even shakespeare had it before him rushes destiny driven into the most unearthly of all religions in the hope that he will thus be able to see with the eyes of god nowadays it often happens that to say that a literature is inspired by the question does god exist provokes only a slightly contemptuous smile what an odd and provincial concern whisper the wise young men of to-day literature cannot have a moral purpose literature is art but great literature happens to be a great deal more than art it is art used for the presentation of the deepest issues of human life and the deepest issue of all is precisely this question does god exist but we have to understand the question it means is there a harmony in this various contradictory and pain-ridden world of ours the existence of god means that there is such a harmony and again before we have the right even to put the question so we have to be deeply conscious of the apparent discord oppressed by the problems of pain the words of keats are true none can usurp this height by those to whom the miseries of the world are misery and will not let them rest of the russian writers that holds good pre-eminently i have tried to give some reasons why it is truer of them than it is of the writers of most nations unless they belong to the highest order the russian has not learned to attach the names of good and evil to acts he attaches them to beings those who like most socially civilized nations think of good and evil chiefly in the form of acts come naturally to believe that evil is eradicable an evil act can be punished or prevented but an evil being is much more elemental and so the russians see the problem of human life much more nakedly than we naturally do hence also comes that quality of, of an almost divine sympathy with the social outcast which is to many of us the first attraction felt when we enter the world of the russian mind the russian is more acutely more immediately conscious of the discord so he is more acutely more immediately conscious of the urgency of the question is there a harmony or is there a god this is the debate which in a thousand forms occupies the minds of the characters of russian fiction it is as absorbing in tolstoy and chekhov in Turgenev even as it is in dostoevsky it is more apparent in russian literature than in english but as i have tried to show the debate is really just as essential to the highest english literature as it is to the russian the form of the debate is different and that is all however in the work of anton chekhov the russian genius has definitely carried the debate further than it was carried before if the particular genius of chekhov is not as indeed it is not as great and commanding as that of tolstoy and dostoevsky it is perhaps more subtle chekhov begins at least he begins that portion of his work which we can call characteristically his with the unshakable conviction that there is no solution to the problem there is no harmony and he gives up beforehand the attempt to find one what is more in his work he deliberately concentrates upon human life in its least harmonious aspects where the discord is naked and most evidently beyond human resolution there is the hand of chekhov delicately revealing it without a shadow of mitigation in the dreary story the old professor can only say i don't know when katie asks him what she is to do she is broken and young he is broken and old he is too honest to deceive her the black monk leads his victim to a beatific vision of the universe to such an entrancing and celestial vision as was vouchsafed to alyosha karamazov and behold when his victim enters into his happiness he falls on the floor dead his dream was the dream of delirium or again in the lady with the dog there is no way out for those hopeless hapless lovers they read their future in each other's eyes and acknowledge it there is nothing to be done nothing and finally the cherry orchard falls to the inevitable axe the sound of the axe stroke echoes in our ears as the curtain falls on furs the old man's servant in the deserted house they have forgotten him harmony when we first read chekhov the very word the very idea seems only a cruel joke of the power which produced the consciousness of man to conceive it we think when we first read chekhov perhaps even more than when we read hardy of hardy's bitter speculation whether man's consciousness was a mistake of god's we think that i say when we first read chekhov but only when we read him first the second time our breath is caught with wonder what is this strange magician doing to us what spell has he cast upon our souls discord the extreme of discord and yet this music is divine fragments a medley of fragments yet this pattern is celestial these fingers that only touch life to destroy it bestow a breathless beauty on whatever they descend his extreme denial is an affirmation there is no harmony he cries and the very sound of his voice echoes the music of the spheres 
gentlemen were i to confess the whole extent of my admiration of anton chekhov i should be ashamed it is an adoration i know that he is not a great writer in the sense in which tolstoy and dostoevsky were and yet i think he achieved a greater victory than they did tolstoy went out into the night dostoevsky left us half finished a novel whose half is one of the two greatest novels in the world chekhov gave us the cherry orchard and for people like us who can watch the struggles of heroes but cannot be heroes ourselves chekhov's was the most precious gift of all tolstoy set up his everlasting rest in a symbolic gesture dostoevsky said that men must be born again to see the world with the eyes of alyosha there is a harmony perhaps it may be so they said and if there is or if there is not the most terrible risk is worth taking in order that we may know that was heroically said and heroically done those were great voices that will sound on to the end of humanity chekhov's is only a whisper but it whispers this perhaps perhaps the harmony is there all the time i've believed in nothing i've trusted nothing i've hoped for nothing but yet look look again you know the dreary story it is perhaps the earliest of chekhov's characteristic works in it he who was an amusing comic writer in the russian punch suddenly became a magician the old professor and katie meet for the last time he tells the story himself only one word only one word she weeps and stretches out her hands to me what shall i do but he cannot say he turns the conversation katie gets up and without looking at him holds out her hands to him i want to ask her so it means you won't be at my funeral but she does not look at me her hand is cold and like a stranger's i escort her to the door in silence she goes out of the room and walks down the long passage without looking back she knows that my eyes are following her and probably on the landing she will look back no she has not looked back the black dress has showed for the last time her steps are stilled good-bye my treasure good-bye my treasure there is the magic that makes a paradise of a desert of human hopes we look again we listen yes the harmony is there and if the harmony is where chekhov found it then it is everywhere he is in the great company of men of genius the latest born he comes the youngest son and there is no inheritance for him the greatest state of human life has been divided so he goes off alone into the waste and desolate places the dreary commonplace wildernesses of the spirit which are as like the wilderness of the heroic writers as the waste ground in a modern city is like the majestic jungles of the amazon chekhov goes there without hope without belief it is the last of all forlorn quests and he brings back the grail in his hands to my sense russian literature ends with chekhov he is the last great russian writer he is also the last great writer for he belonged to a generation after the two great writers who are living with us still he is the end of a period and the new period has not yet begun either in russian literature or in european we need not talk of chekhov's secret besides it is much simpler to share it in it by reading him but we may take from his notebooks a sentence which contains the mysterious accent of the last great voice of russian literature it chimes with the other voices it is only different simpler in some way stranger in others infinitely softer strangest of all in its power of taking one utterly unawares essentially all this is crude and meaningless and romantic love appears as meaningless as an avalanche which involuntarily rolls down a mountain and overwhelms people but when one listens to music all this is that some people lie in their graves and sleep and that one woman is alive and gray-haired is now sitting in a box in the theatre seems quiet and majestic and the avalanche is no longer meaningless since in nature everything has a meaning and everything is forgiven and would be strange not to forgive End of section two. Section three of Discoveries, Essays in Literary Criticism by John Middleton Murray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Anton Chekhov for some reason or other it seems an incredibly bold thing to write a book about chekhov one would need in one's words the voice which gorky said tolstoy was wont to use when speaking of the beloved writer a voice with some delicate intimate modulation with the quality of a caress to be less than exquisitely true in one's appreciation of what he wrote and was holds the menace of complete disaster what is the cause of this strange and particular inhibition why this particular fear 
the would-be critic thinks ahead and imagines his essay or his book before him there in the midst of his own words is a paragraph of quotation a sentence that might be taken from almost anywhere in chekhov's works and suddenly in the light of its rainbow radiance all that he himself has said appears fumbling and clumsy and vulgar it is the menace of one's own self-revelation that is frightening to write about chekhov is nothing less than an ordeal one cannot hope to emerge from it unscathed mr gerhardy has not managed that but it is no small thing for any one who has felt within himself the subtle and secret spell of chekhov to have the courage of the ordeal it may be in mr gerhardy's case partly the courage of youth in another ten years perhaps when chekhov might appear to him still wiser still truer and still nearer his confidence might have failed him he might then have been gently excruciated as we are by his juxtaposition of sentence after sentence from mr wells's the undying fire with sentence after sentence in which chekhov has allowed his characters to declare his faith mr wells is a man of genius but his genius is of another order than chekhov's where mr wells fumbles chekhov is certain where mr wells is crude chekhov is exquisite to set them side by side is to deal unfairly by the one and to show a lack of understanding of the other and all to no real purpose for their faiths like their sensibilities are of a different kind let us admit then that in such an attempt it was impossible for mr gerhardy to avoid making us wince by touching upon a nerve occasionally and let us remember that it is probably true that such a thing had to be done young or not at all then we can freely rejoice that the thing has been done for it is certainly better that it should be done than left undone still we have not yet touched even the fringe of the orb de main question why do we feel this intimate and personal loyalty to chekhov why is he set so close to our hearts that even the critic's minor misphrasings even the choice of a mistaken word should be felt as a physical pain we try to think calmly we are being ridiculous we say to ourselves foolishly hypersensitive if any one were to make these small mistakes about shakespeare or tolstoy or dickens why we should not care at all but alas the reply to this attempt at sober reasoning with ourselves is simply that the argument is only too true if it were shakespeare if it were tolstoy we certainly should not care but it is chekhov and we do so in the last resort it seems that we are sensitive about chekhov because he is a writer about whom if we feel deeply at all we feel in this intensely personal way his case is unique our reaction our queer desire to protect him from our own roughness to save him from the coarseness of all critical approximation at first appears to be quite independent of his greatness he is not a shakespeare he is not a tolstoy never in our wildest enthusiasm have we made a mistake in proportion about him somehow he does not invite such mistakes and after all this period of wild enthusiasm is a phrase not a reality there never was such a period our enthusiasm for chekhov never grows never diminishes we take him into ourselves and he is part of our lives for ever he is not great we say and then we wonder whether it is not precisely because we feel him so near to us that we refuse him the name we cannot tolerate that he should be removed from us to a mountain top and enveloped in a cloud perhaps it is not that he is not great but that we cannot afford to let him be and it may be that his greatness consists not least in this that no writer of whom we no more obstinately avoided the attribute or we may put what is ultimately the same paradox in this way here is a writer who is more intimately dear to us than any other whose truth is exactly our own truth whom we do not have to interpret for whom we never at any moment have to make allowances and yet his writing seems to us new not new in parts and old in others not new in method and old in substance but simply and wholly new it is passing strange this mystery of no mystery and exceedingly hard to hold firm before the eye of the mind there is no point on which to fix 
no visible mark of joining between his world his consciousness and ours chekhov calls for no efforts demands no abjurations nothing of that willing suspension of disbelief which constitutes poetic faith which was the inseparable condition of all literature before him we have it seems only to open our eyes and his world would be in front of us we open them and it is not there if we are writers we think for a vain moment of assimilating chekhov's method mr gerhardy thinks of it and the method slips through our fingers like quicksilver we try to fix it and we are left with a handful of airy negations no plot no ornament no construction no lies and the smiling despair of this conclusion that chekhov wrote like chekhov because he was chekhov and that if we want to write like him and who would not we must be like him to see his world is not after all merely a question of opening our eyes but of opening other eyes than ours in harnack's history of the western church is told the story from which of the fathers it comes we have forgotten of a christian who was hailed before a roman magistrate the magistrate asked him how it was possible for him to believe in such a simple religion it was in the very early days of the church a creed so naked that it gave the mind nothing to take hold of whereas the superb complications of roman mythology offered an anchorage to the least prehensile of minds and the christian answered that the secret of his faith was the mystery of simplicity mysterium simplicitatis this haunting latin phrase cavernous with spiritual profundity yet in its whole effect so lucid and childlike is the one we should choose if we were summoned to describe chekhov's work in a word he is still accused as he was accused by Merezkovsky thirty years ago of writing about failures of being grey and depressing and painful and it would be vain even to attempt to reply to a charge so manifestly based on insensitiveness to what he was were it not that his own comment on the criticism has the luminous directness of the mysterious simplicity that was his one would need to be a god he said to decide which are the failures and which the successes in life and when we read that we suddenly remember that the great tacitus had no doubt to which class belonged the fellow of the name of christ most of all it is this quality of mysterious simplicity in chekhov's presentation of life which first prevents us from regarding the depths of understanding below it is as though he understood not only that life was so but also that it must be so as though he knew a secret and the secret as all true secrets must be is very very simple so simple that we cannot recognize it we can recognize only a strange enchantment in what he shows us a strange and haunting quality in his words we look and listen and we feel that we are trembling on the brink of a knowledge so incredible that it cannot be we do not know what to say we cannot understand what is happening in ourselves we are overwhelmed by a single feeling which when we try to hold it before our eyes splinters like light through a crystal into contradictory emotions laughter tears pity love and one knows not what infinite and unfamiliar tenderness from our depths yet these are blended and made one by a kind of sacramental solemnity we have been made partakers of a mystery and chekhov works this magic on our souls again and again and again we could choose the endings of twenty of his stories quote sentences by the hundred from them in which with no essential diminution through the veil of a foreign language the miracle is accomplished for a single instance take the ending of the lady with the dog then they spent a long while taking counsel together talked of how to avoid the necessity of secrecy of deception of living in different towns and not seeing each other for long at a time how could they be free from this intolerable bondage how how he asked clutching his head how and it seemed as though in a little while the solution would be found and then a new and splendid life would begin and it was clear to them both that they still had a long long way to go and that the most complicated and difficult part of it was only just beginning the response which that awakens within us is an inaudible nunc dimittis set to some new and unknown melody we are grave we are quiet we are gathered to ourselves for our eyes have seen and our hearts have understood a mystery that which chekhov makes us feel he felt we cannot maintain the vision but he could 
what is a miracle to us was to him a faculty of nature he saw what seemed to our bewildered eyes immeasurably complicated and subtle things sub specie simplicitatis from where she stood life was exactly what life is yet it was one he did not need to exclude anything not a single one of the thousand seemingly insoluble discords which in our lives we know had to be set aside and ignored by him on the contrary where the discord is at extremity and the tangle most obviously beyond all solution this side of the grave to that point before all others he turns and lo the harmony is there in our everyday language in the framework of our everyday belief the situation in the lady with the dog would be to some impossible to others immoral to both manifestly intolerable and beyond all human remedy look again chekhov seems to whisper we look and everything is transfigured there is only one gesture for us if we have eyes to see to bow our heads in the knowledge that it must be so and not otherwise there are dangers in this word simplicity it seems that few people understand or if many understand few remember that there are two kinds of spiritual simplicity there is the simplicity of the child and the simplicity of the man the one comes before the great struggle of self-discovery begins the other when it is ended there is the simplicity of love's labour lost and the simplicity of the tempest of birth and of rebirth and our language is still so far from a final perfection that we are compelled to use one name for both or to describe the second condition by metaphors taken from the first the simplicity of chekhov is very wise and very old it is an achievement wrung out of much knowledge and surpassing inward honesty chekhov began to learn very early in his life at a time when most englishmen are still schoolboys he had learned not only to bear but to accept an overwhelming burden of responsibility read the letter to his brother which he wrote when he was only twenty-six it is an incredible document for it contains the humanity and the wisdom and the humour which even men of genius are not wont to acquire till they are old and this personal heritage of experience important though it was is less important than his impersonal inheritance of the great explorations of tolstoy and dostoevsky who had brought the european consciousness to a verge there was nothing for it if chekhov was to be at all but to be a new man and that is what we feel he was those amazing letters of his which come so near it to us are simple and strange in a new way they seem to us perfectly natural more natural than any letters we have ever read yet they are quite unlike any other letters we have read they belong to a different kind they are informed by a new consciousness they are simple the attitude of which they are the natural product is simple but we sense in that simplicity a complete knowledge of all the complexities with which the modern consciousness is laden chekhov had somehow passed beyond all this mr gerhardi's instinct is right when he protests against the attitude of those who regard a marcel proust or a james joyce as the advanced outposts of the literary consciousness to-day chekhov is far in advance of them by his side they are curious antiquarian survivals of a superseded past chekhov's work is indeed a resolution of their illimitable intellectualisms his simplicity completely undercuts their complexities for chekhov knew where the intellectual consciousness was impotent and he knew it was impotent precisely for the apprehension of the eternal livingness of life entangled in the maze of complicated accidents it misses the essence in the duel von koren gropes in vain after some understanding of the impossible levski until at the last the rigidity of his honest mind is melted by a simple intuition into the nature of levski's being and the reconciliation which ensues is as profound as any of the more striking reconciliations in which the great drama of old used to culminate for chekhov who preached nothing deliberately in reality preached no less than this a reconciliation here and now achieved by an understanding not from the mind but from the soul or more truly from a reborn soul and as though expressly for our illumination chekhov in his notebooks isolated the quintessence of the reconciliation which is his essentially all this is crude and meaningless and romantic love appears as meaningless as an avalanche which involuntarily rolls down a mountain and overwhelms people but when one listens to music all this is that some people lie in their graves and sleep 
and that one woman is alive and grey-headed is now sitting in a box in the theatre seems quiet and majestic and the avalanche is no longer meaningless since in nature everything has a meaning and everything is forgiven and it would be strange not to forgive this condition which chekhov experienced when he listened to music we experience when we listen to chekhov it would be not impossible not inhuman not stupid but simply strange not to forgive this forgiveness is not the result of an effort indeed it is not what we understand by forgiveness at all the name has been carried from the past to define a new condition of the consciousness if one were truly conscious of some fundamental harmony if one steadily knew that everything had a meaning then forgiveness and unforgiveness would have none for they have meaning only in a world which is ignorant of its own and here perhaps we come nearest to the newness of chekhov what in other men would be some kind of intermittent and bewildering mystical perception in him was a steady mode of apprehension and because it was that it seems extraordinarily simple and intangible he makes no claim for himself he is perfectly ready to admit that he is lemonade compared to the strong drink of the great men before him or that they had purposes axes to grind and he has none yet imperceptibly we realize more with our hearts than our heads that he is single as those great men never were single he was harmonious where they were still divided he did not have to struggle his life long to forgive he forgave yet so soon as we begin to use these ambitious phrases we are afraid he who knew so much whose writing was so incomparably subtle who when we try to analyze him becomes so complex in reality astonishes us by the impression of his simplicity and it may be that after all the truest description of him is the most elementary that he was a different kind of man it happens with us in regard to chekhov as it happened with the man in his story the wife in regard to the doctor i listened to the doctor and according to my habit applied my usual measures to him materialist idealist money grubber herd instincts and so forth but not a single one of my measures would fit even approximately and curiously while i only listened to him and looked at him he was as a man perfectly clear to me but the moment i began applying my measures to him he became despite all his sincerity and simplicity an extraordinarily complex confused and inexplicable nature and nothing could in fact be simpler in itself and in its manifestations than this new consciousness of chekhov's there are in his letters for instance hardly any profound thoughts and yet the most trivial incident recorded in them seems to have a profound importance if he makes a joke we feel that nobody ever made a joke like that before it is not in the least as he sometimes pretends that he is too trivial to pay attention to the deep speculations and debates of the intelligentsia or that he is one of those would-be hierophants who reduce life to terms of some undifferentiated origin out of which life has differentiated itself he accepts all the complexities he sacrifices nothing he simply makes us feel that everything has a meaning and that he knows it of course he cannot tell us the meaning no man will ever be able to do that for knowledge of meaning can only come with a change in the nature of consciousness the more we try to make clear to ourselves the unique and essential reality of chekhov the more inevitable appears the conclusion that some such prophetic change had actually occurred in him so that he saw things with some simple and direct apprehension of their nature of which we can recognize the truth though the process eludes us the transparent simplicity of his descriptions of things which to other minds are intricate and complicated is disconcerting he wants to show that a man is in love with his wife this is how he does it that which in her words was just seemed to him uncommon extraordinary and that which differed from his own convictions was in his view naive and touching astonishing effects achieved by simple means have always been the prerogative of the finest art but these effects of chekhov's are different from those attained before him they do not make the impression of flashes of incredible intuition and far less of some superhuman gift of creation but of some quite human faculty of knowledge which unfortunately we do not possess 
the illumination is so steady and unemphatic that at first it often escapes us altogether then comes a period when we do notice it and put it down to some sort of deliberate method employed by chekhov mr gerhardy shows some of the signs of this period but finally we are forced to the conclusion that it was a natural function of chekhov's consciousness and his consciousness a natural function of his being chekhov does not insist but his lack of insistence comes not from a deliberate artistic purpose but by nature he is not resisting a temptation as we feel flaubert is resisting a temptation in for instance un coeur simple he is merely expressing a vision and stating a knowledge which are natural to him in his world it would be as strange to insist as it would be strange not to forgive it seems that at this point we begin to touch the secret of the intense and sensitive personal loyalty which chekhov's admirers feel towards him much more immediately than in the case of any other writer all that he wrote appears to us as a function of all that he was it is not easy to explain why the closeness of the relation between his seeing and his being should be so striking or so unmistakably acknowledged by us we have and know the letters and the notebooks it is true and these are more than such things are wont to be of one piece with his stories and plays but that is not the cause we knew the connection long before the letters and the notebooks were revealed to us the cause is rather that if we leave aside a few comic stories of his nonage there is an all-pervading unity in his work there is a point in his too brief life and it occurs unbelievably early after which there is no perceptible evolution in his work and above all no perceptible struggle suddenly he is mature and he remains mature and it becomes almost impossible to say that one piece of work is better than another at most we can have personal and irrational preferences every story every play every letter after this moment is new but all alike belong to the same order there was a moment when chekhov possessed his knowledge and possessed himself in a new way but why it may be asked because he possessed his knowledge did he necessarily possess himself there are two answers one that knowledge of this kind cannot be achieved without possession of oneself that sounds almost mystical therefore it is better to insist on the second which is that if the knowledge of the writer and by knowledge we mean his comprehension of life outstrips his own inward development no power on earth can conceal the traces of the conflict and contradiction in his work in chekhov's work these traces are invisible instead his powers are steady and equable there is neither sign of disturbance nor evidence of hesitation as is the work so is the man the work is new and true the man also if we could know the process of this inward development in chekhov we should know something of infinite value to humanity but like all things of the highest spiritual value it cannot be known if it were put into words we should not understand them any more than we understand the words into which still greater souls than chekhov have put their secret moreover chekhov was reticent about it practically all we have is a letter he wrote when he was twenty-eight to souverain in eighteen eighty-eight soon after his play ivanov had drawn upon him the attention of russia he is speaking of the play as far as my design does i was on the right track but the execution is good for nothing i ought to have waited i am glad i did not listen to grigorovitch two or three years ago and write a novel i can just imagine what a lot of good material i should have spoiled he says talent and freshness overcome everything it is truer to say that talent and freshness can spoil a great deal in addition to plenty of material and talent one wants something else which is no less important one wants to be mature that is one thing and for another the feeling of personal freedom is essential and that feeling has only recently begun to develop in me i used not to have it before its place was successfully filled by my frivolity carelessness and lack of respect for my work what writers belonging to the upper class have received by nature for nothing plebeians acquire at the cost of their youth 
it was chekhov himself who underlined the words the feeling of personal freedom of course it is a mere momentary fancy of his that personal freedom of the kind he means is the gift of nature to the aristocrat it is something which no man has by nature and very few be they aristocrats or plebeians achieve at all it is a sense of one's own personal existence and validity independent of all circumstance it is the profoundest of all kinds of self-knowledge and no one can receive it without paying the full price chekhov leaves us in no doubt what he meant if we read his letters carefully i believe he wrote elsewhere in individual people i see salvation in individual personalities scattered here and there all over russia whether they belong to the intelligentsia or to the peasants they are strong though they are few for this feeling of personal freedom of which he knew the importance and the cost is the mark of the true and completed individuality the sign of independent self-existence such individuals are the pioneers of humanity and on them the future of true civilization does indeed depend at another time also in a letter to souverain chekhov described the process as squeezing the slave out of oneself write a story he says of how a young man the son of a serf who has served in a shop sung in a choir been at a high school and a university who has been brought up to respect every one of higher rank and position to kiss priests hands to reverence other people's ideas to be thankful for every morsel of bread who has been many times whipped who has trudged from one pupil to another without kaloshes who has been used to fighting and tormenting animals who has liked dining with his rich relations and been hypocritical before god and men from the mere consciousness of his own insignificance write how this young man squeezes the slave out of himself drop by drop and now waking one beautiful morning he feels that he is no longer a slave's blood in his veins but a real man's chekhov states it so unobtrusively that we may easily pass it by and even if we notice it may forget how vital this inward achievement was to his real maturity as a writer so vital indeed that the truest of all brief definitions of his writings would be that it is the writing of a perfectly free man a man who has freed himself from all fears and has found that within himself which enables him to stand completely alone when a man has attained this freedom and unity in himself he does not need to send his intellect any more on fruitless expeditions after meanings somehow he knows the meaning and such a man can afford to love humanity as chekhov loved it for he is in no danger of entanglement he does not love for the sake of being loved and the knowledge of a free man is steady and unfaltering a possession for ever because there is in that which knows no variableness neither any shadow of turning we catch a glimpse of chekhov's secret we cannot know it wholly if we did we should be like him and to be like him would be to be far in advance of what we are but in so far as we do understand what he wrote and was and have a sense of the simple unity of his seeing and his being we are not surprised that chekhov's method has found so few followers nor do we wonder why the one conspicuous attempt to imitate him in mr shaw's heartbreak house is merely a revelation of a strange insensibility of mr shaw or why the juxtaposition of mr wells's declarations of faith with chekhov's is impossible nor are we any longer perplexed for the reason why we feel an intense and unique personal loyalty to a writer whom most of us know only in translation for we know that chekhov made himself a new man by a great spiritual victory that a kindred victory in ourselves is the condition of using his method and that the victory like all victories of this high kind was won on our behalf End of section three. Section 4 of Discoveries, Essays in Literary Criticism by John Middleton Murray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Marcel Proust. The most apparent phases in the evolution of literature are marked by a twofold change, 
a change in the intelligence and a change in the sensibility that find expression in it the writers of a new period seem both to know and to feel more than the writers of the period before them and these separate developments are bound together in the mesh of a continual interaction they feel more because they know more a man who has absorbed into his consciousness the aimless principle of natural selection develops a new nerve of sensibility which perceives isolates and emphasizes a quality of aimlessness in all experience similarly a man who has assimilated the freudian psychology will respond with a new awareness to every manifestation of the sex impulse in the life before his eyes every atom of new knowledge that is really apprehended and digested by the mind serves if not positively to enlarge at least to rearrange the mechanism of the sensibility in life we look for that which we know and feel that for which we are prepared the logicians assure us that it is impossible to know or feel anything besides but these epoch-making changes in the intelligence and the sensibility though they mark the historical advance of one period upon another and serve to distinguish phases of the general consciousness and of the literature into which it is projected do not necessarily mark an advance in the quality of the literature itself the change sensibility will respond to many elements in experience which have hitherto passed unnoticed it will emphasize and may easily overemphasize them it will be induced to fasten upon a new truth of fact as for example the ubiquity of the sex impulse under the strangest disguises and to neglect old truths of fact which are not less true because they are familiar as for example that the disguises which the sex impulse is compelled to assume are essential to civilization so that when we leave the historical or evolutionary aspect of literature for literature itself the significance of a change in the general intelligence and sensibility becomes dependent upon the degree of comprehensiveness that has been reached after the change an extension of the sensibility has in itself no literary value and even when the creative alchemy of art has intervened the expression of a new emotion will be far less significant than the expression of a comprehensive attitude to life into which the new perceptions have been absorbed the final purpose of literature remains to see life steadily and see it whole but the definition is insufficient because it may equally be applied to the scientist or the philosopher the writer sees and recreates the quality of life as a whole the quality of experience being precisely the element which is ignored by philosophy and science only in so far as the extension of the sensibility which comes with an advance in knowledge is made to heighten the perception of the quality of experience as a whole can it have a positive literary value by the aid of the new psychology we may be able to detect the working of the sex impulse in an incident of life where we did not previously suspect it but this power is useless to the writer unless it enables him to seize more completely the unique quality of the incident to compass its particularity as it were on another side and so make his grasp of it firmer if he imagines that this new aspect is the whole of the incident he is merely indulging in the simplification of science an extension of the sensibility has positive literary value only when it is a means towards the fuller penetration of the material of literature which is the quality of our experience we may perceive this quality in a new relation but this new relation does not supersede the old familiar ones it only helps to complete them when a young man of eighteen suddenly develops a passion for exquisite clothes and beautiful ties to say it is a manifestation of the sex impulse is true it may indeed be for the biologist a complete truth but for the writer it is a fragmentary and untransmuted fact unless he combines it with a hundred other perceptions of the boy's desire to be beautiful to be unobtrusive to be independent to be ideal so that it endorses and intensifies them he is an inferior man of science instead of as he often imagines a superior writer 
but if the new faculty of perception is brought into harmony with the old ones if the new relation in which the quality of experience is perceived does complete and not merely supersede the familiar relations it changes them all and when this new complex of perceptions is expressed in a work of literature the work will be unfamiliar however great may be its comprehensiveness and truth only as we persevere with it and accustom ourselves to the mechanism of the sensibility expressed in it will its strangeness begin to disappear whatever may have been our final judgment on the strange novel of m marcel proust du Côté de chez Swann, which appeared in the year before the war, and the book at least had this obviously in common with a great work of literature that it lent itself to judgment on many different planes. The persistent element in all our changing opinions was that it marked the arrival of a new sensibility. We were being made aware, in new ways, induced to perceive existence in new relations. We seemed to be drawn by a strong and novel enchantment to follow the writer down the long and misty avenues of his consciousness to the discovery of a forgotten childhood. And it was not as though his compelling us to enter into and share the process of his self-exploration was accidental. It was most deliberate whatever might be his underlying purpose m proust was not in the least like an artist who should leave all his tentative lines of his discarded sketches upon the paper the book opened with a description of the hypothetical writer who might be more or less than m proust himself but whom we shall for brevity's sake identify with him asleep and waking in the night in the effort to identify the room in which he is he passes through a series of memories awakened by the sensation of that effort and he proceeds to describe what is for him the archetype of that sensation namely his anxiety when a child at going to bed without his mother's kiss from this central point he explores the past and discovers the figure of swan a friend of the family whose presence at dinner it was which prevented him from having it all or having fully the kiss without which sleep was impossible he explores all avenues of memory until they are exhausted and he has given us a picture vague in some places and astonishingly precise in others of a childish universe in which swan is the mysterious hero and his mother and grandmother the guardian angels that picture like the vision of the robber golo which came from the magic lantern given him to keep his night terrors away disappears abruptly and the grown man appears again he is in his home in paris dipping a madeleine into a cup of tea again the sensation as he puts the cake into his mouth is mysteriously familiar he tries to empty his mind of everything else and to leave his consciousness free for the memory concealed in the sensation to emerge it returns from the past it is the taste of the sop of madeleine which his aunt used to give him he remembers the moment he remembers the room and gradually he begins to recreate another aspect of the past his aunt leonie's house at cambrai francoise the faithful servant and above all his walks du cote de chez swan on that side of the town where the road skirted swan's park the other side the other hemisphere of his world is du cote de jamont where the road never followed to its august destination leads eventually to the chateau of the duc de germont the great notable of the countryside and one of the greatest aristocrats in all france most of the boy's walking is done on swan's side however though most of his dreaming concerns the other nevertheless chez swan is hardly more accessible than the mysterious germont for swan has made a scandalous marriage since which the boy's parents have never visited nor allowed him to visit the house only one day when swan and his family are supposed to be away he and his father and grandfather take the short cut which runs through swan's park and the boy sees a freckled girl swan's daughter who pokes out her tongue at him he also hears her name called out gilbert again there is an abrupt change in the narrative 
the story of swan's love for the mistress he has married odette de crecy is told at length at first it seems to have no relation to the consciousness of the narrator it must have taken place before he was even born but although the history of swan and odette cannot have been obtained by any exploration of the mental hinterland such as yielded the first part of the story it becomes apparent that the behaviour of swan's mind during his love affair is governed by the same laws that operated in the writer's rediscovery of his childhood while swan's passion for odette grows hers for him cools but in the midst of his agony his knowledge and memory of their love seems to have dissolved senti et excruciatur but what he has lost he cannot tell until one night he goes to a musical evening in the faubourg st germain if we had to choose a single episode from monsieur Proust's enormous book as a sample of the whole it would be the twenty-odd pages describing this evening in a sense they are too good to be truly representative but every quality that can be found in them will be found in a more or less concentrated form throughout the work but whereas in the rest of the book they are often as it were held in solution here they are solidified into crystals that complete projection of the sensibility which distinguishes great literature is here beautifully accomplished since it is impossible to continue the description of m proust's book at length we may try to give an account of this episode swan the darling of the most exclusive parisian society preoccupied with his love for odette has given up frequenting it when he enters madame de saint Huvert's house on this evening what was once familiar has become strange to him he finds himself in an alien universe each one of the multitude of lackeys on the stairs each one from the first who appears to him mere mysterious at last with an accumulated sense of strangeness he enters the salon he sees a number of once familiar friends like himself wearing monocles but to-night their monocles instead of passing unnoticed are peculiar general de frobovillas seems like a wound that it was glorious to receive but indecent to display the marquis de forestels a superfluous cartilage whose presence was inexplicable and material precious when m de palancy's was like a fish by these curious and striking images we are made to feel how utterly foreign to swan is become his own habitual environment he stands near by a fashionable lady madame de francoteau and her country cousin madame de cambremet and watches their strange contortions to mark their interest in the music then the feelings of madame de galardon a connection of the germans are described then the young princess de lomme soon to be the duchesse de guermont enters madame de galadon makes a not too successful attempt to enter into conversation with her and is snubbed m de frobeville tries to be introduced to madame de cambray may's daughter-in-law the princess de lomme shows her contempt for the princes of the empire and catches sight of swan he refuses her invitation to germain introduces Frobeville to young madame de cambray may and longs to escape from this place suddenly the pianist begins a sonata and swan hears a little musical phrase to which he and odette had listened together in the salon where they used continually to meet all the particularity of his love returns with a stab in a moment of time he relives every incident of it after the episode which culminates in this incident the narrative returns apparently for good to the growing consciousness of the boy his childish love for swan's daughter his visit to the brittany seaside at balbec where he meets another love albertine and one of the less fashionable but authentic germans madame de ville parisi and her nephew robert de saint luc who becomes his intimate friend the death of his grandmother his entry into the central shrine of the germans by dining with the duchess herself his encounter with another germans m de jaloux 
these incidents are the bare skeleton of the three following volumes but they are treated with such a wealth of psychological detail that a summary of the incidents however lengthy could only be misleading we may leave aside provisionally the problem of m proust's deeper intention confining ourselves to the suggestion that his literary purpose has perhaps changed or developed in the course of his narrative for if as it seems his main object is to record the growth of a modern consciousness the brilliant episode of swan's love affair which can never have been present to that consciousness is in spite of its value in itself an alien element moreover the long and masterly description of the dinner-party at the duchesse de guermont also exists independently rather than in relation to the young man's consciousness he was in fact present at the dinner-party but we do not feel his presence there we do not perceive the company through his mind and this objection will hold good still even if we regard the scheme of the narrative so far as built upon successive contrasts between the dream and the reality of swann and the dream and the reality of germain m proust seems at times to waver undecided between the psychological history of a modern mentality and an anatomy of modern society nevertheless it is better to admit that on a canvas so large a strict subordination of every part to the literary purpose of the whole is not to be expected we are conscious that a single sensibility pervades all the parts even though the power of projecting it so completely as in the episodes of the musical evening and the death of the grandmother is intermittent and this sensibility is our chief concern the underlying motive which animates or law which governs it is that which appears so plainly in the first volume the dependence of memory and mental life as a whole upon association without the taste of medlin the boys passed at cambray without the petit phrase swann's knowledge of the realities of his love for odette would have been sunk in the dark backward and abysm of time this psychological fact at once governs the conduct of the narrative itself in so far as it is presented in terms of a single consciousness and determines the conduct of the various characters who appear in it more than this the act of penetrating through some present circumstances to a fragment of past experience which it seems to hold strangely concealed behind it is represented as a consummation of personality to enter into complete possession of the past by means of such present circumstances as to possess oneself wholly they are m proust says the door that opens upon la vraie vie this conviction of the writer can be interpreted in two ways according as we regard the whole narrative as the history of the consciousness of a writer or as the development of an extreme but none the less typical modern mind in one of the few indications of his own plan m proust seems to declare that his aim is to describe the evolution of a literary sensibility on the other hand the description of his vain endeavour to seize the significance of three strange familiar trees seen while driving in madame de ville paris's carriage at balbec suggests a larger scope to this activity of the mind perhaps we may find in the reference to the final and enduring penetration of the hidden reality a hint of the conclusion of the book considered as the history of an invisible vocation it suggests that at the end we shall find the writer deliberately and with all the resources of his will concentrating upon that very sensation of reminiscence the malaise at night in bed with which a la recherche du temps perdu opens such a doubling of the consciousness upon itself would make a fittingly subtle finale to the subtlest of all modern psychological fictions and present us at the last with a book which would be in essentials the story of its own creation but for the moment it is sufficient to regard the writer's conviction of the supreme importance of these acts of penetration as dictated by the knowledge of his own vocation as a declaration that the vraie vie is that to which the intuition of the writer has access and rather as a deliberate placing of the literary consciousness at the summit of the mental hierarchy than an assertion that complete possession of the self by this means is the highest moral and the most perfect accesses 
for all human beings what m proust undoubtedly does however is to represent this process of association as dominant in the mental lives of all men who can be said to live at all a writer's exclusive preoccupation with it is only a completer realization of a tendency which distinguishes the higher grades of consciousness it determines for instance swann's attitude to odette and his decision to marry her really rests upon it in more general terms m proust regards the life of man as a perpetual effort to penetrate an unknown the mind of the woman he loves the friend he admires the society with which he is acquainted this desire is indeed the very condition of love but this desire to penetrate the unknown of others is never satisfied we live in perpetual illusion the imagined friend the imagined lover the imagined society the imagined reality are never real suddenly by a devious way we hear of something said or done which cannot enter into our picture we are shocked and pained then we rebuild another picture no less illusory and imagine that this at least is true this recurrent theme of perpetual dissolution of impotent encounter with the unknown may be called the philosophical background of the book and from this angle we might regard it as a philosophical justification of the art of writing presented through the history of a consciousness for as the growing man turns away from the continual dissolution which is the only result of his attempt to penetrate the reality beyond himself he more clearly sees that the only reality he can hope to master is his own experience thus to enter into complete possession of the past by the method of which ducote de chez swann is an example is presented not only as the goal to which an invisible vocation was calling a particular person but in fact also as the highest end of man la vraie vie indeed in so far as literature is based upon that method of evoking the past through an associated symbol and it certainly is one of the chief elements in literary creation it is according to this underlying philosophy the supreme activity of life this concealed motive it is which differentiates m proust's book from all that have gone before the metaphysician might call it the history of a solipsist but such a definition would be as misleading as all other attempts to find a philosophical definition for a particular work of literature for though m proust is in a sense applying a theory to experience he is doing so by the strikingly novel method of describing the process by which the theory was gradually and inevitably formed in the consciousness which applies it if therefore m proust's book ends as we believe it will end in its own beginning it will have a unity in spite of the apparent discrepancy of certain of the parts of a kind which has never been achieved in a work of literature before it will be the first book in the world that has been the psychological history of its own creation and a philosophical justification of its own necessity it will belong in this respect to new order of literature and that is what we already vaguely feel as we read it it is something more than a book in an unfamiliar language more than a fiction of greater psychological subtlety than we are accustomed to for better or worse it marks the emergence of a new kind the arrival of a new sensibility that is its uncommon significance to find an approximate parallel in the history of modern literature we should probably have to go back to rousseau there we should discover the paradox of a man not primarily a literary artist whose work revolutionized the literature of the next hundred years m proust likewise is not primarily a literary artist nothing could be more significant than the length of the process of his finding his invisible vocation like rousseau he is ultimately compelled to writing as a satisfaction for his sensibility the chief point of difference is that where rousseau was compelled to express his sensibility upon alien themes m proust has been in the privileged position of one who could afford to wait for the truly inevitable occasion still the only work of literature with which a la recherche de temps perdu could profitably be compared is the confessions of jean jacques there is a real likeness between the driving impulses at work in these books and a careful comparison might enable us to determine the more important differences between the new sensibility of the eighteenth and the new sensibility of the twentieth century at all events a century of science has passed between m proust is not preoccupied with finding god but with finding la vraie vie though a previous quotation shows that where rousseau always did 
he sometimes does identify them but more apparently still a century of scientific psychology of astronomical physics of the biology of natural selection has intervened the last shreds of anthropocentrism have been worn away where rousseau felt his own isolation and was tormented by the discrepancy between his dream and the reality and could not reconcile himself to his isolation or his torment m proust can he accepts these conditions he formulates them as an actual law of human existence and the acceptance has been incorporated into the very mechanism of his sensibility he discerns in the world that which he feels in himself he is a rousseau to whom some of the hidden causes of his perplexity have been made plain and the detailed knowledge of a century of applied science is at his fingers ends to help him refine and express his sensibility how many times does he use the simile of a camera to make more apparent the working of two planes of consciousness by that means he expresses in a sentence a truth which lies behind a whole section of the fifth volume les intermentants du coeur where for the first time realizing the loss of his beloved grandmother months after her death the young man learns that the uniqueness of our most precious experience eludes us till the opportunity of it is lost for ever again when the boy occupied with the anxiety of obtaining his mother's kiss waits nervously at the dinner-table and on the same occasion having to take the kiss in public he had not even the time or the freedom of mind necessary and for a final example we may choose the part played by the duchesse de Jamont, tree which needs to be fertilized by an insect in the explication of the psychology of the closing pages of du Côte de Jamont and the writer's declaration such are some of the typical contributions of the science of the nineteenth century towards the expression of a sensibility shaped by its larger knowledge but in endeavouring to analyse the singular impression which m proust's work makes upon us and to isolate the elements which produce the effect of novelty in trying to investigate and assess its deeply rooted originality we are in danger of neglecting the more obvious qualities of a book which exhibits at least as many beauties as it conceals it needs no second reading to appreciate the subtlety of psychological observation the ironic detachment of the writer's vision of high parisian society if the dinner party at the germont is a masterpiece in a not wholly unfamiliar genre in the description of the musical evening at madame de saint Ouvert's, the same lucid irony is perceptibly lifted to a higher plane and made to subserve a complex emotional effect and though the biting witch which flashes home again and again through the narrative of du Cote de germont is of the very highest order in its kind though the semi-satirical portrait of the bien pensant ambassador m de norpois at the beginning of a l'ombre des jeunes filles is perfect they yield in impressiveness to the certainty of the single touch with which in the description of the grandmother's illness m proust sounds the note of the tragedy of death when the grandmother has had a paralytic stroke in the champs elysees and the boy suddenly sees son chapeau we feel we are in the presence of a great writer indeed and besides the command of tragic simplicity and wit m proust has also the gift of humour to appreciate this picture of life in the kitchen it is necessary to know that it was an established convention that the servants should not be disturbed at their lunch but it is not these qualities rare and valuable as they are which make a la recherche du temps perdu one of the most significant of contemporary works of literature they are precious qualities but they are in a sense superficial and they might be outweighed by the undoubted obscurity the awkward complication of language in large portions of the book it is something much more than a dark narrative with frequent gleams of beauty it is a book with at least one of the qualities of permanence and animating soul it is maintained by a high and subtle purpose informed by a view of life as a whole and because the secret fire glows steadily within it we feel the radiance through the most forbidding pages long before we are able to detect its source one consequence of this is that the m proust's language is sometimes alembicated to a point of grotesqueness he is style we might more exactly apply to him a phrase which he himself has aptly used of a great predecessor stendhal and say that his work has la grande assature du style a thing of infinitely more importance than limpidity or beauty in the detail of expression m proust's style in this larger meaning is as new and original as is the sensibility to which it owes its being End of section four.
section five of discoveries essays in literary criticism by john middleton murray this librivox recording is in the public domain the break-up of the novel the novel perhaps it is almost as pure an abstraction as the poem and surely if we were to attempt by a process of induction to discover the common element in all the works which have passed under that name during two centuries we should be left with something which though by no means an abstraction would be far from satisfying the ideal demands of the name the novel the residue in our hands would be the story a novel is a story in prose the novel should therefore be the story we are not much advanced and yet the simple change of the article has worked a minor miracle even if the story is only the most delightful story we find ourselves appealing to a new standard of judgment for what is it delights us in a story if we are children its mere unexpectedness no doubt and in so far as we remain children in our later years its power to afford us relaxation from the stress of practical life to that attitude of mind a story is a game a simple game or game with intricate rules hide-and-seek or chess problem fairy tale or detective story but a thing whose import is completely closed within itself a world which we enter if we can chiefly for the purpose of forgetting that acts have consequences but a moment comes it is the moment when we begin to talk of the novel when we make quite a other demands upon it we ask that the game should not be an interlude in our life but a significant part of it we begin by asking that the story should in the simplest fashion teach us something first perhaps that it should justify our notions of right and wrong then that it should reveal to us exacter and more subtle ideas of good and evil we ask that the story should be real and lifelike and we pass from demanding that the story should reflect our own conception of life to an attitude of expectation that it will throw a new illumination on to life the story which began as a game and remains a game for many becomes for others a high and serious art the two phases coexist and even to-day criticism hovers uneasily between the two conceptions it is aware of two standards of judgment and is uncertain which to apply and there is some reason for the hesitation for though it seems that we can make a clean logical cut between the story interest and the significance of the novel as soon as we attempt to apply the knife we find we are operating upon a living and organic whole the novel is something greater than its story indeed but can the greater thing exist without the lesser is not the story the skeleton which holds the flesh and blood and tissue of the novel together revolving some such unanswered question in its mind criticism confronts the novel to-day but as usual creation marches in advance of criticism while the critic is trying to make up his mind about the terms of the ultimatum he will present to the novelist the novelist takes the initiative and presents him with a fait accompli he annihilates the story the beginning of the process which has ended in the abolition of the story may be traced back far into the nineteenth century with the end of the early romantic movement came the decay of the conception that the novelist is primarily a teller of tales by the middle of the century the novelist who took himself seriously accepted with individual interpretations the principle that his art consisted in a faithful representation of life the novelist was the scribe and life dictated to him though many of the realists flaubert in particular felt uneasily that there was something inadequate in this mechanical conception it was dominant in the west for a generation the most original novelists endeavoured to vary the monotony of their task by introducing intricate considerations of form 
flaubert and henry james devised for themselves subtle problems concerning the angle of presentation and the identity of the hypothetical consciousness to which the events of the fiction were present they made the writing of novels an infinitely subtle craft and they increased its prestige and mystery for many years indeed to within the last decade their principles and subtleties were regarded with an awful reverence they were the nec plus ultra of the novel suddenly it is hard to say exactly when but we can safely date the revolution within the present century it began to be felt that while most of the modern novelists of the west had been circling in a technical labyrinth in russia had appeared two novelists at least whose work composed with but the faintest attention to these problems of the craft completely overshadowed that of their western contemporaries i will remember the appearance in the english review of nineteen twelve of mr arnold bennett's astonished confession on reading mrs garnett's then new translation of the brothers karamazov with his usual honesty mr bennett who had painfully formed himself in the school of flaubert acknowledged that jostoevsky was a master impatient of a minor perfection and that this impatience made not the slightest difference to his greatness the confession that the technical perfection of a flaubert or a james was after all only a minor perfection itself marked a minor revolution in the history of modern criticism of the novel it began to be realized that the method of saying it was little compared to the significance of the thing said tolstoy and dostoevsky had been saying tremendous things while the novelist of the west had been busy with some private conception of art one immediate effect of this shock to accepted critical notions was that mr thomas hardy began to emerge from the comparative obscurity to which criticism had relegated him after regarding him as an uncouth teller of country tragedies artistically far less important than james or meredith and of course not to be named in the breath with flaubert the novelists and critics who had been under the technical spell awoke to discover that he was the only novelist we possessed of a magnitude remotely comparable with that of the russians when the commotion had subsided a little and the attempt began to make an instinct of feeling articulate it was decided that there were two qualities which distinguished the great novelist he expressed a philosophy of life and he was formless the first of these propositions if carefully interpreted is true the second is not the great russian novelists have not the formal perfection of flaubert and james simply because it was of no conceivable use to them but they have a form of their own nevertheless the young novelists of the period imagining that formlessness was in itself a virtue poured volumes of diluted autobiography into the lap of our patient world the philosophy of life was rather more difficult the more enterprising put moral mottoes on their title pages and hoped for the best the boldest introduced a little local colour in the shape of per ambulatory characters of no fixed abode who uttered sentiments of nihilism and world weariness when nothing else was doing these outbreaks of the russian influence in english fiction have a merely local interest but they serve to show into what a condition of ignorance and inanition english fiction fell when the dubious influence of flaubert and james of style was removed after mr wells mr conrad and mr bennett there was nothing except mr d h lawrence it looked as though england might fall out of the running altogether and france was in no better case messieurs bourget and barre had become deliberately parochial anatole france alone remained there was nothing after him for in french literature a similar ignorant attempt to follow the lead of the russians had been equally unfortunate in france it was accepted largely on the expert assurance of melchior de voguet that the secret of russian literature was the religion of pity a whole school of young french novelists with romain roland and charles louis philippe at their head began to be pitiful this sentimental weakling expired shortly before the war the ponderous epitaph unanimism is written on its tomb at that moment the disorientation of the novel was complete the russians had ruined it by revealing its enormous potentialities the vista was too big instead of exhilarating it terrified 
dostoevsky and tolstoy had exploded the novel and a whole generation of promising young souls in england and france lay buried under the ruins whence they have emerged wise and sad to settle down to the respectable business of telling stories for library subscribers the novel as a serious art had nothing to hope or fear from them indeed it would not be worth while to chronicle their history were it not that a historical retrospect of their failure gives the emphasis of contrast to a new vitality in the years nineteen thirteen to nineteen fourteen three significant books calling themselves novels made an unobtrusive and independent appearance in france marcel proust published du cote de chez swann in america the irishman james joyce published the portrait of the artist as a young man in england dorothy richardson published pointed roofs these books had points of outward resemblance each was in itself incomplete a foretaste of sequels to come each was autobiographical and within the necessary limits of individuality autobiographical in the same new and peculiar fashion they were attempts to record immediately the growth of a consciousness immediately without any effort at mediation by means of an interposed plot or story all three authors were trying to present the content of their consciousness as it was before it had been reshaped in obedience to the demands of practical life they were exploring the strange limbo where experiences once conscious fade into unconsciousness the method of marcel proust was the most subtle in that he established as the starting point of his book the level of consciousness from which the exploration actually began he presented the process as well as the results of his exploration of the unconscious memory in the first pages of his book he described how he concentrated upon a vaguely remembered feeling of past malaise which he experienced in waking at night and trying to establish the identity of his room it was a particular form of the familiar feeling i have felt this been here seen this somewhere somehow before we might almost say that marcel proust gives us an account of his technique in penetrating such a sensation and gradually dragging up to the surface of full consciousness forgotten but decisive experiences this singularity of marcel proust's approach implied in the general title a la recherche du temps perdu involving as it does a perpetual reference to the present adult consciousness of the author is important it gives a peculiarly french sense of control to his whole endeavour and a valuable logical or psychological completeness to his work in which is unfolded the process by which first a distinct and finally a supreme importance came to be attached to these presentiments of past experience they are the precious moments of existence they hold the secret of life the growth of this conviction is the vital principle of marcel proust's book the conviction becomes more immediate the sense of obligation to devote himself to penetrating these moments more urgent so that even though the work is still unfinished we can already see that the end will come when this necessity becomes fully conscious and ineluctable and end strictly and necessarily identical with the beginning a la recherche du temps perdu is at once a philosophical justification of its own existence and the history of its own creation that internal completeness is peculiar to marcel proust and it gives him the position of conscious philosopher of a literary impulse which arose quite independently in two other minds at the same moment simply because it is the most conscious marcel proust's effort subsumes those of james joyce and dorothy richardson though it is not for that reason more important than they but common to them all is an insistence upon the immediate consciousness as reality in miss richardson this insistence is probably instinctive and irrational it has a distinctively feminine tinge in james joyce it is certainly deliberate but less deliberate than in marcel proust but the differences in conscious intention are unimportant compared with the similarity of the impulse to discover the origin of the impulse we should have to consider the history of the human consciousness in its double form of sensibility and intelligence from rousseau through the nineteenth century there we find the instinctive individualism of the artistic sensibility more and more exasperated by the sense that society in its new demo plutocratic form had neither room nor respect for such an unprofitable activity of the human spirit as art 
this increase of instinctive individualism received a rational reinforcement from the advance of science the anthropocentric conception of the universe was finally abandoned and an indifferent universe lent its way to a hostile society in thrusting back the individual upon himself the extreme and deliberate subjectivism of the latest developments of the novel is the culmination of rousseauism rousseau's social indifference permitted him to proclaim the intoxicating but misleading gospel that all men are spiritually equal and the social consequences of that doctrine have made his descendants outlaws they have accepted their destiny with a certain bravado and have come to believe that social isolation is an eternal condition of artistic eminence the conception of the artist as a superman is now more than a century old the examples of chateaubriand byron hugo baudelaire nietzsche dostoevsky have given it the force of tradition even of an absolute law and science by its necessary insistence on a fundamental materialism has given the law a double sanction it is not for us to lament over this evolution at most we may have to consider whether a reaction against it is desirable or possible or probable the important thing is to know where we are this movement towards artistic subjectivism has affected all the arts but it is most obvious in prose fiction the aim of the characteristic modern novelist we are speaking only of those who consider the novel as a medium of expression which can satisfy the highest demands of the soul is the presentation of his immediate consciousness this alone is true he believes this alone is valuable or at any rate this alone has the chance of being of some permanent value but the driving impulse is the demand for truth a complete and fearless exploration of the self reduces the chance of self-deception to a minimum to a generation before all things fearful of self-delusion the persuasion is of vital importance and is he not merely carrying to its logical outcome the practice of all the great novelists of the past they endure in so far as they have rendered their own consciousness of life not the stories they told but the comprehensive attitude to life embodied in their stories makes them important to us to-day then why not abolish the mechanism of the story completely if the end to which it is a means can be achieved without it and there is more than this a story seems necessarily to involve a falsification a distortion of the reality life does not shape itself into stories much less does an individual and unique consciousness lend itself to complete expression by means of an invented plot let us do away with this illusory objectivity this imposition of completeness and order upon the incomplete and chaotic all that we can know is our own experience and the closer we keep to the immediate quality of that experience the nearer shall we be to truth such are the arguments conscious or unconscious upon which the subjective movement in modern fiction depends they are not final but they are at least persuasive and they are serious enough to show that the tendency which they support is more than a puerile esotericism they remove all cause for wonder that many of the most gifted writers of the present generation have embraced it nevertheless the desire of the creative writer for objectivity cannot always be so easily suppressed we have to take count of another movement which may be described as an attempt again no doubt not wholly conscious to reconcile subjectivism with objectivity to give it a label we may call it the chekhov tendency although in fact it seems to have originated with baudelaire's prose poems but baudelaire had no influence upon chekhov the direction of whose genius was finally determined i believe by the reading of tolstoy's ivan Ilyitch. like the subjectivists chekhov was obsessed by a passion for truth like them he believed that the only reality was the individual consciousness like them he had conceived a deep mistrust of the machine of story but in a higher degree than they he possessed the purely creative genius of the writer which is an instinct for objectivity and concreteness he reconciled the two conflicting impulses in an individual creation the short story of chekhov was an innovation in literature the immediate consciousness remains the criterion and the method is based on a selection of those glimpses of the reality which in themselves possess a peculiar vividness and by virtue of this vividness appear to have a peculiar significance baudelaire who had practised the method with brilliant success though on a simpler scale in some of his prose poems where he expresses that there is a certainty that a fragment of experience is symbolic of the whole 
is subjective and immediate the artist can attempt to present it without any misgivings about self-delusion or distortion it was so therefore it is true presented the episode is objective but its validity arises from the immediate intuition to present such episodes with a minimum of rearrangement as far as possible to eliminate the mechanisms of invented story was chekhov's aim this is not to suggest that chekhov invented nothing but his constant effort was to reduce the part of invention he strove rather to link moments of perception than to expand the perception by invention and certainly the impressive originality of his work lay in the closeness of his fidelity to what we feel was his immediate experience it was impossible for chekhov therefore to write anything which could be reasonably given the name of a novel not as some have said because his constructive power was defective but simply because the effort would have involved too wide a departure from the vivid moments of his own consciousness he would have seemed to himself like the constructor of a metaphysical system who leaves the solid ground of truth for cloudland his feet once lifted from the firm earth the very motive for flight would have failed him what was the good of yet another attempt to impose finality upon the incessant but the method persists in modern fiction as the internal antithesis to complete subjectivism the most finished modern example is to be found in the short stories of catherine mansfield the finest stories in bliss and the garden party adhere closely to the chekhov formula but to speak of a formula is misleading it is quite impossible to imitate almost impossible to be influenced by a method so completely intuitive as chekhov's it is simply that catherine mansfield is a similar phenomenon her work is of the same kind as chekhov's and precisely because it is of the same kind it is utterly different from his the two significant methods in the most modern fiction are on the one hand the presentation of a consciousness on the other the presentation of the vivid moments of a consciousness both are essentially subjective they differ however in this important particular that whereas the subjectivist novelists seem to be chiefly moved by a desire to express the truth alone the story writers aim at an art which is compatible with the truth the most obvious consequence is that the second are much more easily comprehensible than the first because they speak a universal language a writer who presents an object perceived interests us immediately because there is common ground between his perceptions and our own it is also easier for us to feel the individual quality of such a writer's consciousness than it is to disentangle it from the work of a writer who is busy in insisting upon the nature of his consciousness in a short story by chekhov or catherine mansfield it is as though an intense beam of peculiar light were cast upon a fragment of reality by watching the objects revealed by it we can tell the colour of the light far more easily than we could if the colour were described to us above all because we are made sensible of the light at the moment when it is or is felt by the writer to be more illuminating than the ordinary light on the other hand an extreme subjectivism without the control of this intuitive selection tends to become incomprehensible a consciousness is a flux it needs to be crystallized about some foreign object to have an intelligible shape marcel proust's historical and philosophical preoccupations supply such a thread but even he can be excessively tedious when his grasp on the external world is slackened miss richardson can be as tiring as a twenty-four hour cinematograph without interval or plot and in ulysses james joyce at times carries his effort of analysis to such lengths as to become as difficult as a message in code of which half the key has been lost the process of consciousness has indeed a fatal fascination for him and he perceptibly diminishes the significance of two such splendidly conceived or observed characters as leopold and marion bloom by his inability to stop recording their processes of mind nevertheless we must freely admit that ulysses is a magnificent attempt by an extreme subjectivist to overcome the formlessness into which the method must so easily degenerate the narrative more or less remotely based upon the odyssey is enclosed within the limits of a day in dublin twenty years ago all the characters who come into contact with the hero's consciousness have a place in it and the minds of two of them are submitted to the same exhaustive analysis as his own but in spite of this considerable degree of objectivity a complete and satisfying clarity is seldom attained the objective is chiefly an excuse for another plunge into subjectivity and we become weary of the effort to follow the processes of three different minds for us they are exhausted long before mr joyce has done with them we long to escape from this incessant web of consciousness in which we are everywhere entangled and to be allowed to trust to the revelation of the object but we are forbidden either the consciousness of bloom 
ulysses or of marion penelope or of mr joyce in his avatar as stephen dedalus telemachus or in his apotheosis as the demiurge of the book itself is ever before us to mist and complicate the thing we desire to see mr joyce is determined to give us everything by devious and super subtle ways a day of human existence with all its heritage of the past its dreams of the future shall be completely explored ulysses is a work of genius but in spite of its subjective moments it is also a reductio ad absurdum of subjectivism it is the triumph of the desire to discover the truth over the desire to communicate that which is felt as truth this desire to communicate is so far as we can see essential to literature though not to genius nor is it by any means necessary that a perceived truth should be communicated but literature is almost by definition a communication of intuitions and they can only be communicated in terms of a generally perceived reality it is as though the external world were a common language which the writer speaks with new inflections and accents giving new life to the old and revealing a hidden significance in the familiar the writer's duty is to make the approach to his intuitions and sentiments as simple as possible and he does this by shaping the common reality in accordance with them so that the reality becomes a symbol of his profoundest certainties in this process mr joyce is only casually interested rather than sacrifice one atom of his truth of detail he is arcane and incomprehensible and it is impossible not to feel he enjoys his own mysteriousness it gives some kind of fillip to his self-engrossment ulysses contains many scattered patches of surprising beauty and at least one sustained passage of metaphysical comedy which justifies us in at least comparing his powers of intellectual imagination with those of goethe and dostoevsky but as a whole we must consider it a gigantic aberration a colossal waste of genius the last extravagance of romanticism whether the dangers of the romantic apotheosis of the artist the spiritual outlaw who is glorified by his rejection of all social obligations even to the last obligation of being comprehensible needed this ocular demonstration we cannot tell but now that we have it we can be grateful for it the many-minded the much wandering ulysses has ended his voyages by stranding his ship at the side of the sea it is not as some timid spirits seem to fear a danger to navigation it is a valuable sea mark which will warn future voyagers of the futility of no compromise for the art of literature is based upon a compromise the writer who does not accept the condition may be a man of genius but he is an imperfect writer as goethe said the writer who writes without the conviction that he will have a million readers has mistaken his vocation moreover it is much easier to be complicated than to be simple to be mysterious than to be intelligible the great writer is the man who without betraying the complexity of his own consciousness insists on discovering a means of expressing his consciousness in relatively simple terms it is easy to plunge into the strangest depths of individual sensation but there is work to be done and this toil this labour is vital to literature only when it has been faced and accomplished does a book possess the mysterious quality and virtue of which we pronounce it a masterpiece namely that it gives delight at every level of apprehension a truly great novel is a tale to the simple a parable to the wise a direct revelation of reality in the light of a unique consciousness to the man who has made it part of his being for this reason it seems that the story is necessary to the novel it is the means by which the novelist completely projects and embodies his own emotional attitude to life it is the comprehensible symbol which is the condition of lucidity nevertheless as the complexity of the modern consciousness increases it is inevitable that the traditional form of story the simple invented sequence of act and consequence should appear inadequate to a condition of which a shrinking mistrust of action is one of the most constant elements the problem that shakespeare tried to solve when he wrote hamlet still rises before the modern novelist and there is a further complication which can hardly have been present to shakespeare's mind after the nineteenth century it is impossible for the serious writer of fiction to be wholly immune from the influence of a scientific standard of truth the bold abbreviations of heroic fable are not for him the comfortable finalities of a good plot with its suicides and deaths and unchallengeable felicities are psychologically impossible he envies the men of old who could invoke their aid with such sublime nonchalance but he dare not he cannot imitate them he is preoccupied with a loyalty to the real and he satisfies it as we have seen either by a surrender to the movement of his own consciousness or by an instructive insistence upon the moment when the web of consciousness is pierced by the significant 
significant intrusion of the real world thus we have in modern fiction the striking antithesis between the big books and the little ones corresponding to the complete history of a consciousness and its most objective moments in the big books there are moments which have the vividness of the little ones because they have the same basis of immediate perceived reality but in the big books these moments are quickly swallowed up in the analytic meanderings of the narrative as a whole for hours the mist drags slowly over the mountain side suddenly there is a burst of blue sky a streaming sun in the trees the valley the river and the mountain tops shine for a moment with miraculous brilliance then the mist closes down once more in the little books we have a sequence of those visions with no intervening mists but even in them the shining light cannot be steadily maintained its brilliance depends upon its suddenness upon an absorption of the whole consciousness by the apparition of reality a condition which however frequent in a writer of genius is still an intermittent one he can hardly give us a continuous vision at the same degree of illumination at most he gives us a sequence of detached visions therefore we may speak without rhetoric of the break-up of the novel we do not have to deplore the dissolution obviously we are in a period of transition in which new elements are being gathered together for a more perfect artistic realization in the future new standards of truth new standards of brilliance and directness in presentation are being introduced into fiction when they have been absorbed the art of the novel will obey its own internal law as an art of literature and evolve towards a new combination of lucidity and comprehensiveness at present the comprehensiveness is massed on one side and the lucidity upon the other of the small band of important writers of modern fiction no single writer has been big enough to make the creative synthesis so that the only possible synthesis at this moment is a critical one but we do not doubt that the creative synthesis will be made it may be that the divided elements will unite only to divide again into two separate literary achievements there is a portion of ulysses where mr joyce shows that the strongest part of his talent is magnificently comic satirical aristophanic comedy is the true satisfaction of exasperation there never was such an exasperated age as this in which a universal materialism is opposed by a universal hypersensitiveness exasperation is continually manifest as a disturbing influence in the work of such writers of english as mr lawrence mr elliot mr wyndham lewis mr huxley and above all mr joyce himself and many of the modern parisians like paul morin and louis aragon in a russian like bunin bunin's the gentleman from san francisco comes nearest to giving complete artistic expression to this exasperation but his manner is too minatory and apocalyptic the liberation of aristophanic comedy is its ideal expression these writers are sometimes on the brink of it mr joyce is the only one who has taken the plunge we should like to imagine that the exasperation of the modern sensibility would be crystallized out into a new aristophanism a new rabelaisianism so that an explosive condition might find its proper satisfaction in an explosive art it would help to clear the ground for the necessary development of the calmer art of the novel and to clear the minds of those who will have to address themselves to the problem of finding lucid symbols for the complexities they wish to convey undoubtedly there is a means of satisfying the new standards of fidelity to experience without recourse to obscurity and hieroglyphics the road may not be easy to find but it must be found otherwise the novel will reach a ridiculous position in which all that is interesting will be unintelligible and all that is intelligible will be uninteresting that moment indeed sometimes seems very near but we believe the danger is not really serious art has a way of surviving the most inevitable disasters the present unsettlement of the art of fiction is perhaps hardly more than a crisis of indigestion prose fiction is the only vital and comprehensive literary form of to-day after a long period of constraint under the prestige of flaubert it has had suddenly to accommodate itself to the immense reality of the nineteenth century for many years the novelist has believed that the nineteenth century was flaubert and turgenev now it turns out to have been stendhal baudelaire nietzsche dostoevsky tolstoy and chekhov and heaven knows what in science besides we cannot wonder if the modern fiction has bad dreams only if it were not disturbed would there be cause for wonder and alarm End of section five. Section six of Discoveries Essays in Literary Criticism by J. 
john middleton murray this librivox recording is in the public domain english poetry in the eighteenth century in a famous passage matthew arnold assured us that we should not improve on the classification of poetry which the greeks adopted and that their categories of epic dramatic lyric and so forth had a natural propriety and should be adhered to it may he admitted sometimes seem doubtful to which of two categories a poem belongs whether this or that poem is to be called for instance narrative or lyric lyric or elegiac but there is to be found in every good poem a strain a predominant note which determines the poem as belonging to one of these kinds rather than another and here is the best proof of the value of the classification and of the advantage of adhering to it no doubt we are inclined to reply it is the best proof if it is true but are there in fact these strains these predominant notes which are so decisive what for instance is the predominant and determining note in the divina commedia is not the truth rather that classification of the greeks was really formal but that with them a classification of poetry by form had some bearing upon content because the forms for certain contents were fixed by convention with us on the other hand a constant relation between poetical form and poetical content does not exist and for this reason it may be not only burdensome but even hazardous and uncritical for us to preserve a classification based upon qualities that are no longer essential certainly it is true that some of these traditional categories are used at the present time with an extreme ambiguity we imagine we know a dramatic poem when we see one it is a play in verse but we have no hesitation in calling a narrative poem dramatic if its quality seems to demand the epithet king lear is dramatic by virtue of its form lamia by virtue of its content and matthew arnold himself by urging us to look for a strain a predominant note that is a quality not of the form but of the content alone destroy the very basis of the classification he recommended if we are to classify by content we had better not use epithets of form if we do use them and the tradition is almost compulsory we shall need to have our best wits about us if we are to avoid confusions in spite of the strength of the tradition it is however noticeable that the old classification has in the actual practice of modern criticism been largely discarded it has fallen into abeyance because it no longer gave any help in the work of distinction a modern critic does not occupy himself with wondering whether a poem is dramatic or epic or narrative or lyric he is concerned only to discover whether it is poetry hoc opus hic labor est if in his unguarded moments he lets fall the phrase lyrical quality the phrase itself is enough to show that he is describing an essence not a form and it is a thousand to one that the phrase as he uses it is simply synonymous with poetical quality at all events he is quite as ready to attribute lyrical quality to a dramatic or narrative poem as he is to deny it to a lyric the word lyric indeed as a description of the formal qualities of a poem is no longer of any use to us it no longer implies as once it did that the poem was written for music it means hardly more than that the poem is a short one and that it is not a sonnet but lyrical as an epithet of essential quality is much more alluring as an object of analysis moreover it calls urgently for examination for it is at once vague and significant when we have said that a poem has the true lyrical quality we feel that we have said something important about it we have decided that it is a poem in our more ruthless moments we may go on to declare that a poem which lacks this quality is not a poem at all it may be eloquent brilliant witty musical but it lacks the finest poetic vitality and is therefore not a poem the method though attractive is too arbitrary for even if we admit that lyrical is the commonest name for the highest and most essential quality of poetry there is still no reason why a poem from which this is absent should not be a poem the house of poetry contains many mansions we must be content with saying that the truest and most indisputable poetry the poetry which we could least afford to lose the poetry which seems to illuminate our human universe with a gleam of a purer existence and a fuller knowledge than our own is lyrical lyrical is simply the name by which we recognize its peculiar quality and power 
can we go further than this or must we remain on the brink of knowledge with the dubious divining rod of the je ne sais quoi in our hands the tractatus logico philosophicus of wittgenstein which i believe to be the profoundest philosophical work of our modern times and in an important sense the only modern work of philosophy contains a simple sentence which has much bearing on our question though its full implications can appear only when it is understood as a link in a delicate and subtle chain of analytical reasoning it may yet be separated from it to our advantage everything that can be thought says the young austrian philosopher can be thought clearly everything that can be said can be said clearly and again what can be shown cannot be said at first sight these are the sentences of a rationalist among the rationalists but even without our knowledge that their author is a mystic a little thought upon them reveals unexpected implications can what is thought in the highest poetry be thought clearly or what is said by it be said clearly it cannot be thought otherwise it cannot be said otherwise so much we know the knowledge is indeed part of our recognition of its quality but that it cannot be thought or said otherwise is far different from its being thought and said clearly we know it is not we know it cannot be we know that what is clearly thought and said in the greatest poetry has so little to do with its own deepest import that it is negligible in comparison with it we feel that this quintessential poetry could indeed be defined as the result of an effort to bring unthinkable thoughts and unsayable sayings within the range of human minds and ears and this mystical poetic truth is in reality by no means as recondite as it seems all that is even to the most rationalistic among us of vital importance in our pedestrian little lives is unthinkable by our thought and unspeakable by our speech one man has ever said to the woman of his choice i love you without the instant knowledge that the words his best his truest and his simplest words were almost a vain and barren parody of what he intended and what he knew or what man having convinced his intellect that he is what he is by some mechanic laws and that the constitution of the universe and not himself is responsible for his being and his acts has freed himself thereby from the ineluctable sense of sin a secret knowledge that he cannot think or utter or again as it were from the other side what man can think or speak the meaning of the one word forgiveness it is a mystery that he knows within himself fully or not at all it may be revealed to him by the parable of the lost sheep or the prodigal son but it is not thought or spoken there it is revealed what can be shown cannot be said ethics says wittgenstein elsewhere is transcendental ethics and aesthetics are one these familiar examples of the mysteries of life as it comes to each one of us are in sober truth also examples of the mystery of poetry it lies in the very heart of the nature of all great poetry of all great art whatsoever that it should reveal to us directly a kind of existence of which our mundane minds and senses have no inkling it is the secret kingdom out of which anton chekhov one day bore away a mysterious and authentic law it is the realm where everything is forgiven and it would be strange not to forgive in that sentence beyond a doubt is a star dropped out from the kingdom of heaven which is within us and the direct intuition which tells us that that star fell from the same heaven as the lines of great poetry the themes of great music among which we store it tells us also that art and morality are one but the profound truth which perhaps ought not to be casually presented for fear of misunderstanding is relevant now only in so far as it throws a light upon the nature of that poetry which wherever we find it we call lyrical it is the revelation of another kingdom that another kingdom exists may be proved by any one who will look into the reality of his own being that the kingdom he finds there is the same that the poets reveal to us of that there may indeed be no proof for no proof is needed to argue with those who have not because they do not choose to have experience of them is idle and sterile disputation it is in the nature of things that these revelations of another kingdom or another plane of being through poetry should be intermittent in the history of poetry after all poetry is but one of the arts of literature and literature is but one of the arts and the arts themselves are but one means of attaining this revelation there may be periods when the human spirit seeks it by the way of religious devotion and certainly it would be generally true to say that the great efflorescence of the arts in the west which seems now to have reached its decline began to unfold itself as mediaeval christianity began to wither 
there may also be periods when for some profound cause humanity cares for none of these things the eighteenth century seems to have been such a period during it the minds of men appear to have been occupied with the work of liberating the individual from what he felt to be the bondage of tradition now across the distance of a separating century we can see that the task of asserting the complete independence of man was necessary in order that he should learn by bitter experience that it is not possible for him to live in complete and conscious independence and that if he could not endure the restraint of a tradition which seemed to him lifeless and untrue he must dig down into himself for a new one that was rousseau's great work he discovered that the new tradition was not unlike the old the reality in both was the same but in the old it had been hidden in the new it shone with all the golden light of personal discovery to treat of the history of lyrical poetry in such a period is therefore in a sense to treat of the thing which is not so long as the human mind insists on a complete and conscious mastery of its own destiny lyrical poetry considered as we have tried to consider it as essence and not as form can scarcely begin to be it demands for its own birth and admission of that which is beyond reason its very roots lie in the unthinkable and unspeakable of such an admission the eighteenth century was afraid and rightly afraid because the force and import of its ultimate admission was to depend upon its having been wrung from it pending its final enforced surrender the duty of the century was to hold the fort of reason to the last and to insist that literature should express itself in rational propositions the unthinkable was madness the unspeakable inhuman only a later generation was to begin the gradual work of discovery that they are the sanest and most human of all in so far then as the latest historian of english poetry in the eighteenth century is dealing with the realities and not the surface of his subject his story should be of the suffering and discomfiture of those prematurely born souls who living among the defenders of the fortress of reason and self-sufficiency were at heart disloyal because of their premonition that the defence was vain they had come to learn that man cannot live by bread alone they were torn by unthinkable thoughts unspeakable words groped for utterance within them it is the great merit of mr doughty's narrative that amid the waste of poetic futility which he is compelled to include out of reverence for the formal meaning of the word lyrical he does make a serious and on the whole a successful attempt to follow the shining thread of this poignant and living story collins smart chatterton cowper gray of these five in whose poetry there is something more than a fleeting glimpse of a reality beyond the actual one killed himself and three died melancholy mad only gray managed to maintain himself against what dr johnson called that hunger of the imagination which preys upon life thompson also who was to some degree the father of them all preserved himself but in him the quality we seek is vague and diffused we are more at ease in denying its absence than in asserting its presence in his poetry but the human tragedy of the story grievous though it is can be regarded only as a sign which he who runs may read of the struggle which vexed the soul of the age of reason we do not know enough of the victims to follow their vicissitudes what do we know of collins of smart of chatterton even their names seem to have survived only by accident it is as though the age itself resolute to preserve its appearance of rational calm had swept away all trace of its poets as a man puts away an importunate thought and they themselves become almost wholly the creatures of our theories and imaginations we imagine them as men compelled by circumstance to mistrust the gleam they saw and mistrusting to have been denied a fuller vision it takes a superhuman bravery to believe a faith discovered in utter isolation wordsworth had coleridge they both had southey and all had rousseau before them rousseau had no one but in a measure he had europe but collins and smart and chatterton were truly alone we cannot wonder that they dared no more the wonder is rather that they should have dared so much in the face of universal ridicule or universal neglect if we regard as we must collins and gray as the most intellectually conscious of those eighteenth-century poets who were troubled by a glimpse of the brave translunary things we may look in them for some indication of the poet's own feeling towards his own discomfiture it was in both these men as we might expect a sense of lack rather than a sense of gift by which they knew themselves poets collins as he timidly reveals himself in his work was one who knew what true poetry was but knew not how to attain it he invokes the passions to his aid he implores the help of simplicity faints the cold work till thou inspire the whole 
but he implores her in vain we know that it was not wholly in vain but to collins himself it must have seemed that the gods had denied him their most precious gift and gray who lived longer only lived to feel the same lack more keenly writing to mason in seventeen fifty six at the age of forty he had said the true lyric style with all its flights of fancy ornaments heightening of expression and harmony of sound is in its nature superior to every other style though we must not bear too hardly upon the diction of a past age we cannot help remarking the externality of the approach lyric is for gray in this letter a manner rather than a quality it is a manner which being the most superior manner gray intends to adopt to go in for with no apparent sense of misgiving eleven years later in seventeen sixty seven as he had come sensibly nearer to a true knowledge of his subject he had reached a consciousness of his own failure to achieve it extreme conciseness of expression yet pure perspicuous and musical is one of the grand beauties of lyric poetry this i have always aimed at and never could attain he also did for a moment attain it though not so unequivocally as collins and he attained it most memorably in his lament for the decay of poetry woods that wave o'er delphi's steep isles that crown the aegean deep fields that cool illicis laves or where meanders amber waves in lingering labyrinths creep how do your tuneful voices languish mute but to the voice of anguish in those beautiful lines are revealed the two sources from which collins and grace sought the quality they were so conscious of lacking they turned to greek and they turned to milton as the chief inheritor of the classical tradition in england gray's second description of lyrical poetry fits no english poet so well as him who rode sublime upon the seraph wings of ecstasy the secrets of the abyss to spy and the intimate connection between collins's regretful odes to simplicity and the passions and the famous miltonic definition of poetry as simple sensuous and passionate leaps to the eye impassioned simplicity then was what they lacked and sought and perhaps no single descriptive phrase suggests the quality of true lyric better than this one which we may call by adoption theirs but whence was impassioned simplicity to come submission to influences even the finest or the gradual discipline of taste are powerless to achieve this end there is far more impassioned simplicity in the barbaric whitman than in all the english poetry of the eighteenth century before blake for the end they sought a faith is necessary an assurance of the existence of a world beyond the rational reality in an age of reason when the approach to ancient faiths is barred by an accumulation of dogma which the free mind cannot accept the only way to faith is the way of self-exploration the way so majestically described by the modern french poet j'ai fui partout partout j'ai retrouvé la loi quelque chose en moi qui soit plus moi même que moi and the road to this discovery is the discrimination between the true emotion and the false between the permanent and the ephemeral reaction just in so far as the eighteenth-century poets strove for an emotional sincerity the truest of them before blake got no farther on the road than this they have endured it is this and this alone which keeps untarnished the faint radiance of scattered lines of parnell and shenstone and even of atkins side parnell's twas thus as under shade i stood i sang my wishes to the wood and lost in thought no more perceived the branches whisper as they waved it seemed as all the quiet place confessed the presence of the grace shenstones but sure to soothe our youthful dreams those banks and streams appeared more bright than other banks than other streams and perhaps the two last lines of the dower atkinside's poem to his amoret this sure is beauty's happiest part this gives the most unbounded sway this shall enchant the subject heart when rose and lily fade away and she be still in spite of time sweet amoret in all her prime each seems to be kept alive by the faint breath of a true emotion true emotion of the same kind as this is what lifts much of cowper's poetry above the ravages of time the perfectly simple human feeling of his poem to his lifelong companion mrs unwin the twentieth year is well nigh past since first our sky was overcast i would that this might be the last my mary or the more tragic confession of to me the waves that ceaseless broke upon the dangerous coast hoarsely and ominously spoke of all my treasure lost your sea of troubles you have passed and found the peaceful shore i tempest tossed and wrecked at last come home to port no more 
have made them durable but the finest quintessence of poetry is not in them the separation between the dark ecstasies of cowper's acquired calvinism and the nature of the man himself was too great his religion could not nourish his poetry it merely broke the man and however difficult it may be to analyse exactly this sense of separation between the sources of poetry and the mind of the poet is what chiefly haunts us as we read mr doughty's narrative if the poet was for a moment uplifted on the seraph wings of fantasy it was only that the catastrophe should be the more disastrous christopher smart had the vision of his song to david only in order to qualify for the madhouse collins achieved his ode to evening only to succumb to melancholia and the transports of cowper's sombre religion could never enter his poetry at all like men who are fed after starvation their comfort was only an increase of their pain if they saw then what they saw was something irreconcilable with the life in which they were involved and the vision merely intensified their despair if they attained a momentary faith they could not hold it long enough to make an assertion of it they could not slowly master it and make it their own until it became a thing by which they could work and live as keats and shelley and wordsworth and blake were to do they could not trust themselves we can conceive no more terrible fate for the man of vision than a real isolation without friends or disciples to confirm his faith in his own insight to triumph over such conditions as strength would need to be superhuman that the poets of our eighteenth century did not triumph appears just an inevitable necessity when we contrast the solid phalanx which the poets of the romantic revival presented to the world with the solitude in which their predecessors worked and died what we cannot help wondering would kit smart have been had he known of blake as it was the proof of his lunacy was his power to write such verses as these for adoration in the dome of christ the sparrows find a home and on his olive's perch the swallow also dwells with thee o man of god's humility within his saviour's church strong is the lion like a coal his eyeball like a bastion's mole his chest against the foes strong the gear eagle on his sail strong against tide the enormous whale emerges as he goes but stronger still in earth and air and in the sea the man of prayer and far beneath the tide and in the sea too faith is signed where we ask is have and seek is find where knock is open wide and what might not chatterton have done could he have known the great poet who turned to him from milton and watered his name with tears even more than of smart in blake we catch the deliberate echo of keats in such lines of chatterton as these when autumn blake and sunburn both appear with his gold hand gilding the fallen leaf bringing up winter to fulfil the year bearing upon his back the ripened sheaf when all the hills with woody cedar are white when love and fires and lanes do meet from far the sight when the fair apple ruddy as even sky do bend the tree unto the fructile ground when juicy pears and berries of black dye do dance in air and call the eyne around then be the even fowl or even fair methinks my heart's joy is stainst with some care such conjectures are no doubt as idle as any might have been yet the confrontation of such related poets as smart and blake or chatterton and keats the comparison between the fair flowers no sooner blown but blasted and the full unfolding that was to come once more suggests the question why was it so we have said they were isolated but the further question what was the cause of their isolation is insistent it is hardly enough to repeat that it was after all the age of reason that men's minds were deliberately turned towards a goal that is alien to poetry or that they thought it a derogation of their humanity to accept satisfactions of which their intellects had not complete control that is a logical and coherent statement of the facts yet it is hardly sufficient the desires of the soul cannot easily be eradicated they are perennial when we look back on the eighteenth century it seems that these desires were satisfied neither by poetry nor religion nor works but this calm palladian front of impassivity and decorum was not to be had for nothing it must we feel have been bought at a price and we find ourselves returning for some knowledge of the inward struggle to the familiar figure of dr johnson only in the living pages of boswell can his effort after complete rationality be squared with his childish prayers and dogmatic faith but within the soul of the old hero was perpetual war showing itself to the world as profound melancholy it was not so much that he was blind to the vision or insensible to the appeals of another kingdom as that he was afraid of them 
the man who put down the phrase the hunger of the imagination which preys upon life was not writing in ignorance he had surely felt it himself but it seemed to him as it has seemed to many a rationalist since that the hunger was ravenous insatiable and disastrous it was an appetite which had best be strangled at birth for who could tell into what strange deserts it might lead were he once to let go his hold on the rock of reason he would be drowned in the flood johnson was at war with himself the more he thundered against the deserters of common sense and life and literature the closer he clung to his own naive religious faith as he was extreme in the one he was extreme in the other also he was like a man dragged asunder by the wild horses of opposed desires had he known that there was no cause for fear had his great honesty had the power to go deeper to attempt to reconcile his religious creed with his literary faith and take the consequences of the necessary exploration then perhaps some chapters in the history of poetry in his time might have been less desolating than they are as it was he paid the penalty of his contradictions and his fears he refused to let the hunger of the imagination prey upon life and he suffered the same torments as the half-hearted rebels against reason who could not refuse like collins and gray and cowper he endured agonies of melancholy for no less than they he suffered from the divided soul but there was indeed no cause for fear the hunger of the imagination is insatiable only so long as it is denied satisfaction the other kingdom is terrifying only to those who having been vouchsafed a pisgah's sight of it refuse or are afraid to advance and make it their own the next generation of english poets was to have the courage of its own necessities and though its destinies were tragic also the tragedy was temporal and not spiritual they have left behind them an abiding sense of fulfilment of the four great romantic poets of the early nineteenth century there was not one who hesitated to proclaim his faith in a reality beyond the visible or who by drawing back from unthinkable thoughts or unsayable sayings betrayed his own assurance of certainty what could not be said could be shown and those who stumble over their statements receive the truth from their parables they may recognize it no further than to say that keats and shelley and wordsworth and blake were great poets because they wrote great poetry but it is a kind of cowardice to leave the matter there if great poetry is important to a man it behooves him to inquire in what its greatness consists the four great poets who came to satisfy the pent-up longings of a century were above all seekers after the truth what truth they found they tried to utter and they did utter but the utterance of poetry is not the utterance of logic neither is the philosophy of poetry the philosophy of the schools remembering this we may claim for them precisely and in terms the vindication of the sentence of sir joshua reynolds which mr doughty quotes as evidence of the unacceptable demands made by the age of reason upon poetry well-turned periods in eloquence or harmony of numbers in poetry however highly we may esteem them can never be considered as of equal importance with the art of unfolding truths that are of importance to mankind and which make men better and wiser what perhaps sir joshua did not know was that the truths which are of importance to mankind and which make men better and wiser are truths of such a kind that they cannot be expounded in maxims or formulated articles the rational mind cannot apprehend them and in respect to them its essential function is to learn and to acknowledge its own insufficiency the pinnacle of a pure rationality is a convinced and willing self-abnegation if we are to indict the age of reason but it is still harder to indict an age than a nation if we are to indicate wherein the age of reason failed we must say that it did not fulfil its own professions it was not rational enough just as dr johnson himself was not rational enough and when the moment came and the soul of man revolted against the bitter bread of reason and ate greedily of what the poets offered them not even then was rationality convinced of its own final impotence not until our own age have the acknowledged masters of the intellect made a convinced and willing surrender the concluding sentences of wittgenstein's tractatus logico philosophicus are the philosophical echo of einstein's physical revelations the subtle rationalist is at one with the genius of scientific thought we feel says wittgenstein that even if all possible scientific questions be answered the problems of life have still not been touched at all of course there is then no question left and just this is the answer the solution of the problem of life is seen in the vanishing of this problem is not this the reason why men to whom after long doubting the sense of life became clear could not then say wherein this sense consisted 
the sense of life was clear or partly clear to the poets of the romantic revival they no more than the greatest poets before them could say wherein this sense consisted but precisely because they could not say it they could show it perhaps sir joshua would have been surprised at the manner in which they obeyed his behest to unfold truths of importance to mankind but when his surprise was over and acute critic as he was he had examined the manifest difference between compulsion of the being and conviction of the intellect he could then have added the necessary corollary to his sentence namely that not only when poets are occupied with the act of unfolding truths of importance to mankind can they achieve the most splendid periods in eloquence or the finest harmony in numbers a poet can become a great poet only if his message is urgent the poets of the eighteenth century languished chiefly because of their knowledge that their messages were not urgent End of section six. section seven of discoveries essays in literary criticism by john middleton murray this librivox recording is in the public domain a note on the madness of christopher smart mr edmund blunden who is a poet of real gifts and therefore not afraid to sink his individuality in the laborious work of rescuing his predecessors from oblivion has followed up his edition of the poetry of john clare with a new edition of christopher smart's song to david not that kit smart is quite so forgotten as clare was he is one of the little flies immortalized in the pellucid and enduring amber of boswell's johnson burney how does poor smart do sir is he likely to recover johnson it seems as if his mind had ceased to struggle with the disease for he grows fat upon it burney perhaps sir that may be from want of exercise johnson no sir he has partly as much exercise as he used to have for he digs in the garden indeed before his confinement he used for exercise to walk to the alehouse but he was carried back again i did not think he ought to be shut up his infirmities were not noxious to society he insisted on people praying with him and i'd as lief pray with kit smart as any one else another charge was that he did not love clean linen and have no passion for it while he was shut up in the asylum kit smart wrote the song to david and the hymns and spiritual songs no doubt in the seventeen sixties in the full prime of the age of reason those poems were an additional and conclusive evidence of smart's insanity the same rationality which clapped smart in the madhouse imposed the stamp act on the american colonies nowadays pretending to a wisdom after the event we should call this reason a want of imagination but whether we english have any more imagination now is a question to which an honest answer is disturbing from this angle the history of english poetry in the eighteenth century is a singularly depressing story the real poets were all mad chatterton savage collins smart cowper were suicides or lunatics or both even the equable gray was on the verge of melancholia at the end of the sombre procession comes john clare the asylum poet whom the doctor certified for the madhouse because he showed an unconquerable inclination to write verses and at the end of the period when a few holes in the leaden pall of rationality had been made by the lightnings of the french revolution some of the great ones had narrow escapes coleridge was safely lodged in gilman's house and what would have happened to keats and shelley had they not died before society had begun to take serious notice of them who can say wordsworth opted for sanity and his poetry fled it is not a comfortable retrospect in the old old days before modern civilization had begun its levelling there was more room for the poets they were mad but their madness was divine the gods nay the very principle of the divine visited them but in the age of reason they were simply mad no more divinity about their delusions no more reverence for the great unspeakable power which manifested through them our modern civilization is wonderful tremendous terrifying but it has no room for these things it does not want and it will not have the prophet and the seer 
the poet the authentic poet is no less he is the moitest sacre now as ever for the truth he knows is eternal but there is no room for it in the philosophy of modern civilization and modern civilization will one day pay the penalty for trying to shut out what is older and more enduring than itself such are the thoughts one has in reading christopher smart again most people who know anything about poetry know song to david there is a good solid chunk of it in the oxford book of english verse but a whole is better than a part and the most astonishing thing about the song to david is that it is a whole for its uniqueness and there is nothing like it in the great range of english poetry chiefly consists in the unexpected combination of unity of swift and firm design of vivid ordonnance to use coleridge's word with an impassioned and ecstatic sublimity which one would have thought rebellious by nature to such discipline not to know the song to david as a whole is in a very real sense not to know it at all but the song to david is not new what will be new to most people is the strange quality of smarts hymns and spiritual songs some of which mr blunden has rescued together with a good deal of merely trivial verse these hymns and spiritual songs for the fasts and festivals of the church of england were printed together with his versions of the psalms and the second edition of the song to david in seventeen sixty five i imagine from the internal evidence that smart wrote the versions of the psalms first then being uplifted by the splendour of the psalmist's imagination and controlled by his knowledge of the psalmist's art uttered the song to david and finally relaxed into a mood of calm and simple serenity composed the hymns and spiritual songs however this may be there are marvellous things in them and these things are marvellous in a way quite different from that of the song to david consider for example the last two verses of the nativity sphinx and ouzel sing sublimely we too have a saviour born whiter blossoms burst untimely on the blessed mosaic thorn god all bounteous all creative whom no ills from good dissuade is incarnate and a native of the very world he made there is a simple miracle in that last line and a half and one need not be a professing christian to feel that it is the miracle of the nativity itself or take lines from st philip and st james and the lily smiles supremely mentioned by the lord on earth this is the true the strange christian naivete the sense or the knowledge that all living creatures are brothers of men children of god and can only be understood in virtue of the one love which unites them all by this spirit the primeval innocence of eden of which rubens had a bisgoth sight in his great picture is restored and for the moment that we share it we are no longer fallen away from our first perfection it is the great christian naivete of st francis it was to be manifested again half a century later in the poetry of john clare for the fitful yet unmistakable gleam plays over all clare's work the very darkness smiles to where the stars that show us god is there it is a perception a knowledge a mode of understanding which christ himself brought into the world solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these are not two sparrows so for a farthing before christ no one of whom memory remains to us had spoken words like these before him this sense of communion in life between all living creatures did not exist there is no record of it in the words of the wise before him the beautiful descriptions of nature in the ancient poets and in spite of the common report there are beautiful descriptions of nature in the ancient poets are of another kind they have not this immediacy of contact the blood bond of brothers is not there and to speak truth it is not in many poets of the christian era it is not i believe in shakespeare or in dante or in milton or even in wordsworth wordsworth is too deliberate there is a grave and deep philosophy in his attitude but this naivete is spontaneous like the kiss one may sometimes surprise between two little children who believe themselves on watch i have seen such a kiss between two tiny staggers in the luxembourg gardens it is innocent it is rapturous and it is wise i find the gleam of it everywhere in smart's hymns and spiritual songs as i find it everywhere in clare i can describe it only as a glimpse of simple and incredible purity no one can hold a mystery all the time perhaps few can perceive it when it is pointed out to them the pointing out stands in the way but it seems not only to hover but to rest in the last three verses of st philip and st james hark aloud the blackbird whistles with surrounding fragrance blessed and the goldfinch in the thistles makes provision for her nest even the hornet hives for honey blue cap 
builds his stately dome and the rocks supply the coney with a fortress and a home but the servants of the saviour which with gospel peace are shod have no bed but what the paviour makes them in the porch of god that to me is franciscan poetry in excelsis and suddenly when i think that christopher smart and john clare who had perhaps more of this strange and peculiar gift of naivete than any other of our poets were both shut up in asylums i wonder whether st francis yes and christ himself would not be safeguarded in the same way and i turn out of my pocket-book a cutting of the times report of the harnett lunacy case which has lately shocked english public opinion all that mr harnett had of the evidence on which he was certified as a lunatic was the statement of dr gray the assistant medical officer at the asylum that you have too much jesus about you it is a dangerous thing to have we take our dr johnson too much from boswell we cannot help it if we are to see the great man at all we must see him through boswell's eyes but we should be on our guard against feeling him through boswell's mind we need not echo the thundering paradox of macaulay in order to agree with him that boswell was too small to understand his hero boswell was smug and satisfied in the age of reason johnson had had terrifying glimpses of what lay beyond if johnson had written only the single phrase the hunger of the imagination which preys upon life we should know that he knew there were more things in heaven and earth than were dreamed of in boswell's philosophy we must never forget that johnson was religious in an age of irreligion and the knowledge which he compressed by force of will within the rigid framework of his rationality shows nowhere more clearly than in the implications of his later remark on kit smart madness frequently discovers itself by unnecessary deviation from the usual modes of the world my poor friend smart showed the disturbance of his mind by falling upon his knees and saying his prayers in the street or in any other unusual place now although rationally speaking it is greater madness not to pray at all than to pray as smart did i am afraid there are so many who do not pray that their understanding is not called in question End of section seven section eight of discoveries essays and literary criticism by john middleton murray this librivox recording is in the public domain poe's poetry it has long since been admitted that the two greatest poets of america are poe and whitman the poetry of both belongs to the literature of the world but there is an essential difference between their positions whitman is almost a hundred per cent american poe is not whitman is clean outside the english tradition poe belongs to it as a poet he is the successor of the english romantics he learned from byron and shelley and keats and he taught swinburne as a prose writer he alone gave to the great romantic movement in fiction which swept over europe early in the nineteenth century the immortality of high and serious art were it not for the consummation of poe's tales the mysteries of monk lewis and mrs radcliffe would have been only a cul-de-sac no other american writer has so clearly marked a place in the english tradition as poe he is a necessary link in the chain to compensate no great american writer is less distinctively american than he this is not to diminish america's claim to poe or to suggest that his life would have been of another kind had he worked in england the om domne of romanticism would no doubt have been unfortunate in any country but poe would at least have found congenial companions in london and in paris he would have tasted some of the sweets of an immense succes d'estime and perhaps he would have been able to earn more money it is no good repining over poe's miserable life now but more truly than baudelaire's himself he was the albatross of the famous sonnet in america he was exiled from his element and he died in consequence speculation upon what might have been but was not is generally dismissed as idle day-dreaming but it has a function and a valuable function in criticism it is a method of exercising the logic of the imagination a great writer is something more than a man who lived his circumscribed physical existence at a given point of time he is an 
incarnate potentiality of the human soul concerning which it is legitimate to inquire whether the conditions attending its embodiment were good or bad relatively good of course is the best we can hope for genius in this rough world of compromise the artist has no right to complain if he is misunderstood by the large mass of his contemporaries but he has the right to expect to be comprehended by a few of his peers the artist to whom this is denied may arraign the injustice of heaven poe's isolation in america was of this unhappy and stultifying kind and its effects upon his poetry are plain for the most remarkable thing about him as a poet is the contrast between his scanty production even with a long introduction and twenty new fragments mr witty's edition makes a very small book and the natural facility the unmistakable fecundity of his poetic genius poe was by endowment a prolific poet as prolific as the men between whom he ideally takes his place as keats and shelley or as swinburne and tennyson he was not by temper a meticulous artist he theorized about poetry it is true but that was rather a manifestation of his general intellectual alertness and to some extent a gesture of defiance than a sign of unusual poetic self-consciousness there is an almost byronic freedom and flow in his verses but he had a finer and more delicate mind than byron's and some of his poems are on an altogether higher poetic level while in most of them can be found a few lines of a kind that byron could never have written moreover the poems of poe's boyhood tamerlane published when he was eighteen and all Araf, published when he was twenty though they have their immaturities are astonishing productions they are indubitably poems and they contain passages of imaginative beauty and splendid phrasing to a modern reader al araf which might justly be called poe's endymion holds suggestions both of keats and of shelley now happiest loveliest in yon lovely earth whence sprang the idea of beauty into birth falling in wreaths through many a startled star like woman's hair mid pearls until afar it lit on hills achaean and there dwelt she looked into infinity and knelt surely one says that is the work of a young man who not only has the vision and the faculty divine but has also read keats and shelley yet it must be very doubtful whether poe had read them when he wrote al araf it was written at some time between eighteen twenty seven and eighteen twenty nine that is before the galanagne edition of the two english poets and at a time when the total number of copies of books by both of them not gathering dust upon the publishers shelves probably did not exceed a thousand it is hardly likely that a dozen had crossed the atlantic and less likely still that two of them fell into the hands of an impecunious soldier in a virginian garrison the point is interesting even if al araf owed something to keats and shelley it is still a remarkable achievement but if it owed them nothing it is altogether astonishing its richness its movement its lucidity its evident creation out of overflow make it one of those rare juvenilia from which can truly be predicted poetical eminence to come this eminence poe never completely attained simply because the body of his finest work is not massive enough he has the quality but not the quantity of a great poet and this imperfect realization of his poetic powers was due as the internal evidence alone makes clear not to any deficiency in himself but to the hostile conditions in which he was compelled to work events not to be controlled he wrote in the preface to the eighteen forty five edition of his poems have prevented me from making at any time any serious effort in what under happier circumstances would have been the field of my choice with me poetry has been not a purpose but a passion and the passion should be held in reverence they must not they cannot at will be excited with an eye to the paltry compensations or the more paltry commendations of mankind our impulse is to suspect such a declaration in poe's case it was the simple truth after the first striking contrast between his obvious fecundity and the smallness of his production another no less striking appears between the comparative crudity of some of his poems and the delicate austerity of others the crudity of the raven and lenore is of course only relative these popular poems do produce their effect and still more certainly the bells is successful but when we compare them with ulalum and annabel lee we feel that the creative impulse has been coarsened the technical power is constant but the degree to which poe's poetic individuality is realized is much less in the one case than the other 
it is the difference between the romance which the early nineteenth-century public adored and the romance which haunted poe's mind the heightened awareness of spiritual mystery which he so beautifully expressed in the little poem romance of late eternal condor years so shake the very heaven on high with tumult as they thunder by i have no time for idle cares through gazing on the unquiet sky and when an hour with calmer wings its down upon my spirit flings that little time with lyre and rhyme to while away forbidden things my heart would feel to be a crime unless it trembled with the strings in post most popular poems his heart does not tremble with the strings we know because there are many of his poems in which it does where the poem is the expression of an intimate romantic emotion which has hardly more than the name in common with the crude supernatural thrills in which his contemporaries delighted the essence of poe's romance is the eternal perplexity of the soul that turns aside from the harsh reality to the imagined perfection of a dream it is a spirit akin to that which finds utterance in mr de la mare's poetry to-day and in mr de la mare's poetry we find the distinctest echoes of poe's subtler music compare the modern poet's thule itself a familiar country of poe's with helen thy beauty is to me like those nicene barks of yore that gently o'er a perfumed sea the weary wayward wanderer bore to his own native shore that note as surely sounds on in mr de la mare's work as swinburne prolonged the robuster reverberations of ulaloon as starts bediamond crescent distinct with its duplicate horn but though poe had many manners he had but a single matter and the manner which best suited it is not the manner by which he is best known his finest poems such as the lines to helen or the sleeper are far quieter than those for which he is most famous for his matter is secret and subtle and shy the raven perched on the bust of pallas is but a poor symbol for the intimate mystery el dorado touches it much more nearly and is in consequence a simple and perfect poem it is poe's equivalent of la belle dame sans merci as al arath is his endymion and this curious parallelism with keats appears again in the low-toned and beautiful poems in blank verse addressed to various women poe seems to have shared keats's determination to escape if he could from the dramatic artificiality of blank verse and to make it responsive to more personal emotions like keats himself he was not wholly successful but we are struck by the curious resemblance in tone between the rewritten induction to hyperion and such an opening of pose as this not long ago the writer of these lines in the mad pride of intellectuality maintained the power of word denied that ever a thought arose within the human brain beyond the utterance of the human tongue compare with this the lines from the opening of the new hyperion who alive can say thou art no poet mayest not tell thy dreams since every man whose soul is not a clod hath visions and would speak if he had loved and been well nurtured in his mother tongue whether the dream now proposed to rehearse be poets or fanatics will be known when this warm scrub my hand is in the grave there is a curious tonelessness which some might call mere flatness common to the blank verse of these two poets towards the end of their lives both alike give the impression that they have touched the fringe of a truth more sacred to them than art itself poe's tragedy as a poet is that he was compelled to a compromise he was forced by the necessities of living to use his great rhythmical gift in writing poems that might pass with an american editor of the martin chuzzlewit period it is not surprising that he gave up the struggle and devoted himself to prose of a kind that permitted him to make a little money without losing his own self-respect keats without his two thousand pounds shelley without his private income would they we wonder have written more or more finely than poe but they would at least have been sustained by a handful of understanding friends it does not appear that poe had one the twenty new poems that have been unearthed by mr witty for this edition are without importance with the exception of one a love poem beginning sleep on sleep on another hour i would not break so calm a sleep to wake to sunshine and to shower to smile and weep it is not the perfectly individual sentiment of poe's best poems but it is limpid and beautiful and it is a valuable addition to his work most of the other pieces are scraps and album rhymes one of them is worth remembering as a sample of the sentimental punning which poets of poe's day permitted themselves it is indited to a lady called kate carroll 
when from your gems of thought i turn to those pure orbs your heart to learn i scarce know which to prize more high the bright idea or bright dear eye keats and lamb both did that kind of thing occasionally but even they never did anything worse young ladies and albums have a great deal to answer for yet to be honest poe seems to have owed to them some of the happiest moments of his distracted life End of section eight. Section nine of Discoveries Essays in Literary Criticism by John Middleton Murray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Matthew Arnold the Poet. In Matthew Arnold the Poet were two men who struggled with one another until they were both exhausted and the poet was dead. We may call one of these romantic and the other classical or we might say that one was the heart and the other the head it is better however not to be too quick with our labels but rather try to see what was the particular nature of the deep division in his soul for this division made him the individual poet that he was and prevented him from becoming the greater poet that he might have been matthew arnold was a profoundly troubled man he had no belief he was honest enough not to disguise from himself that he had none and he was serious enough to know by bitter experience that it is hard indeed to live without a belief his loyalty to his own dignity as a human being kept him from seeking self-oblivion by a mere excess of blind activity in a society whose spirit seemed to him dead and its motives sordid yet though he tried he could not find in himself that inward confidence of soul which alone as he well knew would enable him to stand firm in isolation a deep disbelief in the world calls for a correspondingly deep belief in one's self this matthew arnold could not achieve his was always the old unquiet heart that neither deadens into rest nor ever feels the fiery glow that whirls the spirit from itself away but fluctuates to and fro never by passion quite possessed and never quite benumbed by the world's sway it seemed to him that he could never possess his soul somewhere in the depths of himself he believed was concealed the truth of his own being a life and a law of life indefeasibly his but he could not make contact with them save in fitful moments of which neither the influence nor even the memory endured and he felt that he was like a ship whose compass had been demagnetized before the voyage of life began the needle did not point steadily to the north and the courses steered were erratic and contradictory and we have been on many thousand lines and we have shown on each talent and power but hardly have we for one little hour been in our own line have we been ourselves to be oneself to possess one's own soul this arnold knew was the necessity if this could be achieved belief was achieved and an end of perturbation resolve to be thyself and know that he who finds himself loses his misery but through some hidden weakness the way could not be found the discovery could not be made the water would not flow from the living rock at the bidding of his resolve and slowly and steadily his creative impulse withered because he could not strike the source of life within himself he was a man of far too fine a nature to pretend to what he did not possess or claim the discovery of that which he had not found from the beginning he possessed a sad lucidity of soul in virtue of which he knew what he was what he needed and wherein he failed the poems of his later years are few and far between they are cold and incredibly sad the man who growing old could write of that condition that it is to spend long days and not once feel that we were ever young must have remembered that he had a soul chiefly by the pain of the iron that had entered into it to what could such a man hold fast where could he look for balsam for what he called the strange disease of modern life from whom could he summon aid against the something that infects the world being a poet he turned to the poets of the poets who belonged to his own spiritual epoch he regarded only two as having reached some kind of inward security they were goethe and wordsworth yet goethe seemed to him too remote and olympian and wordsworth to have achieved his serenity by turning his face away from half the things that are 
perhaps if he had wrestled with shakespeare more and compelled him to stand and abide his question he would have found a deeper consolation than any which wordsworth or goethe could offer instead he tried to turn away to the serenity of greece the attempt was self-deception in a sense arnold's classicism was merely the culmination of his romanticism just as flaubert's impassivity was an extreme manifestation of his uncontrollable sensibility these contemporaries were cast in the same mould they were both by nature romantic individualists they were both afraid of themselves each sought safety as an artist in a principle outside himself and alien to his own nature flaubert the realist and matthew arnold the classicist are kindred phenomena and their works reveal the same radical heterogeneity the same evidence of the divided soul it was fortunate that arnold turned his gifts to criticism there his creative weakness became a strength and his indecision was transformed into catholicity the man who took refuge from his own romanticism in a reverence for the classical tradition was eminently fitted to appreciate excellence in either kind but arnold's efforts as a poet to be classical were less fortunate the early empedocles on etna which is a very obvious transposition of his own romantic attitude into a slight classical setting is a better poem than the later merope which is his attempt to be the complete greek tragedian yet he refused to reprint empedocles on etna because it did not satisfy the aristotelian canon that drama must be an imitation of actions as though empedocles on etna were a drama at all of his two attempts to apply on a miniature scale something of the classical method to non-classical subjects balder dead is a complete and frigid failure not so with sorab and rustum that it seems to me is arnold's finest and most original poem in spite of its frankly homeric similes arnold's impotence with metaphor is significant and its purely miltonic blank verse structure it is a single whole impressive dignified and deeply moving in sorb and rustum as so often in arnold's poetry we can recognize the elements and assign them to their sources we feel that his borrowings are borrowings we are fully aware how derivative the poem is yet it moves and delights us and the prime cause of this success is that he for once acted instinctively in the spirit of the true classical canon and chose a really significant human action for his theme it is the more striking that his instinct should have failed him in merope and balderdead he seems to have lacked courage to a point at which he was unable to distinguish between an action which ought on some a priori grounds to be significant and an action which he himself felt to be significant the story of sorb and rustum moved him and he moves us by his new creation of it the stories of merope and balder dead left him cold and the poems leave us cold no man he wrote in the long and tedious preface to merope itself can do his best with a subject which does not penetrate him no man can be penetrated by a subject which he does not conceive independently that is true but a poet needs the full courage of himself no less when he seeks the safety of the classical method than when he claims for himself romantic liberty he must have the courage to choose a theme not because it is like other themes which have proved impressive when conceived by far different minds and created by hands far different from his own but because it makes an immediate and profound appeal to his instinctive nature the story of sorb and rustum is as real to the modern consciousness of which arnold was an inheritor as it was to the persian historian who recorded it the reality of the story of merope has passed with the passing of the greek mind the truth of the story of balder has gone the desolate way of the northern gods arnold's poetry is divided sharply according to the division which was in himself on the one hand is his personal and romantic poetry on the other the impersonal and classical the former is the more interesting but one could scarcely call it the better poetry arnold's gait was too heavy for the lyric and it was only for brief moments that he could move freely and lightly as he did through the whole of the forsaken merman there are snatches of authentic lyric in the final song from empedocles on edna not here o apollo are haunts meet for thee but where helicon breaks down in cliff to the sea where the moon silvered inlets send far the light voice up the still vale of thisbe o speed and rejoice yet even there the drag of the heavy foot becomes perceptible and we feel the imminent menace of arnold's deliberation 
his most consistent achievement was in the kind which we call elegiac it suited best with his own persistent mood of restrained regret for the life which he could not accept and the soul which he could not make his own moreover in his elegiac poetry what mr saintsbury has happily called his elaborate assumption of the singing robe was in keeping with a true and living literary tradition for the tradition of elegiac poetry settled once for all in england by the powerful genius of milton comes to us unbroken from classical times in spirit it is not truly classical the alexandrian idolus theocritus beyond and moschus with whom it began belong to a decadence that makes them only the more potent and natural influences in a non-classical epoch for they represent an attitude which was possible only at a time when the self-contained greek universe was being disintegrated though they wrote in greek they are modern and the tradition which takes its rise from them is one which is native to english poetry the tradition of classical greek drama is alien to it therefore when arnold followed milton and shelley and keats in thyrsus and the scholar gypsy he was not wasting himself in the hopeless task of trying to resuscitate a dead tradition and a forgotten consciousness not only was the mood of dignified melancholy peculiarly his own but the manner of its expression had been organized into an english tradition by great poets before him the elegiac tradition we may fairly say has become in spite of its alexandrian origins a truly english tradition it is the nearest thing we have to a definite poetic tradition at all matthew arnold fearful of leaning wholly upon himself turned instinctively towards the congenial security it offered and he achieved two minor triumphs in the kind that they are very derivative is of no great consequence those who care for these things should perhaps find only an added delight in the many acts of recognition to which they are compelled they will experience a curious and subtle pleasure in registering the debt which the famous lines of the scholar gypsy far most i know thou lovest retired ground thee at the fairy oxford riders blithe returning home on summer nights have met crossing the stripling thames at block hythe trailing in the cool stream thy fingers wet as the slow punt swings round o oh, to the yet more famous lines of keats so to autumn who hath not seen thee oft amid thy store sometimes whoever seeks abroad may find thee sitting careless on a granary floor thy hair soft lifted by the winnowing wind but these encounters only serve to sharpen the fine point of seldom pleasure not to blunt it matthew arnold tired however even of elegy for the one elegy towards which he would have been inexorably driven had he continued in the vein would have been an elegy upon himself on the death of his own soul of that elegy there are only snatches and fragments sudden accents of grinding and empty misery wandering between two worlds one born the other powerless to be born with nowhere yet to rest my head like these on earth i wait forlorn herein for all his reticences and restraints arnold no less than the wildest romantic was the victim of his own self-deception he transferred to the world without his own deep division of soul but it was not the world that had failed but he the stream of poetry of creative life dwindled and died within him and he knew the cause he declared it in a nameless epitaph this sentence have i left behind an aching body and a mind not wholly clear nor wholly blind too keen to rest too weak to find are god's worst portion to mankind end of section nine section ten of discoveries essays in literary criticism by john middleton murray this librivox recording is in the public domain english prose in the nineteenth century it would be hard to find two little books full of better reading than these unlike most anthologies they are satisfying they are solid food not hors d'oeuvre the highly spiced artistic writing which usually is regarded by the anthologist as the only right english prose is here presented to us against a background of the normal prose achievement of the age we are given a glimpse of the whole landscape and are not confined to a few select parterres we have a sense therefore of the whole movement of english prose during the nineteenth century we see it gradually disengaging itself from the grandiose gesture of johnson and gibbon 
we watch the slow decay of the historical writing for which gibbon established the idiom and the slow growth of the power of the novelist who for the purpose of exactly recording his clear imaginations becomes bolder and bolder in his effort to squeeze the stiffness and the rhetoric out of his language and the struggle is the more thrilling because its details are obscure and its causes to no small degree economic generalization in literary criticism is as rash as it is in life and just as necessary the fact that we can discern a dozen exceptions will not deter us from regarding the history of english prose in the nineteenth century as in the main the history of the struggle of the novelist for suppleness and plasticity against the rhetorical tradition of the historian and the orator that is the principal issue at the beginning of the century the historical writer was the grave and reverend seigneur of literature and the novelist at best a poor relation scott by a happy stroke of genius or natural inclination managed to carry the dignity of the historical writer into his fictions but the rest of the novelists were very small beer on the palate of contemporary opinion reading novels as northanger abbey shows us was an indulgence like going to the cinema to-day you confessed it with shame and fell bound by a kind of freemasonry to a fellow sinner in cranford miss jenkins sternly rebukes poor captain brown for his admiration of the pickwick papers she doesn't think they are by any means equal to dr johnson and after listening resignedly to the boiled mutton swarry at bath deals him a majestic coup de grace by reading some of imlac's conversations from rasselas the odd thing to our modern sense is that it took the novelist himself a long while to be sure of the independent dignity of his own profession and his right to handle prose to suit his own designs even in dickens the uncertainty is sometimes apparent in thackeray more often while in george eliot it was a positive disease the liveliness of her dialogue is at civil war with the heaviness of her description which even at its finest and most impressive is discordant with the substance of her narrative she seems never to have been convinced that a proper dignity could be achieved by vivid presentation alone and this curious heresy a product of the divided mind persists even to-day critics still deny imagination to novelists who do not write imaginatively and novelists like mr wells do not believe in their own seriousness unless they make their characters talk seriously on serious themes meanwhile in the tradition of historical writing itself revolutionary forces were at work on a long view both macaulay and carlyle represent the incursion of the imaginative realization of the novelist into the dignified kingdom of history the counter move to that penetration of fiction by the dignity of history of which scott was the hero it is the storming of the bastille no wonder macaulay was popular london in sixteen eighty five is as good as is even better than a fine historical novel and perhaps if we look at the realities and not the labels it is only the setting for one of the finest carlyle applies his sheer integrity of imagination to recreating the smallest of my lord general's battles and for all his seeming rhetoric has gone much farther than macaulay in eliminating the vague emptiness of phrase which is the real vice of rhetoric from his language but both of them were in rebellion against the old set-piece of the historian such as milman's account of the burning of the temple it was an appalling spectacle to the roman what was it to the jew the whole summit of the hill which commanded the city blazed like a volcano one after another the buildings fell in with a tremendous crash and were swallowed up in the fiery abyss the roofs of cedar were like sheets of flame the gilded pinnacles shone like stripes of red light the gate towers sent up tall columns of flame and smoke the neighbouring hills were lighted up and dark groups of people were seen watching in horrible anxiety the progress of the destruction the walls and heights of the upper city were crowded with faces some pale with a agony of despair other scowling unavailing vengeance 
all who have been through the mill of a classical education are familiar with it it is the piece for latin prose it reads as all such pieces do like an eloquent translation but how much real imaginative vision does it contain to the sceptical critic it is arranged as carefully and as artificially as a corps de ballet we might call it the conflagration piece because we know it would do equally well and equally ill for any burning of a city in history to ascribe writing of this kind to latin influence is scarcely fair to the romans it would not indeed have been written without them and it is quite as good as a passage from a second-rate roman historian but its mechanism is more important than its latinity it has dignity without substance and whether the dignity is roman or not is of small account latinity would not have prevented milman from doing better had his mind been better he is vaguely impressive and that is all but when carlyle stands in front of the bastille he has thoughts and feelings of his own he also heard a howl of indignation but it meant something to him it had its place and value in a vision of things hast thou considered how each man's heart is so tremendously responsive to the hearts of all men hast thou noted how omnipotent is the very sound of many men how their shriek of indignation palsies the strong soul their howl of contumely withers with unfelt pangs great is the combined voice of men the utterance of their instincts which are truer than their thoughts it is the greatest of men encounters among the sounds and shadows which make up this world of time he who can resist that has his footing somewhere beyond time delawney could not do it moralizing some may say perhaps but what volume and resonance it gives to the clamor of the crowd as it were an endorsement from eternity we feel that we have heard one of the great cries of history prose there is no prose there is only the complete and coherent utterance of a man who feels and sees and thinks clearly and is convinced that his feeling and vision and thought is worth utterance it is that which holds us dickens sees mrs gamp and betsy prig henry james sees daisy miller charles reed watches the struggle of dennis and gerard with the bear as it is excited over the fight between the gasmen and neat mrs gaskell knows her cranford their dress is very independent of fashion as they observe what does it signify how we dress here at cranford where everybody knows us and if they go from home their reason is equally cogent what does it signify how we dress here where nobody knows us and the result is though not the same of the same kind in all a sudden sense of revelation of a significance hitherto unseen made plain it is this constant effort of the individual vision the individual conviction to make itself visible and felt through the constraining garment of language which makes the reading of these little encyclopedias of english prose so exciting the thing takes shape before our eyes out of a vague confusion of sounds a clear melody slowly emerges and to compensate in a measure for the lack of volume towards the end of the century there is a new delicacy an unfamiliar subtlety how much insecurity and fumbling had gone before when henry james at last produced that perfectly clear and enchanting profile of daisy miller what were the elements out of which walter pater suddenly produced the whole new music she is older than the rocks among which she sits like the vampire she has been dead many times and learned the secrets of the grave which so justly thrilled the ears of eager youth a whole generation ago the point in which these anthologies differ and differ gloriously from most prose anthologies is that they treat the novelist with the respect that is his due for some strange reason the composition of prose is generally supposed to be the privilege of the essayist as we have said the novelist himself has sometimes accepted the superstition and it was with something of mr jordan's surprise that somewhere about the middle of the last century he discovered that he had been writing prose all along but the superstition dies hard and we can find traces of it even in these catholic volumes in which stevenson is as represented as ever by a's triplex and virginibus pru isque whereas treasure island is full of a better prose than that there is as henry james so exquisitely said always the tinkle of the supererogatory sword to be heard in stevenson's language it is part of the man and we love him and his work for it but precisely in s triplex the tinkle becomes almost a rattle the manner a mannerism 
but the last thing to do is to quarrel with an anthologist who has done his work with such real critical originality as mr peacock the point with regard to stevenson arises merely because we believe that the best writing in the early part of the nineteenth century was done on the whole by the essayists and in the latter half by the novelists to this generalization again it is easy to discover exceptions nevertheless it is roughly true and the principal cause of this is the continual increase in the vitality of the novel as a literary form during the century in spite of poets historians and essayists it is preeminently the century of the novel had they been born fifty years later hazlitt and de quincey yes and even the incomparable elia would have found the sheer force of attraction of the novel irresistible but when they flourished the limited audience to which the writer could appeal was more ready to absorb history and essays and poetry than the still despised fiction with the opening of the democratic demand the novel was established and like the drama in elizabethan days it began to drain nearly all the creative vitality of literature into itself the essay which is so various and full-blooded at the beginning of the century begins to look like a pale ghost at the end and history which had verily belonged to the province of the creative writer passes into the grip of the specialist indeed our present condition is such that we wonder where unless they had put on the disguise of fiction many of the finest pieces of writing in these volumes would to-day find an editor there seems to be from the practical point of view of the literary agent absolutely no place for them we might fairly talk nowadays of the tyranny of the novel and if we looked behind that we should probably discover the tyranny of the women subscribers to the libraries yet it would be not only unprofitable but also ungenerous to complain the enormous vogue of the novel if it has confined literature has also helped to keep it alive we may deplore that mr hardy was prevented by it from giving us more of his poetry in his years of maturity or that gissing whom we are rather surprised to find altogether absent from these volumes should have been denied by it the pleasure of writing the scholarly essays to which his talent was suited nevertheless in spite of this waste we have to remember that it was no small thing that a literary genre should have been established by which it was possible for a writer to earn a competence without losing his self-respect the vast audience of novel readers has at least helped to abolish grub street and if as seems possible it will begin to enlarge its interests the stream of english prose which has been narrowed perforce will expand again at present a great deal goes into the novel which would be much better out of it but the optimist will interpret such signs as the popularity of mr wells history of the world of mr lytton strachey's essays and biography and of books of collected short stories as indicating that the middle of the present century will find prose once more as various as it was in the middle of the last and a good deal more self-supporting end of section ten Section 11 of Discoveries, Essays in Literary Criticism by John Middleton Murray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Creation of Falstaff When we are confronted with the work of a great writer, our first impulse is one to complete acceptance and surrender. We accept the miraculous gift which the author in his bounty places in our hands we surrender ourselves utterly into his keeping it is as though we stood before the gate and he spoke the open sesame the doors swing wide and we enter a strange new minted world shining bright or sombre gleaming of which the great writer is the sole emperor through which he alone can guide us in which we can only wonder and rejoice we may be sad we may be happy while we wander behind him but our sadness and our happiness are not of this world for we are when the door closes upon us once again sad that we could have been so happy and happy that we could have been so sad and this suffices many indeed it is sufficient this and nothing other is what the writer has to give he makes us free of a new kingdom of the soul we accept his gift and rejoice but in very truth a miracle has been worked upon us 
we cannot help it we ponder this thing in our hearts we begin to see that this kingdom of the soul which has been opened to us must be also a kingdom of our own souls otherwise we should never have recognized it or known it for what it was the great writer vindicates our right to our own forgotten majesty and disturbs us with memories of the splendors of our own deep buried past he puts before us something far greater far meaner far darker far brighter than we ourselves are and we accept it we accept it because we know more than know because we feel it is true this character is so different from our waking selves so infinitely more heroic or more earthy than we it seems ever have been or can ever be is approved by us long silent voices arise from within us and salute it this is true how do we know in virtue of what faculty do we feel that this is true and the answer is i believe that we are in fact far greater than we know and far more mysterious than in this strange life in which we have encased and imprisoned ourselves we can suffer to admit ourselves to be our roots strike deeper into the darkness and our flowers rise more splendid into the light than we dare to acknowledge darkness is not more terrible than light the extreme uplifting of which the human soul is capable terrifies no less than the warm gloom of chaos whence it sprung and to which in its mightiest moments it must return we turn away from the blinding poles does not light blind as well as darkness but at moments we are visited by gleams and whispers which we acknowledge not knowing what we do under the compulsion of a great writer chiefly we confess what we are then in our pondering comes the further question what manner of man is this who works these spells upon us who can turn our faces to the darkness from which we rose and to which we must ascend and to the light towards which we soar and from which we must fall who brings down gleams and calls up whispers which are new and old and familiar and strange so that having heard them we are like the wakened lovers of john donne who return from the darkness wherein they have plunged to the limbo light in which we live the twilight mist in which we seek our safety the dim draping with which we envelop the world in order to call it real like dunn's lovers we say and now good morrow to our waking souls which watch not one another out of fear fear of the deeps fear of the heights between which human life is perilously swung fear of the great downward thrust of the root fear of the great upward surge of the bursting flower fear and secret thrill of the triumph we glimpse but never shall achieve fear and a secret pulse of expectation we shall never justify what manner of man is this who works this magic black magic and white upon our souls what is your substance whereof are you made that millions of strange shadows on you tend and the answer is of what the great writer makes us aware of that he is as he in the strange rediscovery of life which is his mission and his that is sad but sad only with the sadness of its most beautiful line and tell sad stories of the death of kings nothing to grind the heart or stab the soul at worst something for a wry smile or a tear that is a pleasant relief from happiness no truly it was a golden world into which shakespeare was born a golden man to delight in it there was a soft and steady sunshine upon everything then something happened what it was we do not know at least in the manner of our speech we say we do not know but by that we mean only that we do not know the event the outward visible happening that would make a headline in the newspapers or a nine day scandal for the gossips of the town but what in heaven's name does it matter whether we know this or not could we by knowing it know one single jot or tittle more about the living soul of the man who suffered the discomfiture they write books about shakespeare the man they hunt out for him hypothetical mistresses they claim to tell us what the sonnets mean in terms of outward events as if by this blind raking in obscurity they could discover something they scarcely pause to remember that the greater a man is the more completely is an event merged in his inward reaction to the event 
not what happens to but what happens in him is the subject for our care not what he suffers but what he becomes we cannot help our human curiosity it is not a bad thing it has its roots in common human sympathy and flowers in the desire to make the great man as familiar as our neighbour but these trivial searches so easily lead us to forget that the road of knowledge lies elsewhere and is as open as the day any one who cares to may know far more about shakespeare than he can about his nearest and dearest friend he can know the very motion of shakespeare's mind the very pulse of his being something may or may not have happened to shakespeare but something happened in him suddenly the world that was rich and single and golden became bitter and double and dark it was rent asunder on the one hand darkness and loathing on the other a blinding light and an anguished longing ineffable darkness and ineffable light read claudio's speech to isabella in measure for measure ay but to die and go we know not where to lie in cold obstruction and to rot this sensible warm motion to become a kneaded clod and the delighted spirit to bathe in fiery floods or to reside in thrilling region of thick ribbed ice to be imprisoned in the viewless winds and blown with restless violence round about the pendant world or to be worse than worst of those that lawless and incertain thought imagines howling tis too horrible and read beside it the phoenix and the turtle the most miraculous poem of unearthly love we have the voice of the consummation when spirit has winged its way free of all the mud of earth and passion has become virginal once more on the other hand the whole atmosphere of measure for measure is heavy with disgusted sensuality and the same oppression or the same obsession is in hamlet yet these are all the works of a single period disruption has come and out of what was single the spiritual and the animal have resolved themselves the incessant strife of the ideal and the actual has begun the struggle which was to carry shakespeare through macbeth and lear to antony and cleopatra and if not to a final serenity to the mysterious alliance between a belief that life is illusion and a dreaming faith in a generation yet unborn for whom this vision and this conflict should no longer be for the tempest is as it were a crystal in which shakespeare shows us a universe ordered anew another harmony another wholeness a reuniting of the divided parts in the words of virgil's messianic eclogue the movement of shakespeare's mind to this conclusion the incessant forward swinging from ideal to real from darkness to light and back again including evermore of the totality of human experience in its ambit and at last the brightness of the light become dazzling by virtue of the depth of darkness to which it is opposed the story of this movement is one upon which i cannot enter here what i have said is nothing more than the roughest sketch of the curve of shakespeare's progress in order to make clear the position which this question of false staff holds in the whole problem of shakespeare falstaff is the greatest creation of the yet undivided being of shakespeare he is the creature of shakespeare's golden prime of his first maturity he is in a sense the symbol of shakespeare's natural attitude the spontaneous fruit of his uninterrupted growth or rather i should say he is this in essence and by intention actually as i shall try to show he is something different he is conditioned and maimed and stunted i cannot prove my contention i may hope to convince you of it but that is all the facts in an inquiry such as this are not of an order that admits of proof they are not and cannot be made objects for scientific scrutiny the facts are four plays the two parts of henry the fourth the merry wives of windsor and henry the fifth there is no doubt a sense in which these can be made objects for scientific scrutiny you can measure the lines compute the number of weak endings and of strong establish the proportion of prose to verse or you can examine them as though they were logical demonstrations and find out the missing steps the inconsistencies the non sequiturs or you can calculate how much actual time is consumed by the action or presupposed by it all these things have been done and they will probably be done over again many times they are nearly all irrelevant for in this order of things this preeminently spiritual order the fact of a play is not so many lines or printed words but our reaction to them once 
granted that the facts with which we have to deal are our reactions the next thing is to discriminate among reactions our natural inclination is to regard falstaff as a whole he appears in the first part of henry the fourth he reappears in the second part he reappears once more in the merry wives and he dies in henry the fifth nothing could be simpler where is the problem you may ask and indeed if falstaff is merely a name nothing could be simpler and the problem is not there the name appears reappears disappears octum est but falstaff is far more than a name he is a character he is the embodiment of a vision of life and if we look more closely into the quality of his appearances and reappearances we can see that he is not a whole and that there is a problem it comes to us first in these terms falstaff is completely alive in henry the fourth part one he is far less alive in part two he is something altogether different in the merry wives and in henry the fifth he is dead falstaff is completely alive in henry the fourth part one but we can say more than that in that play falstaff is primus inter powers he is the first and greatest but he is the first and greatest among equals hotspur being a character of history with his fate appointed in the authorities has to die but if he could have been spared he might have become another falstaff for posterity of course there could not be another falstaff but there could have been a rival to falstaff a character animated by a like fundamental irresponsibility the antithesis of falstaff but his complement also as careless in his pursuit of honour as falstaff in his pursuit of sack it is a curious relation that holds between the man who thought it were an easy leap to pluck bright honour from the pale-faced moon and the other who said can honour set to a leg no or an arm no honour hath no skill in surgery then no what is honour a word what is that word honour what is that honour air a trim reckoning who hath it he that died a wednesday doth he feel it no doth he hear it no tis insensible then yes to the dead but will it live with the living no why detraction will not suffer it therefore i'll none of it honour is a mere scutcheon and so ends my catechism but though it is a strange one the relation between these two exists it is not a relation that would have been recognized by either of them in daily life hotspur would have despised falstaff and falstaff when safely out of reach of his sword would have laughed at hotspur it is a relation of another kind for hotspur like falstaff is a character of the first order in sheer imaginative reality he runs the fat night very close he lives and moves and has his being his scene with lady percy his scene with glendower belong to the very highest manifestations of shakespeare's creative power in his first unbroken period when he seems to have been simply a force of nature in a sense in which perhaps only homer and tolstoy and dickens have been forces of nature expressing themselves through the written word we feel that the first part of henry the fourth is naturally balanced and harmonious it plays within a single world of shakespeare's imagination falstaff is one denizen of it hotspur another they breathe the same air the same sunlight shines upon them and we feel that if our vision were delicate enough we could see how the one creation implied the other for we have a sense of them as necessary projections of the same moment in the same mood of the same genius and what is true of these two heroes of the play holds good of the play altogether there is an astonishing interdependence of the parts they are irradiated by a shining atmosphere of unity which it would need much labour to define for it is by nature almost beyond definition but the word to describe it is i suppose lambent tongues of smiling flame play over everything and the point at which we can most nearly capture the essence in a few lines is perhaps at prince henry's casual remark i'm not yet of percy's mind the hot spur of the north he that kills me some six or seven dozen scots at a breakfast washes his hands and says to his wife fie upon this quiet life i want work go my sweet harry says she how many hast thou killed to-day give my roan horse a drench says he and answers some fourteen an hour after a trifle a trifle intrinsically it is perhaps not funnier than a dozen of the things that falstaff says but its effect in its place following immediately upon the marvellous scene between hotspur and his wife is prodigious this slant and smiling sunbeam we feel can be thrown upon anything hotspur throws it on the gentleman who came to demand his prisoners and on glendower prince harry on hotspur falstaff on prince harry and shakespeare himself on the world but in the second part 
this magical condition this champagne atmosphere exists no longer the second part contains of course many marvellous things but this radiant naturalness is intermittent instead of being a play in which falstaff is only a triumphant particular crystallization of the general element there is no general element at all neither unity nor atmosphere of unity against an irrelevant background of unsavoury history falstaff performs and as often as not he has no heart at all in the performance he is quite as often merely mechanical as he is inspired this falling off has been recognised by many and condoned or excused or explained it has been said for instance that between writing the first and the second parts of henry the fourth shakespeare had come under the influence of ben jonson's inferior and mechanical conception of comedy it is not likely on general grounds that a commanding genius conscious of its powers should be warped by the theories of a talent to be influenced is one thing to be inhibited is quite another and as a matter of fact it is precisely where the comedy of henry the fourth part two is in setting and externals most johnsonian that shakespeare first becomes himself again the tavern scene where falstaff dines with mistress quickly and dull tear sheet a trick of name shakespeare may very well have taken from johnson may offend our modern pretenses of refinement it is nevertheless superb quite how superb we can only realize at the end when it is plain that shakespeare has achieved the miracle of carrying a thread of true sentiment clean through the scene without even a momentary discord and falstaff is himself again in the scenes in which he is engaged in monstrously misusing the king's press in gloucestershire it is when he is alone with no other comic characters to bear him up that it is most evident that the virtue has departed from him his opening scene with the lord chief justice is a queer affair falstaff says some good things in the course of it if it were taken away we should never know what that he was born about three o'clock in the afternoon with a white head and something a round belly and certainly we should never have guessed that he had lost his voice with hollowing and singing of anthems but for the most part the richness has departed the fat knight's wit has become thin and verbal and boring the stage play is effective but the substance of the talk is not and when falstaff plays the old old comic trick of pretending not to hear the lord chief justice we know that shakespeare is getting through an uncongenial task by relying on his knowledge of stage technique falstaff never had to depend for his being upon such props before nor did he ever descend so low as in his reply to the lord chief justice's rebuke chief justice there is not a white hair on your face but should have his effect of gravity falstaff his effect of gravy 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 let us hope that that is a gag of the elizabethan clown which has found its way into the text there is nothing quite so imbecile as that in the scene on the whole it is not too much to say that in this second part of henry the fourth falstaff is rather carried on than recreated there is his great monologue on the virtues of sherry sack there are a few scattered sentences of which the most famous perhaps is i am not only witty in myself but the cause that wit is in other men but in this play the wit in himself is conspicuous chiefly by its absence the wit in other men of which he is the cause becomes only the more striking for it is to say the least very peculiar that in his three most admirable scenes the scene of his arrest for debt the tavern scene with quickly and tear sheet and pistol and the recruiting scene in gloucestershire the only scenes in the play which are bathed in the true falstaff in quality falstaff himself has little or nothing to say in the first it is mistress quickly in the second mistress quickly and pistol in the third justice shallow who set the pace and give the tone sir john's presence is rather felt than manifested the company is fit for him and we know that he is among it and our imagination does the rest partly through the transferred vitality of his companions partly in virtue of the radiant afterglow which persists from the first part and appears at the mention of his name we incline to see him as the same jack falstaff wrapped in the same rich clouds of glory but he is not he has his moments of indubitable inspiration but he is in a decline he is being kept alive as it were only by a transfusion of blood he has become in fact something of a vampire a moloch whose veins can be filled only by the sacrifice of french children of shakespeare's creative imagination 
the disease and the heroic remedy point to a single conclusion shakespeare had begun to tire of falstaff he is no longer interested in him he is indeed interested in anybody rather than him to enable himself to go on writing comic scenes in which falstaff can be kept afloat in which an illusion of falstaff's presence can be plausibly maintained he is either to expand characters that existed in outline only or to invent new ones thus in the tavern scene it is the richly matured mistress quickly first mother of that great succession of comic cockney landladies and charwomen which ends with samuel butler's mrs jupp in the way of all flesh and pistol why oh why is pistol so funny seeing that nine-tenths of his jokes are unintelligible it is these two who carry the thing through and even in gloucestershire it is shallow and silence and the rich procession of mouldies warts feebles and bull-calves who bear sir john's banner high falstaff is no longer the executant but the impresario remember his past triumphs and are content and when he comes forward to the front of the stage to take his benefit with a monologue on the dangers of thin potations we are ready for a moment to swear he is as good a man as ever he was but our heart misgives us we have a premonition that the end is near now i think that from this evidence alone it is clear that for some reason or other shakespeare's heart was not in his work the situation is that he is perfectly ready to create new comic characters he had apparently at this moment an inexhaustible store of them waiting to be born but he is not willing to go on creating falstaff about the whole of the play hangs an air of lassitude except in certain of the comic scenes they are masterly in so far as they are independent of the flat night a particular inhibition in his regard guard was obviously at work so much we could deduce from a mere comparison of the second with the first part of henry the fourth we might even look for the cause of shakespeare's disinclination we might if we have a turn for the imputation of ideal motives suggest that it was because shakespeare realized that falstaff in obedience to history had to be disgraced and rebuffed by prince harry it was not an end which falstaff had deserved it was not an end which could be truly assigned to him for falstaff belongs to an ethereal world in which such tragic issues are discordant shakespeare had to make a creature who had nothing whatever to do with history obey the laws of history he was faced with a problem impossible of solution he knew the impossibility and lost interest that would be in itself a fairly convincing explanation i myself believe it counted for something in the final destiny of falstaff but as a professional writer i should perhaps incline to the simpler and more matter-of-fact alternative shakespeare was probably working against time at this period shakespeare was as hard-worked and hard-worked precisely in the same way as any professional journalist of to-day fortunately for the argument there is other evidence and evidence which is to me quite conclusive the second part of henry the fourth winds up very exceptionally with an epilogue naturally a great deal has been made of this epilogue but not altogether it seems to me in the right way no doubt it is interesting and in some degree important to know by its evidence that sir john falstaff was originally sir john oldcastle and that shakespeare was compelled to change the name owing to protests from the family but there are surely more important things about it this paragraph for instance be it known to you as it is very well i was lately here in the end of a displeasing play to pray your patience for it and to promise you a better i did mean indeed to pay you with this which if like an ill venture it come unluckily home i break and you my gentle creditors lose here i promised you i would be and here i commit my body to your mercies in the first place we have to remember it is the epilogue or the dancer who speaks and not shakespeare and he speaks not on shakespeare's behalf but on that of the company though shakespeare wrote his words for him there is therefore no means of knowing whether the play which fell flat was one of shakespeare's own or not it may have been as you like it which not only has an epilogue that is own brother to this one but also belongs to this period fifteen ninety seven to fifteen ninety nine and does not seem to have been very popular but that is another question the point of importance for our present purposes is that it is clear that the regular audience of shakespeare's company had been displeased and in order to send them content at home the epilogue had been put forward to promise them another play with falstaff in it the first part of henry the fourth had been a roaring success falstaff had taken the town or the playgoing part of it by storm what was the unfortunate company to do faced with a hissing audience but promise it some more fat meat so shakespeare had to put his back into it 
more falstaff and quickly too was in both senses the mot d'ordre perhaps he had a rough outline of the second part in his head at a pinch we might interpret i did mean indeed to pay you with this one as referring to the time when the play was promised and it is perhaps only reasonable to suppose that shakespeare confronted with the success of falstaff realized both as playwright and as shareholder in the company that he would very soon have to produce some more of him he may have grown rather tired of english history and turned to as you like it in order to put off the evil day there is no means of knowing but what we do know is it is not written as large as life all over the epilogue is that in the event more falstaff had to be produced against time be it known to you as it is very well has an unmistakably ominous ring probably there had been calls for the new falstaff every night for the last few weeks a man of genius can undoubtedly do very marvellous things to order and against time well he cannot do in such circumstances as the same thing over again if he has done one thing superlatively he can do another thing superlatively but he cannot do the same thing superlatively simply because he is a creative genius some profound inhibition is at work to prevent him from repeating himself and self-repetition was precisely what was required of shakespeare the audience was not asking for another shakespeare play not even for another comic shakespeare play either of which might have been supplied without danger but it was asking for more falstaff according to sample it was asking the impossible precisely because it asked shakespeare good man of business as he was would doubtless have gone to any length to supply it but he was prevented by something more urgent and essential than his business mind his genius his demon had a word to say several words in fact and they are spelt quickly pistol shallow silence but it hardly got beyond the first syllable of falstaff and at the end he had to promise still more one word more i beseech you we know the gesture hand uplifted to stem the applause and make a silence if you be not too much cloyed with fat meat roars of ironical laughter our humble author will continue the story with sir john in it and make you merry with fair catherine of france wherefore anything i know falstaff shall die of a sweat pause unless already a been killed with your hard opinions more roars of ironical laughter for old castle died a martyr and this is not the man but there is in henry v no sir john his heart is fracted and corroborate before the play begins no doubt his sweet boy's behaviour at the end of henry the fourth part two had dealt it something of a blow but not a very bad one his heart was sufficiently tough to put up with being very well provided for until his conversation should appear more wise and modest to the world of course if we remember that falstaff is a created character and not a human being we must indeed say that this necessity to mend his ways is a death sentence on the night and anticipate pistol in condoling him a reformed falstaff is not falstaff still shakespeare had obviously left the door open for his return and the epilogue leaves no doubt that he was intended to perform some more exploits perhaps at agincourt before his nose became as sharp as a pen yet he was killed for in the meanwhile another burden had been laid upon shakespeare the queen had commanded that the fat knight should be shown in love and she had fixed a day for the exhibition it allowed shakespeare a fortnight for the writing of his play that is the tradition it is one of the oldest shakespeare traditions we possess it is plausible in itself for we need to find some explanation why falstaff should suddenly rush through a couple of centuries to make his appearance in a play of contemporary life and of contemporary life at windsor and when we come to look more closely into the destiny of falstaff as we have been doing we can see that if the tradition did not exist it would have been necessary to invent it for between the finishing of henry the fourth part two and the writing of henry the fifth shakespeare's plans with regard to falstaff changed once more in the epilogue he had been ready to promise more of him in henry the fifth on condition that he was allowed to give him his quietus at the end of the play instead he killed him before the beginning of it so it is obvious that if shakespeare was sick of falstaff by the end of henry the fourth part two he was sick to death of him by the beginning of henry the fifth the bare facts are enough to show that there was some intervening circumstance to intensify shakespeare's weariness with his own creation without the tradition we should have guessed the intervening circumstance was the merry wives with the tradition the explanation is complete 
a falstaff play to be finished in a fortnight and at the royal command authors and actors take royal commands seriously enough even now even in this twentieth century they cause them sleepless nights how much more should shakespeare have been troubled in the sixteenth century when royalty was a good deal more royal than it is now shakespeare who had something of a weakness for the blue blood the marvel is that he should have done his work so well for in spite of the superior attitude towards the farce of the merry wives which is traditional in english criticism it is a most excellent play it has to be regarded in and for itself as the separate object that it is it is no good objecting to it that it is a play of a different kind from the other falstaff plays no man not even the most consummate genius can command at will the spirit that irradiates the first part of henry the fourth shakespeare had a peculiar problem to solve to construct an amusing play a play to amuse a particular person whose taste and laughter was not of the highest in a record time he went about it in the way a playwright faced with the same problem would go about it to-day he looked for a strong and sturdy farce plot on which to build so that if his invention failed as it most likely would fail under pressure the strength of the mere situation would carry him through he wanted a plot on whose scaffolding he could depend now it was no use to trust to his imagination to invent incomparable speeches for falstaff they might never come such things were not to be squeezed out even of shakespeare's head whether shakespeare himself invented the plot of the merry wives we cannot say but we can say knowing his own habit elsewhere and knowing what a playwright in like situation would do to-day that it is improbable the modern writer would try to get a plot from somewhere skim through the latest french farces ask his friends if they knew of anything hunt up the comedies that held the stage years ago not otherwise do we imagine shakespeare and when his latest cambridge editors with remarkable detective skill extract from the merry wives itself fairly convincing evidence that it is a remodelling of a comedy of intrigue set in the contemporary life of elizabethan london we are not surprised it is what we should have expected what well, we could not have expected however high we place shakespeare's genius is that under such circumstances he should have brought off the miracle the merry wives is farce farce of what they call nowadays the slapstick kind but the play is sweet as a good apple the unsavoury smell of the dirty linen in the buck basket is quite blown away by the country air which pours in from every side we feel that the stage does not run off at the wings to pasteboard scenery but to country lanes and hedgerows it backs not on to a curtain but on the rushy margin of the thames the play is redolent of early summer the air is full of may or june and if falstaff is no longer the pure ethereal essence of comedy that he has been but a rather disreputable adventurer on his beam ends in a country town well we cannot have everything in a fortnight and even in this fortnight of slavery slavery is certainly a mild word for the conditions necessary for the achievement shakespeare's pure creativeness would out his demon would not be denied not only is there the incomparable masterpiece of nonentity slender who one guesses belonged to rather too rarefied an order of creation to appeal to his royal audience the true and only original of the man who could not say boo to a goose would hardly have struck elizabeth as funny at all but there is a really comic welshman he may be crude but he is comic and he plainly went down not only was he the chief attraction after falstaff himself on the title page of the pirated quarto under the mistaken style and title of sir hugh at the welsh knight but he was obviously the precursor of Llewellyn in henry v in the manner of sir hugh's reception shakespeare saw an opening to cover his deliberate murder of sir john on that he was determined he could take no more risk of command performances whether at the summons of the queen or of the london groundlings falstaff had to die without delay even though his newly acquired trick of moving on a time machine through the centuries might make the coup de grace more difficult to give but shakespeare was resolute falstaff was never suffered to be seen or even his rich voice to be heard on the stage of henry v we can say beyond any reasonable doubt that no other sh of shakespeare's created characters led his creator such a life as sir john falstaff shakespeare himself was probably the only human being who was cloyed with too much fat meat and perhaps it would not be merely fanciful to say that half shakespeare's other comic characters represent the attempts of his genius to escape from the incubus it had conjured out of nothingness 
this in rough outline is the story of falstaff's creation as i find it written in the plays themselves first a magnificent play with a comic character who takes the town by storm remember that the evidence is that falstaff was by far the most popular character of shakespeare's in his own day then at the end of the run the company produces a play which falls flat the manager goes to shakespeare while the audience is still booing and hissing there is a hurried colloquy behind the scenes shakespeare who is a shareholder as well as a playwright agrees and the angry audience is sent away contented by the promise of another play with sir john in it then the second part is written against time with the immediate success that was inevitable the audience by this time was in the condition of a modern audience at the beginning of a film by charlie chaplin the fat knight had only to appear for the house to rock with laughter and shakespeare foreseeing a life of slavery if he does not take action declares in the epilogue that the next play will be the last in which falstaff will appear but he is not quick enough the news of the latest falstaff success has reached the queen she probably has the second part played at court before her and at the end commands that sir john be shown in love when is my first free evening she asks the lord high something or other who keeps the royal engagement book monday fortnight your majesty very well on monday fortnight if it had been monday week no doubt shakespeare would have had to deliver the goods he did his work though he produced not falstaff but another person of the same name and appearance but that was the last straw instead of keeping his promise to the london audience that his new play should also have sir john in it the first mention of him is the news that he is on his death bed already it may be said that all this is theory in one sense it is but in that sense all criticism is theory my little story is a deduction from the facts i believe it satisfies and accounts for the facts only i would remind you again that the facts in such an inquiry as this and in all literary criticism worthy of the name are not the measurable and quantitative facts of science but more volatile and tangible reactions intuitions and impressions but in their kind the facts with which i have dealt are admitted that the false staff of the second part is inferior to the false staff of the first and that the play itself is an inferior play that the merry wives is of a quite different order from the other falstaff plays these judgments are the commonplaces of shakespeare's criticism but the conclusion drawn from these judgments when the conclusions are drawn from them are very different from mine there are traditional conclusions as there are traditional judgments i feel i should be dealing unfairly if i did not examine them it is generally said that the degeneration of falstaff in the second part is due to a deliberate dramatic intention on shakespeare's part falstaff had to be shown in his true colours in order that the fate which awaited him at prince harry's hands should be seen to be deserved so falstaff is represented as in a progressive moral decline it is an argument which seems at first sight almost plausible then we begin to look at the facts if we start out by considering shakespeare wholly superhuman a demigod who could by nature make no mistakes never feel tired never get bored where well, we shall never be able to see the facts we shall never be able to even to smell them through the odour of sanctity but if we keep our eyes clear we shall i think admit quite freely that the second part of henry the fourth as compared with the first is a very poor play the comic scenes have no particular relation to the main dramatic action and the main dramatic action can be given that name only by an effort of charity the play in fact is slung together rather than designed the chances that shakespeare was following a deliberate plan in exhibiting falstaff in a moral decline are exceedingly poor to begin with but the real question is whether falstaff is in a moral decline very likely it is true that we the readers and the audience are more conscious of his dubious morality in the second part and in the merry wives but that is precisely what would happen if, if shakespeare's creative power were weakening and he were failing to maintain his comic hero in the imaginative world in which alone he could truly live for in fact neither in the second part nor in the merry wives are falstaff's acts and sentiments by the smallest degree by one single fraction of a commandment less moral than they are in the first part how could they be we have only to listen to the description with which he was ushered into the world to read the label tied round his neck when he was dropped from the creative heaven on to the boards of the blackfriars theatre to know that moral degeneration is strictly inconceivable for sir john thou art so fat-witted with drinking of old sack and unbuttoning thee after supper and sleeping on benches after noon that thou hast forgotten to demand that truly which thou wouldst truly know what a devil hast thou to do with the time of the day 
unless ours were cups of sack and minutes capons and clocks the tongues of bawds and dolls the signs of leaping houses and the blessed sun himself a fair hot wench in flame-coloured taffeta i see no reason why thou shouldst be so superfluous as to demand the time of the day and falstaff does not deny it it would be preposterous if he did even though he is notoriously reluctant to admit any imperfection in himself he is forced to confess that his character is suffered by his keeping company with prince harry thou hast done much harm upon me hal god forgive thee for it before i knew thee hal i knew nothing and now am i if a man should speak truly little better than one of the wicked i must give over this life and i will give it over by the lord and i do not i am a villain i be damned for never a king's son in christendom falstaff was intelligent enough for a hundred but it would have passed even his wit to find the way to degenerate from the moral altitudes on which he is first presented to us the fact is that a truly comic character cannot degenerate morally for he moves completely outside the kingdom of moral law he can decline creatively and quite frequently a creative decline is accompanied by a moral advance gogol's chichikov is a good case in point and altogether as charles lamb quite properly argued the application of the moral judgment to comic heroes is merely a way of blinding ourselves to their real significance so we are on our guard against the arguments of those who would interpret the fact that we begin to be conscious of falstaff's moral weakness as meaning that he is less moral than he was it means simply that shakespeare is failing to create him a recent critic in his desire to show that what shakespeare did to falstaff was deliberately done has gone so far as to try to whitewash the falstaff of the first part the falstaff of part one he says is a humorous pure and simple against whom little that is really reprehensible can be urged he takes part it is true in a highway robbery but such an offence committed by high-spirited youths was venial in the eyes of shakespeare's contemporaries at least otherwise there is little evidence on which to impeach falstaff except such as he himself furnishes against himself and that evidence may generally be allowed to pass as the product of a fertile imagination and humorous invention in the second part on the contrary the character of falstaff is presented unsympathetically and in a uniformly unfavourable light the explanation of the phenomenon as i have tried to show is simple the only light which falls on falstaff is the light of shakespeare's creativeness when it begins to fail and flicker we begin to be aware of him as a rather disreputable adventurer he always was that if we chose to regard him as a real man but shakespeare neither intended nor allowed us so to regard him but the details themselves do not for one moment bear out this theory of moral degeneration as a matter of fact if we consider them realistically and imagine falstaff brought up before a police magistrate it is clear that falstaff's crimes are less serious in the second part than they are in the first if in the first they are venial then they are less than venial in the second he equally misused the king's press in both plays to get yet another ten pounds out of mistress quickly was that a crime when the lady herself condoned it to borrow a thousand pounds of justice shallow of which the lender would never see even five hundred back again if sir john had nothing worse than this on his conscience mistress quickly was right in saying nay sure he is in arthur's bosom and so far from being presented in a uniformly unfavourable light he is represented as having gained and somehow as having deserved the loyalty both of doll tearsheet and mistress quickly you may if you choose regard mistress quickly's parting words merely as the evidence that she after the reputed habit of her sex insists on being gulled well fare thee well i have known thee these twenty-nine years come peace god time but an honester truer hearted man well fare thee well but the effect of them on most well-ordered sensibilities is quite simple mistress quickly means what she says and falstaff not for what he does but for what he is deserves that it should be said of him and up till now no one who was not engaged in making a case has ever thought bardolph a fool for wanting to be with him wherever he was or mistress quickly a dupe for being certain he was not in hell no it would be truer to say not merely that shakespeare was not engaged in part two in presenting falstaff in a uniformly unfavourable light but that he was trying at moments to make amends for the creative injustice he knew he was doing to the creature of his imagination 
the injustices were two first falstaff had to be produced again when shakespeare was not in the mood for him second and more important shakespeare had involved him in the catastrophe that was inevitable a being who belonged to the ether of pure comedy had to be brought back into the world of fact and history he was bound to languish and die what conceivable action of king harry's could have mitigated his fate the only thing that could have been done was that shakespeare should translate the history of england into the same creative world as he had done in part one sooner or later in such an enterprise the facts become adamant harry the warrior king was a fact not to be trifled with any more than lord roberts or lord kitchener could be trifled with by a popular playwright nowadays the audience knew quite well what he ought to be and eventually shakespeare had to vamp up a very moderate play with some patches of dazzling rhetoric to provide them with what they wanted but we imagine him with a consciousness of guilt towards the creature he had been forced to betray the falstaff whom the king of england was bound to repudiate was not the falstaff whom shakespeare had created one was a common ne'er-do-well the other was an incarnation of the very spirit of comedy shakespeare had to pretend that they were the same person he had to drag his hero down to an earth where he was never meant to live and inflict upon him a disgrace which he could not possibly have deserved no one can doubt that falstaff at his birth was beloved of his begetter since his penultimate sufferings were not to be avoided shakespeare who was tired of the labours he had been forced to undergo for falstaff's sake would pull himself together and try to ensure that the creature of his brain should make a good end once more shakespeare achieved the miracle nothing falstaff ever said is more magical than the talk of mistress quickly and bardolf and the page about his death nothing is more truly his than these words he did not speak by which he is uplifted once more into that ethereal kingdom from which his creator had been forced to force him to descend in order that the king should kill his heart bardolf would i were with him wheresoe'er he is either in heaven or in hell host nay sure he's not in hell he's in arthur's bosom it made a finer end and went away an it had been any christum child i parted even just between twelve and one even at the turning of the tide for after i saw him fumble with the sheets and play with flowers and smile upon his fingers ends i knew there was but one way for his nose was as sharp as a pen and a babble of green fields how now sir john quoth i what man be of good cheer so he cried out god 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 three or four times now i to comfort him bid him i should not think of god i hope there was no need to trouble himself with any such thoughts yet so he bade me lay more clothes on his feet i put my hand into the bed and felt them and they were as cold as any stone then i fell to his knees and so upward and upward and all was as cold as any stone End of section 11section twelve of discoveries essays and literary criticism by john middleton murray this librivox recording is in the public domain coriolanus criticism is oddly undecided about coriolanus it is because coriolanus is the most neglected of shakespeare's greater plays or is the play neglected because of the indecision it provokes the divergence of opinion about it is extraordinary mr lytton strachey for instance has lately declared that rhetoric enormously magnificent and extraordinarily elaborate is the beginning and the middle and the end of coriolanus the hero is not a human being at all mr bernard shaw on the other hand puts coriolanus with falconbridge as admirable descriptions of instinctive temperaments and says with intelligible paradox that the play of coriolanus is the greatest of shakespeare's comedies mr t s eliot lately maintained that coriolanus is shakespeare's most perfect work of art divergence of this kind does not in the least resemble the recent controversy as to whether hamlet is an aesthetic success or an aesthetic failure all the world and not least those particular disputants is agreed that hamlet is a mighty work its precise degree of perfection alone is in debate its greatness is admitted quite otherwise 
with coriolanus nobody seems quite certain if it is a great play or not and it is so seldom performed that there is no consensus of popular opinion as to its dramatic merits the reason why it is so seldom performed is that the theme is unsympathetic to the ordinary man who cannot accept as a tragic hero one whose ungovernable pride forces him to become a renegade it is to this instinctive sentiment that mr shaw gives paradoxical expression when he says that coriolanus is the greatest of shakespeare's comedies coriolanus is human enough but he is so human that we are angry with him for not behaving more sensibly we do not feel that his conduct is inevitable like othello's we prefer to say that it is lifelike by one burst of temper he exiles himself from rome by a second he kills himself nothing is changed in him as he was at the beginning of the play so he is at the end whereas a tragic hero deserves to die coriolanus does not a hero of great shakespearean tragedy deserves to die because we cannot conceive him continuing to live but the death of coriolanus is a shock to us we are not surprised that shakespeare scamped it and by making aufidius repented on the instant turned it into an accident to put the matter irreverently coriolanus is a big schoolboy moliere might have disposed of him better than shakespeare still not even moliere could have made him live as shakespeare has to say as mr strachey says that he is not a human being at all is indeed astonishing he is of course a human being of a quite different kind from the heroes of the great tragedies but he is more of a human being than they compared with antony it is true he is almost thin-blooded but who is not thin and unsubstantial compared to that king of men in his own play in his own setting coriolanus is absolutely convincing he is not so complete a man as antony he inhabits a sphere of more primitive development but within that sphere he is fixed as solid as a rock coriolanus is shakespeare's homeric hero and it is largely because of the completeness with which he is presented that his tragic end becomes perfunctory that such a man should meet with a violent end is too natural to be inevitable his death is a physical rather than a spiritual consummation to give it a spiritual significance shakespeare needed to employ another iago to arrange the toils into which the instinctive man must fall but there was no iago in the story it is true he might have made aufidius into one at the beginning indeed he seems to have intended to aufidius's speech at the end of the first act mine emulation hath not that honour int it had for where i thought to crush him in an equal force true sword to sword i'll potch at him some way or wrath or craft may get him begins to put an iago before us but shakespeare could not hold him to his task aufidius also at the critical moment becomes the instinctive homeric hero when coriolanus appeals to him at antium he reveals himself as coriolanus's blood brother incapable of treasons stratagems or spoils and there he is so fully presented that the faint-hearted indications of his subsequent designs have no power to change the figure before us we feel that he acts in a rage of sudden jealousy in a burst of temper like coriolanus himself my rage is gone he says and i am struck with sorrow that is true of the aufidius shakespeare has actually given us it is not true of the aufidius he began by giving us aufidius iago might have made coriolanus's death inevitable the aufidius we have makes it an accident aufidius is the weak point of the play dramatically his function was to play in the second part of the drama the role held by sicinius and brutus the tribunes in the first but to play it with more steadiness of hatred even than they because aufidius has to compass coriolanus's death while the tribunes need only his exile 
but whereas the tribunes play their part to the life and we know and follow and comprehend their every move in entangling coriolanus in his own weakness aufidius is as impulsive as coriolanus himself and as evidently incapable of plotting as he instead of being plainer to us than sicinius and brutus he becomes ten times more shadowy but coriolanus is magnificent in so far as he is the play the play is magnificent also he is plato's man of impulse to the life when his wounds are mentioned we see the schoolboy blush with more of vanity than true modesty in it come to his face he cannot remember the name of the man of corioli for whose freedom he begs martius his name asks lardius by jupiter forgot i am weary yea my memory is tired have we no wine here was the physical man ever more swiftly presented coriolanus knows nothing of himself his consciousness his memory his purpose these are all in the keeping of his mother volumnia or menenius his mind is sharp and his eye clear only on the battlefield when he turns away from it he is bewildered and lost in a strange country he cannot notice things or people he barely recognizes the wife whom he loves the idea that he should behave in the city with the same circumspection with which he orders a battle or takes in a town is quite incomprehensible to him when his mother suggests it he cannot understand it is volumnia not he who has the consulship in mind when he returns victorious for plans beyond the battlefield his mind is in abeyance he does what he is told like a reluctant child and after the fatal outburst of his anger against the citizens he is hopeless and pathetic he feels his mother has deserted him i muse my mother does not approve me further who was wont to call them woollen vassals and he returns after much persuasion to make amends like a child repeating the key word of his conduct in case he should forget it the word is mildly past and future have no existence for him he remembers only what he feels the burning glow of an insult that has not been revenged and not till he sees his mother and his wife before him has he an inkling that he is committing an act of shame in threatening his own city rome with fire and sword till that moment rome is no more than the source of his insult at the last with one of those amazing strokes of whose sheer simplicity lesser writers are ever afraid shakespeare makes him turn on aufidius aufidius name not the god thou boy of tears coriolanus ha aufidius no more coriolanus measureless liar thou hast made my heart too great for what contains it boy o oh slave pardon me lords tis the first time that ever i was forced to scold the first time it is hopeless coriolanus is lost in life seeing how marvellously coriolanus is put before us it is hard to understand the difficulty which has been felt by many critics concerning coriolanus's conduct in advancing against his native city it is apparently felt that his renegade acts need more explanation than shakespeare has given and mr case the editor of the arden text quotes in his excellent introduction mr a c bradley's words as i have remarked shakespeare does not exhibit to us the change of mind which issues in this frightful purpose but from what we see and hear we can tell how he imagined it and the key lies in that idea of burning rome as time passes and no suggestion of recall reaches coriolanus and he learns what it is to be a solitary homeless exile his heart hardens his pride swells to a mountainous bulk and the wound in it becomes a fire the fellow patricians from whom he parted lovingly now appear to him ingrates and dastards scarcely better than the loathsome mob somehow he knows not how even his mother and wife have deserted him he has become nothing to rome and rome shall hear nothing from him here in solitude he can find no relief in a storm of words but gradually the blind intolerable chaos of resentment conceives and gives birth to a vision not merely of battle and indiscriminate slaughter but of the whole city one tower of flame to see that with his bodily eye would satisfy his soul and the way to the sight is through the volscians this is shakespeare's idea not plutarch's in plutarch there is not a syllable about the burning of rome 
yet with all deference to so great an authority we cannot help feeling that this is mr bradley's idea not shakespeare's certainly there is a good deal of talk about the burning of rome the tribunes and menenius take it for granted cominius reports that coriolanus's eye is red as he would burn rome but our impression is not that it is particularly insisted on it recurs merely and we also like the tribunes and menenius take it for granted coriolanus intends revenge mr bradley is trying to circumvent the difficulty of coriolanus's monstrous purpose he does not leave rome vowing revenge he seems to agree with cominius that he may be recalled i shall be loved he says when i am lacked yet when he reappears he reappears as the renegade whose fixed purpose is the destruction of rome all this is true but what of it shakespeare's coriolanus sees neither before nor after he is ignorant of his own nature as a savage how should the man who cried at the last moment of his life tis the first time that i was ever forced to scold know the hidden workings of his own heart his purposes loom on him only when they are being accomplished and surely shakespeare has taken care that we shall understand him without our being compelled to invent processes of mind for him surely the vital words are the last which coriolanus speaks to his mother wife and friends when he leaves the gates of rome while i remain above the ground you shall hear from me still and never of me aught but what is like me formerly is not that tragic irony of the highest kind the monstrous thing that coriolanus is to do is like him formerly he who knows nothing of himself may mean it as menenius understood it that's worthily but we who have watched his blind angry blundering bring to naught the considered purposes his friends have fixed upon him know that the former self like which he will remain is a thing of impulse only of pride and anger and resentment and courage the tribunes provoked him and he tried to kill them rome has provoked him and he will try to kill it we know he does not and he is far more surprised than we are to find himself entering antium his brief soliloquy is only one in the play gives us the exact measure and quality of his surprise o world thy slippery turns it seems to him odd and strange that he should be seeking out aufidius so fellest foes whose passions and whose plots have broke their sleep to take the one the other by some chance some trick not worth an egg shall grow dear friends and interjoin their issues the incredible change in his actions is to him just the result of some trick not worth an egg he cannot understand it he can see no more of himself than his actions and when confronted with aufidius he finds that his action needs some explanation he instinctively reshapes the immediate past to his purpose the friends who have tried to protect him and to prevent his suicide who have offered to share his exile suddenly become the dastard nobles who have all forsook me true that is in plutarch but what shakespeare has done is what plutarch never could do to put before us the living man whose thought and words were ever the servants of his impulses alone shakespeare has omitted all that plutarch says about coriolanus's calculations and plans whereupon he thought it his best way first to stir up the volscans against them the romans knowing they were yet able enough in strength and riches to encounter them notwithstanding their former losses they had received not long before and that their power was not so much impaired as their malice and desire was increased to be revenged of the romans shakespeare takes all such calculation away from coriolanus instinct sends him to aufidius in that he is like himself formerly like himself formerly he suddenly yields to his mother and wife like himself formerly he dies coriolanus is the drama and since he has perfectly presented the drama is all but perfect but the weakness of aufidius remains and we cannot help speculating how shakespeare came to fumble with him perhaps we may suggest the cause in plutarch's story aufidius appears on the scene only after coriolanus has been exiled we imagine that when shakespeare first read through the story in north and shaped it as a drama in his mind he had a clear conception of the part aufidius was to play as the man of hate and conspiracy 
when he came to write the play with his eyes fixed even more closely upon north's book than they had been during the writing of antony and cleopatra a year before he followed his own conception of Ophidius during the first act there was nothing in north to change it Ophidius simply did not appear but when he reached coriolanus's exile and Ophidius made his entry into north he found a different Ophidius from the one he had conceived instead of a man poisoned by jealousy he found a chivalrous enemy a man of great mind plutarch's Ophidius is said indeed to hate coriolanus but it is the hate of one enemy for another and there is something sportsmanlike schoolboyish even in their rivalry many times in battles where they met they were ever at the encounter one against another like lusty courageous youths striving in all emulation of honour to this suggestion shakespeare unconsciously succumbed at a moment when he was following north's language more closely than ever he forgot the Ophidius he had presented two long acts ago the Ophidius who had declared his nature thus my valour's poisoned with only suffering stained by him where i find him were it at home upon my brother's guard even there against the hospitable cannon would i wash my fierce hand in his heart instead of this Ophidius now becomes coriolanus's impulsive counterpart shakespeare gives him a magnificent speech know thou first i love the maid i married never man sighed truer breath but that i see thee here thou noble thing more dances my rapt heart than when i first my wedded mistress saw bestride my threshold there is no hint of Ophidius's wonderful words in north but shakespeare could not resist north's suggestion of the emulation of honour the noble rivalry still exists and yet when he first presented Ophidius, he had used that very phrase to show that Ophidius's nobility was a thing of the past mine emulation hath not that honour in it it had but the temptation was too great back comes all the honour to Ophidius's emulation we are given a moving and magnificent scene but the two Ophidiuses can never now be reconciled the poisoned plotter has to carry on the action of the play to its tragic end but it is the generous opponent who lives in our minds the man who could no more have suborned assassins to murder coriolanus than he could have resisted coriolanus's swift appeal pray you stand to me in this cause all through the fifth act we feel that shakespeare does not know what to do with Ophidius, and in the final scene the conflict of the two characters who bear one name is manifest and unresolved Ophidius has deliberately plotted coriolanus's murder and played even more cold-bloodedly than the tribunes upon his temper to sting him to an outburst suddenly he changes parts again he becomes the the chivalrous enemy my rage is gone and i am struck with sorrow to some perhaps this attempted analysis of the actual working of shakespeare's mind in the construction of coriolanus from the material of north's story may appear fanciful but i believe it gives a coherent psychological explanation of the radical duality in the conception of Ophidius, which has been noticed by many critics before me as mr case puts it on the whole Ophidius can be understood as well as despised but the delineation of the character does not satisfy and leaves the impression of an unpleasing task accomplished with as little trouble as possible it is in contrast with the careful presentation of the tribunes but it is impossible to leave it at that at one moment at least shakespeare spent all the force of his poetic genius on putting an heroic Ophidius before us in his speech to coriolanus and shakespeare was not in the habit of shrinking from unpleasant tasks in mr case's sense of unpleasant anyhow he did not flinch from iago when we remember that two acts and a half intervened between the first presentation of Ophidius's character and his reappearance that at the time of his reappearance shakespeare was working with his eyes glued to the book and that the phrase emulation of honour had been as it were a key word that stuck in his brain from his first reading of north then we believe it becomes clear that under the immediate influence of north shakespeare reverted to a conception of Ophidius which had really been dismissed to the past by Ophidius's speech in act one scene ten and which was inconsistent with his original idea of the dramatic action of the play 
then perhaps we may value aufidius's speech in act four scene five as something more than the most splendid piece of poetry in a play full of splendid poetry as a precise indication of when and how and for what cause shakespeare's human instincts triumphed over his artistic purposes of the other characters there is little that is new to be said but there is a correspondence in the play which seems to have escaped attention though it reveals the subtlety of shakespeare's characterization at the very beginning of the first scene he suggests the strange relation between coriolanus and his mother those soft-conscienced men says the first citizen can be content to say it was for his country he did it to please his mother and to be partly proud we call this nowadays the oedipus complex but what is amazing is the way shakespeare conveys that coriolanus and volumnia together are one being volumnia the mind and purpose coriolanus the body and strength hence the peculiar subtlety of his creation of virgilia there is really no place for her if she is to be given at all she must be given in a hundred words shakespeare does it with an instinctive gesture but virgilia is a being apart the real and binding unity is between mother and son and at the same moment shakespeare makes them use the same phrase when coriolanus has been banished volumnia in a frenzy of rage waylays the tribunes and cries i would my son were in arabia and thy tribe before him his good sword in his hand when coriolanus is at bay in antium in the final scene he also cries oh that i had him with six aufidiuses and more his tribe to use my lawful sword whether the repetition was deliberate calculated art who can tell it does not matter for if it was not calculated it is only one more proof of shakespeare's astonishing instinctive realization of a blood bond of temper finally there are one or two points of textual interpretation upon which suggestions may be welcome in act one scene four line forty the folio text runs thus come on if you'll stand fast we'll beat them to their wives as they us to our trenches follows another alarum and martius follows them to gates and is shut in it is important to note that this stage direction is altered in the modern editions where it appears as another alarm the fight is renewed the volskas retire into coracles and martius follows them to the gates whether the new direction is better is of no moment the point is that it is different the real question at issue is whether shakespeare wrote as they us to our trenches follows the rhythm is appalling in itself and doubly appalling as the conclusion to a soldier's desperate appeal in battle nor is it improved save in a purely mechanical sense by reading follow ed the dramatic force is frittered away by the rhythmical debility the same incident is referred to a little further on by a messenger i saw our party to their trenches driven and by cominius where is that slave which told me they had beat you to your trenches nothing so weak as follows there is it conceivable that shakespeare should have made the prime actor in the heat of battle use the flabby word at all events no one will deny that come on if you'll stand fast we'll beat them to their wives as they us to our trenches is better poetry better shakespeare and better drama have we the right to improve the folio if we take the folio stage direction we find the suspect word in it if we count spaces as letters the distance from as to follows in the text is twenty-seven letters while the distance from another to follows in the stage direction is also twenty-seven letters surely the conclusion is that in the copy from which the play was set up followers came immediately after trenches but in the line below the change of the stage direction has concealed the process of the corruption when cominius is celebrating coriolanus's exploits in the senate he makes this stirring speech his sword death's stamp where it didn't mark it took from face to foot he was a thing of blood whose every motion was timed with dying cries alone he entered the mortal gate of the city which he painted with shunless destiny aidless came off and with a sudden reinforcement struck coriolais like a planet that is at least what the folio makes him say but tyrwhit conjectured that the first two lines should read his sword death's stamp where it did mark it took from face to foot he was a thing of blood since then all the editors have followed tyrwhit 
it may seem that a change in punctuation is trivial but here the whole meaning of the passage is changed by it and changed for the worse for the crucial passage to elucidate this elaborate metaphor is hamlet one 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 sixty two the nights are wholesome then no planets strike no fairy takes takes is in its good elizabethan sense of infects struck coriolis like a planet shows that the metaphor is continued to the end coriolanus's sword infects from face to foot he is a thing of blood not in the sense that he was covered with blood but like the avenging angel the shunless destiny with which he paints the mortal gate of the city is a reminiscence of the plague mark on the door of an infected house and finally he struck coriolis like a planet because planet stricken was the name for sudden death to which the doctors could assign no cause the metaphor is splendidly sustained and it is simply because turwit did not recognize that takes bore the still familiar sense of vaccination taking that he altered the punctuation of the passage and made it difficult for us to understand it with less conviction we offer a suggestion for the famous crux fortune's blows when most struck home being gentle wounded craves a noble cunning dr johnson explained it ingeniously the sense is when fortune strikes her hardest blows to be wounded and yet continue calm requires a generous policy apart from the intolerably awkward syntax the use of gentle is unparalleled and after the straightforward lines that precede the sudden tangle brings us up with an unpleasant jar when shakespeare overrides syntax he usually makes his sense quite clear moreover coriolanus is quoting his mother's proverbs the three before have the simplicity of proverbs this one is a riddle we cannot believe that shakespeare wrote the lines as they stand the natural sense in the context is fortune's blows when most struck home being crave a noble cunning the three words beginning with being represent a phrase in opposition to and explanatory of fortune's blows when most struck home we suggest diffidently that behind the meaningless gentle is conceived the adjective tentals tentless that is impossible to probe and that the line originally read when most struck home being tentless wounds do crave a noble cunning they are wounds beyond the skill of the ordinary surgeon shakespeare in this martial play was particularly fond of using the word to tent metaphorically see one nine thirty one and in particular three one two thirty five tis a sore upon us you cannot tent yourself of minor importance texturally but of some significance for the psychology of coriolanus are two changes from the folio made by all the editors in three one ninety one coriolanus breaks out at sicinius's word shall remain coriolanus shall remain hear you this triton of the minnows mark you his absolute shall Cominius, twas from the canon coriolanus shall o oh god but most unwise patricians why you grave but reckless senators theobald's change of o oh god to o oh good but most unwise has been universally followed the original sounds to me much more like coriolanus further in two two seventy four coriolanus says to brutus the tribune you soothed not therefore hurt not but your people i love them as they weigh menenius pray now sit down for some inscrutable reason the dash of the folio has been replaced by a full stop dashes to mark interruption are not so plentiful in the folio that we can afford to throw them away menenius as ever tries to stop coriolanus from his furious outburst we could supply coriolanus's unspoken words from this very play probably they were that's lesser than a little End of section twelve Section 13 of Discoveries, Essays in Literary Criticism by John Middleton Murray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Flaubert and Flaubert Romanticism is always with us, and probably it always has been. For if Romanticism is a significant phenomenon, as we feel instinctively it is, then the continual failure to define it 
suggests that it is an aboriginal appetite of the human soul as primary and as elusive as love or consciousness or the soul itself instead of being angry with jean jacques rousseau perhaps we ought to be grateful to him for anticipating the work of the psychoanalysts and bringing the complex to the surface of the european consciousness fragments of it had no doubt emerged before calvin and port royal by dividing the church on the extreme issue of original sin had proved at least that a complete anti-romanticism was intolerable to the great majority of professing christians for romanticism when defined in terms of christian psychology is anything short of an unwavering belief in original sin nevertheless although rousseau himself proclaimed the gospel of romanticism chiefly in terms of christian thought the appetite is too deep and too ancient to be thus confined romanticism must certainly have existed before christianity took hold of the civilized world just as it has continued to exist when that hold has loosened and if we look as we must for a formula which will comprehend all its forms we must give up hope of finding one so neat as that which christian theology offers the merit and perhaps the raison d'etre of a closed system is that it permits of compact definition but systems of religion and philosophy are only the formal and fashionable garments which the untidy reality of the human soul puts on for a season if it manages to wear one longer and the seasons become centuries we find if we look that it is simply because so many patches and pockets have been added that little of the original design remains except the name the soul insists upon being comfortable it may be that the very unheroic statement contains the largest quantity of truth the soul is elastic bind it up tight it will work loose somehow set it completely free it will hurry into a convenient shell it can live neither with nor without bonds without strictly obligations if this prosaic movement covers all manifestations of spiritual energy then we can say that romanticism is the working loose from obligations that are felt to be hampering and every romanticism will be not only a reaction from an old formalism but the parent of a new one for if romanticism is the feeling that we are better than our circumstances it soon appears that the weightiest of these circumstances are fellow-men who quickly catch the same feeling romanticism must end either in suicide or organization organization is naturally the more popular so that according as you are an optimist or a pessimist you will describe the progress of humanity either as the taking off or as the putting on of one straight waistcoat after another the mere realist will be content to note that the curious process seems to have accelerated vastly so swift indeed does it appear to have been that we can almost discern an identity between the act of breaking out of one waistcoat and that of putting on another very very few years elapsed between the proclamation of liberty and its organization into nationalism and the industrial system at the beginning of the nineteenth century and we are not surprised that the most modern political romantics simply promise us in so many words a perfect orgy of organization but the paths of political and artistic romanticism are separate they may use the same battle cry but they mean very different things by it when the artist proclaims that man is better than his circumstances he means by man himself he is the type of humanity when the democrat proclaims it he means by man all men both propositions are doubtful what is interesting is that one proves to be in almost diametrical opposition to the other if the artistic romantic believes that he is superior to his circumstances he also believes in himself as an exceptional being the faith that all men are exceptional beings is impossible to him there would be no background for his own performance in order to be lawless one needs laws 
the ordinary alone can make the extraordinary possible but the political romantic proclaims that all men are extraordinary and proceeds to legislate for them as though they were all the same in itself somewhat irrational this method is peculiarly irritating to the artistic romantic who believes that he anyhow is something out of the common hence the conflict that is for ever silently raging between democracy and art we say art simply instead of romantic art because the growth of democracy has driven all art to romanticism a society which is based on the principle that all men are spiritually superior abolishes spiritual superiority altogether because a superiority which all men share is not a superiority at all against such a society the artist is inevitably in more or less open rebellion these circumstances are the worst possible for him no wonder that he believes himself superior to them whether democracy killed the christian religion or the death of the christian religion opened the way for democracy need not be settled now probably it was the latter the important thing is to see what a marvellous safety valve for natural romanticism christianity offered it assured the ordinary man that he was indeed as he believed superior to his circumstances and that at the same time it was a wicked and foolish waste of time for him to attempt to change his circumstances not here not now it said and promised him a crown of glory in the world to come thus superbly and not altogether in contradiction to the intention of its founder it reconciled the necessary inequality of this world with the instinctive desire for equality for many centuries it satisfied the natural romanticism of man nietzsche's indictment of christianity as a slave morality was not very penetrating it was indeed a morality for slaves in that it made the slaves contented with their slavery now that the slaves were deprived of its consolations is anybody the better what is the use of abolishing a slave morality unless you abolish slaves nietzsche made no attempt to do that the very notion would have been abhorrent to him artistic romantic as he was christianity was really an indispensable element in nietzsche's ideal world of heroes but he did not understand that he did not see that if you take away the slave's banjo he will take off his fetters they have to be put on somebody and the chances are heavy that they will be put upon the intelligent men first of all nietzsche himself to start with christianity was in fact the last bulwark of the world against democracy not because christianity is a particularly intelligent religion but because it promises to satisfy all present discontents in the world to come that valuable function of christianity cannot be revived christianity defends the established order no matter what that order is it will defend plutocracy with the same good will as it once defended monarchy or aristocracy simply because it is indifferent to the things that are if the things that are are, are comparatively good things then christianity humanely judged is good if they are bad it is bad what more impregnable defence of the worst plutocracy could be devised than the simple sentence it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of god the poor man's desire for revenge is utterly satisfied now he can watch with pleasure the capitalist adding million to million the federation of employers should see that every tenement in england was gorged with copies of the new testament christianity is indeed a slave morality but nietzsche should have known that slaves must be the poor ye have always with you the slaves are indistinguishable and everlasting civilization depends upon the quality of the masters and who are the masters once the doctrine of equality on this side of the grave has been introduced those whom the slaves naturally respect and whom do the slaves naturally respect those who have the most money for they see that money is a thing that is acquired not by intelligence or bravery or any quality not within their reach they feel instinctively that money is inviolate because it is a distinction they may hope to attain in worshipping money they worship a possible apotheosis of themselves christianity can make plutocracy tolerable the lack of christianity makes it desirable it is the only form of society that the eternal slave can understand 
it is also the one form of society which is utterly uncivilized the slave cannot understand a civilized society which works for ends which are beyond his comprehension if he does comprehend them he is no longer a slave for he sees that men are not equal in gifts and that the end of society is to enable the most highly gifted to live the completest lives and to realize the maximum of humane potentialities the slave who comprehends this or has a glimmering comprehension of it is a being apart in a civilized society he inevitably makes his way upward political romanticism then is the immediate result of the decline of christianity the instinctive belief of man that he is better than his circumstances is no longer satisfied by a promise of superiority in another world it has therefore to be satisfied here and now and the only way that it can be satisfied is by establishing a criterion of superiority which has the assent of the greatest possible number of members of society the test of money political romanticism leads direct to plutocracy what comes after plutocracy so far as we can see is revolution and more plutocracy so in a sense political romanticism ends by giving a justification to artistic romanticism in a plutocracy the feeblest artist has some excuse for regarding himself as superior to his conditions in a manner often exaggerated and sometimes absurd he is vindicating the principle of spiritual superiority and defending the conception of the hero he conceives himself as above the laws because the laws no longer make provision for the principle which he however inadequately represents he cannot acknowledge himself a member of a society which has no place for him and he feels if he cannot define the equivocation which lies behind the invitation that he should take his place in it as a citizen a man is a citizen of a commonwealth only when the commonwealth enables him to realize his own potentialities thus the growth of political romanticism has intensified and continues to intensify artistic romanticism the artist is driven back into the stronghold of his own personality there is of course no essential reason why he should not continue to be objective in his art but objectivity requires from him a much greater effort than was necessary before he no longer feels that his work has a true social function so that the need of an obvious and immediate universality is not present to him for the same reason the spirit of comedy begins to wither because there is no principle inherent in the society in which he lives to which he can refer its aberrations it is all aberration and again the patient representation of reality is irksome because the reality itself is alien to him and if he turns to it he turns to it with impatience and scorn this aggravation of artistic romanticism by the political romanticism which it helped to engender is one of the most striking phenomena of the nineteenth century it explains the curious paradox by which at a time when civilization has degenerated or progressed into a complex arrangement of material conveniences for the purpose of producing wealth the artist has a far greater conviction of his own sacrosanctity than ever before in history the modern artist is positively swollen-headed he is a perpetual hero to himself like baudelaire's dandy he lives and sleeps in front of a mirror and there is a good deal of excuse for him a sense of self-importance is probably necessary to life and if the importance is really illusory the only obvious remedy to exaggerate one's belief in it when nobody believes you are anything the instinctive reply is to believe that you are everything against a society which has a function for the artist only in so far as he is a manufacturer of a profitable merchandise it is scarcely surprising that the artist retorts that his is in fact the supreme function and his position so exalted that it is invisible to the naked eye well some such conception may have its uses in keeping the artist going but illusions are illusions and they are dangerous if it is a good thing that the artist should be kept going it is not a good thing that he should be sent into a blind alley the modern conception of the artist is worse than a blind alley it is a road that leads to perdition what is the modern conception of the artist is is that he is a kind of superman he speaks a language that is naturally and inevitably unintelligible to the general world simply because the thoughts he thinks and the emotions he feels are extraordinary 
he repudiates with disdain all obligations to be comprehensible having an irradicable conviction that there is nobody who can comprehend him he has come to believe that comprehensibility is in itself a sign of weakness and failure what is original he supposes must necessarily be unintelligible originality and obscurity are synonymous for him and since the desire of his heart is to be original he shuns lucidity as he would the plague he finds moreover a profound satisfaction in obscurity for its own sake because it is an evident and unmistakable sign of his superiority to the profane vulgar and he has a deep contempt for those members of his own craft who make some effort to be generally intelligible indeed he is more contemptuous of these than he is of the uneducated mob the reason seems to be that he regards them as traitors to the mystery and craft of art so that to the observant stranger the most obvious mark of the artist is the vehemence and fury of his assertion that other people are not artists the first thing to notice in this characteristic modern creed is that while proclaiming the infinite superiority of the artist it absolves him entirely from the effort in which his superiority consists the artist we give him a small initial to distinguish him from the modern artist superman is indeed by hypothesis an extraordinary person but it is not sufficient for anybody to be an extraordinary person most people are when you come to know them and the extremely extraordinary persons are shut up in prisons and asylums what distinguishes the artist from these other extraordinary persons is his power to communicate his peculiar thoughts and emotions and perceptions to a considerable body of people this considerable body of people is not very large at the best there are relatively few people who are curious enough to desire to see life through other eyes than their own most prefer to read a book or to look at a picture in order to find a corroboration of their own habitual ways of thinking or feeling or even of dreaming but there remains a considerable residue who have tasted the delight of having new thoughts and feelings and perceptions revealed to them and are excited by the promise of happiness which the artist seems to hold out to them these are the people to whom the artist addresses himself he acknowledges a double obligation to himself and to them to himself not to falsify his peculiar thoughts and perceptions to them to make the apprehension of those thoughts and perceptions as certain as possible indeed the obligation is so strong and so profound that his effort is to impose his thoughts and perceptions upon them to make it impossible for them to refuse them only in so far as he succeeds in this task is the extraordinary person an artist at all but the artist is not merely relieved from the effort he has to give a solemn undertaking when he is admitted to the mysterious company of artists not to degrade himself by making it it is clear that such a singular and self-stultifying conception of the artist cannot be very ancient the artists are indeed like people who propose to reform the morals of society by refusing to beget children if they had their way purity would be perfect within a generation for the race would cease to exist if all artists had been artists art would have deceased long ago the second thing to notice about the conception of the artist is that it is a very modern invention much younger than the steam engine only a little older than the telephone and like the telephone we are tempted to add it comes at any rate in its last perfection from america but the origins are european enough it began with rousseau and romanticism as we have seen rousseau did not know what seeds would fall upon the ground he so vigorously overturned nor was the first generation of literary romantics in the least a generation of artists most of them were eager to convert the world byron moved europe chateaubriand moved france stendhal though he made up his mind that he would not be read till eighteen eighty put no difficulties at all in the way of people who wished to read him before that date the struggle over hugo's hernani was comprehensible enough to set all paris by the ears if the first generation of literary romantics was eager to get anywhere out of the world it was also anxious to take the world with it and on the whole it was fairly successful the worst crime that can be urged against it unless we call romanticism itself a crime and condemn the whole nineteenth century and ourselves is that it consecrated the conception of the artist as the genius in the next generation of romantics when the consequences of political romanticism were beginning to be felt a fresh nuance of disdain was added the artist's eye no longer rolled in a fine frenzy his hair was no more shaken out to the wind 
he was an immaculately dressed man of the world with a secret sorrow he buttoned up his coat thrust his hand like napoleon between the buttons and looked fixedly at the wilderness of industrialism before him it was the time of baudelaire's dandyisme the artist was something of a superman he had the superman's impassivity and he enjoyed making the bourgeois shudder but he knew that the bourgeois in order to shudder would have to understand nevertheless we are on the brink of the invention of art it came with flaubert not that flaubert can be made in the least responsible for it he knew no more than rousseau the superstitious uses to which a private curb of his for writing his own ultra romantic pegasus would afterwards be put art was for him still the process by which he disciplined his own peculiar thoughts and perceptions into universal comprehensibility and he made himself very comprehensible indeed knowing that he was a smaller person than men before him like balzac and hugo he made an additional effort at lucidity they could afford to leave something to chance he could not and he did not in this he was perhaps the most faithful artist that ever breathed had he been a bigger one he would not have been able to be so devoted but the mysterious and prodigious labours under which he groaned reached the ears of the general world flaubert wore a straight waistcoat he fed on a diet of quill pens he was an alchemist nobody could ever ever understand the things he did nobody except the artists for the artists had suddenly come into being they were the people who understood flaubert not what flaubert wrote of course for flaubert had left no shred of excuse why an intelligent person should not understand and set his own value on what he wrote they were the people who understood the mysterious process by which flaubert wrote what he had written they knew the measurements of the straight waistcoat and the number of pens he ate for breakfast they knew how it was done they were the hierophants of mumbo-jumbo like gerard de naval's lobster they knew the secret unlike him they said aloud they knew it which was very nice for them seeing that quite a number of respectable people who might otherwise have read flaubert as they read dickens or hardy enjoying what they like and not torturing themselves with what they don't took the flaubardians for that is what we will call them now at their word and being afraid of secrets decided flaubert was too deep for them that was still nicer for the flaubardians the more people they could keep away from the shrine and leave to kneel on the temple steps the greater their own prestige and till with the lapse of years their prestige increased sufficiently for them to issue an edict proclaiming it less majeste for any one to suggest that flaubert was not the greatest writer who ever lived oddly enough this edict was not proclaimed by frenchmen in france but by americans and englishmen in america and england but in this again the flaubardians showed their wisdom it was to their advantage that flaubert to be forever distinguished from gustave flaubert the novelist should have delivered his oracles in a foreign tongue not until flaubert was dead could this cult be fully inaugurated for flaubert being a straightforward man with a perfectly clear vision of his own relative importance had a distressing habit of suspecting those who wanted to turn him into flaubert but once he was safely buried the legend was begun the story of the miracle was spread abroad and the ground near the grotto diligently bought up a thriving trade in literary superstition was created the art of literature was a mystery no one could understand it who had not made his pilgrimage to the shrine real literature was incomprehensible if it was comprehensible it was not real naturally the man who was accustomed to go to literature for a life-giving delight left flaubert severely alone he worshipped from afar and if a spirit bolder than the rest took hold of flaubert's works and declared that they were quite intelligible that some were very fine and others were dull the priests gathered round the shrine shook their heads in pity and said ah you see now what comes of not consulting us he does not understand and he has declared his folly to the world so the mystical creed of the perfect impenetrability of art was established and the secret society of artists begun and at the same time a parallel cult in painting was arranged in the same fashion paul cezanne happened to be a man very like flaubert a rather simple soul who had to impose a prodigious discipline upon himself in order to make his stiff fingers supple enough to produce a work that should be as lucid and as solid as the art of the museums for him like flaubert it was a terrible effort to make himself comprehensible to be faithful to what he saw and at the same time to reveal to others what he had seen by an exercise of the will like flaubert's he triumphed like flaubert 
among many failures and as a result of them he produced a number of pictures which are solid and individual and simple he struggled for lucidity and he achieved it and if you wish to know and enjoy the directness of the art at which he aimed you have only to go to the commando collection at the louvre and stand in front of the masterpiece called la maison du pendu and the commando collection will do you this further service if you are still oppressed by the intimidations of the cezanne cult that it will help you to see how naturally the finest work of cezanne takes its place among the finest work of degas of renoir of camille passaro yes and of sicily cezanne is perhaps the clumsiest of the great phalanx but sometimes by the sheer intensity which the effort to overcome it imposed upon him he achieves a more piercing result even than they but he is an equal in the company of equals but of course it is not the lucidity which cezanne so painfully won which interests the flobardians of painting they regarded as very reprehensible that cezanne was lucid they prefer to dazzle you with the obscure and experimental exercises he undertook in order to discipline himself and if you are courageous and insist that in his finished work all the obscurity has disappeared leaving something that you can enjoy with an intense delight they will smile disdainfully and pretend that your enjoyment proves that you know nothing about it at all art is incomprehensible they chant save to us alone if you think it is comprehensible then you are a fool so in the last generation the worship of the heavenly twins has spread flaubert has been divinified into tweedledum cezanne into tweedledee and they have done nothing whatever to deserve it both were faithful servants of art both were indeed heroes of art for what was comparatively easy for others was terribly hard for them not born great they achieved greatness but when they died greatness of another kind which they would have been the first to disown was thrust upon them men who had made themselves heroes by the agony of their efforts to conquer lucidity were made gods of incomprehensibility since that time flow bart has become a moloch holocausts of promising artists have been sacrificed to him a young writer or a young painter is crushed under the weight of an accumulated prestige so that he no longer dares to make the effort to be comprehensible by an astonishing extravagance of perversity he has been induced to believe that it is necessary that he should be incomprehensible and the prestige of flaubert is powerfully seconded by the attitude of romanticism into which the civilization of the nineteenth century has forced him he believes and we have seen that it is largely true that the artist is inevitably in rebellion against modern society how can he more evidently behave as a rebel than by deliberately refusing to be intelligible even to that portion of society that may desire to understand him flo bart smiles upon his impulse and watches him complacently as he rushes off to commit harikari upon the altar proclaiming the preeminence of art by annihilating it nor is it surprising that this juju should be practised with the most extravagant fury by inhabitants of the united states of america in those states the materialism of modern civilization has reached extremity the romantic reaction against it is therefore also extreme flaubert appears in america as the saviour for an act of homage to him is the only possibility of protest intelligent young americans turn to europe many of them bodily and seize with frenzy upon all that is most esoteric in the european practice of the new religion they fling themselves into the cult of incomprehensibility with all the ardour of exasperated youth they bow down to its prophets and worship them and in their magazines they offer up prayers to flaubert of which this is one a barrel organ monkey speaks the children laugh but i don't the crank goes round desperate elves and hopeless gnomes and frantic fairies gush clumsily from the battered box fattish and mysterious the flower-stricken sunlight is thickening dizzily is reeling gently the street and the children and the monkey and the organ are dancing slowly are tottering up and down in a trembly mist of atrocious melody tiniest dead tunes crawl upon my face my hair is lousy with mutilated singing microscopic things in my ears scramble faintly tickling putrescent atomies and i feel the jerk of the little string the tiny smiling shabby man is yelling over the music i understand him i shove my round red hat back on my head i sit up and blink at you with my solemn eyes which never smile this is a portion of a poem 
by mr cummings which appeared in the dial for april nineteen twenty two the first noticeable thing about it is that mr cummings is trying desperately to be incomprehensible and he has considerable difficulty he uses little eyes for big ones and abolishes stops strictly in order to make himself unreadable still he can be read and he knows it so he has to write two lines which are pure nonsense tiniest dead tunes etc the comprehensible part is commonplace but the artist never admits that he is deliberately aiming at incomprehensibility he will smile his superior smile when we point to his little eyes for big ones and if he could be induced to condescend to our level of stupidity which he will never do he would also say i have my reasons it is useless for us to ask him what they are because one of the first articles in the Blobart creed is that the artist never explains his art since he is condemned to silence we must appoint one of ourselves to be his advocate let us listen to the affable alter ego of cummings artist alter ego i use i because i do not wish to insist upon my personality in this poem i am not i i am merely a sentence my personality is in abeyance the mere philistine i understand but has it never occurred to you that insistence and emphasis are relative in a normal conversation i attract attention equally whether i shout or whisper the emphasis lies in departure from the norm a a e surely you're not going to deny that little i is smaller than capital i t m p not at all it is precisely because it is smaller that it is more emphatic a a e why should i have a capital if i don't want it t m p there is no reason at all if art consists in doing what you want to do there is no reason why you shall not always write your name instead of cummings sign muck if you like it better that way but i understood that you desired to convey to some one that your personality was in abeyance that you were on this occasion a passive consciousness invaded by sights and sounds c a e well what of it t m p only that you are going quite the wrong way about it by writing little i for capital i you are merely concentrating attention upon your personality the letters of the alphabet are merely conventional symbols of four sounds they are useful precisely because they are fixed conventions if you want if you want to alter them do so by all means and accept the consequence that you write to be understood by yourself alone you prefer the look of sidnamuk then have it signamuk but don't forget to pronounce it cummings otherwise you will be in the awful position of having been compelled to change the sound of your name by a mere convention other people of course will call you signamuk or perhaps finding that awkward something less recondite but that won't matter to such a convinced individualist as yourself say e e but james joyce does much worse things than that t m p worse perhaps but nothing quite so stupid as changing capital i into little i c a e producing the artist's bible revised version ulysses and turning over the pages hurriedly look at that isn't that worse than eyes which never smile t m p looks at eglintonize looked up sky brightly there is some sense in joyce's method i've no difficulty in understanding what he means and why he writes it in that fashion he wants to give me the direct physical sensation of a peculiar glance given by john eglinton he wants to give me the sense of the bright swiftness of the glance from those sky-blue eyes i'm not sure whether he succeeds the real question to settle is whether the effort and delay involved by my having to separate and recognize the elements in eglinton eyes and sky brightly in order to combine them is not so great as to nullify the impression of swiftness i rather think it is but i am doubtful and since i am doubtful the experiment has proved to have been worth making but you my dear signa muck are merely a fool when you write eyes which never smile if you were trying as you are not to convey a sensation of swiftness of a single act in its native wholeness as joyce was trying to do you would still be a fool for employing such a device for it is obvious in this case that the effort needed to disintegrate that word completely nullifies any effect of simultaneity which might be produced by writing it in one word my apprehension of eyes which never smile is at least four times as swift as my apprehension of eyes which never smile unless i can separate the component words i cannot understand the phrase the normal method of writing enables me to understand the phrase quite easily if you still desire to give me an impression of simultaneity you may use the normal symbol and write eyes which never smile hyphenated that will remind you dear signamuck of the woman who did and the boy who was tired and that reminder will cause you pain
s a e but look at this shows t and p a page from ulysses beginning bronze by gold heard the hoof irons steely ringing imperthnen thethnen chips picking chips off rocky thumbnail chips horrid and gold flushed more a husky five note blue 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 bloom is on the gold pinnacled hair a jumping rose on satiny breasts of satin rose of castile trilling trilling i dolores peep who's in the peep of gold what about that t m p yes i admit it's pretty bad it seems to me utterly wrong-headed but i know what joyce is trying to do each one of those unintelligible phrases recurs in its proper context in the next pages of the narrative they might be described if i were charitable as a kind of shorthand statement of the theme to be developed but i'm not charitable i once spent twenty good minutes puzzling over that page and i bear joyce a grudge for it so without waiting to discuss whether such a statement of theme has in itself any value i would say that it is a lunatic act to place it where it is where it is it is not and cannot possibly have any meaning s a e do you mean to say joyce is a fool t m p certainly a fool but also a man of genius i'm afraid my dear signum you haven't that excuse for yourself you try to be incomprehensible because you think you ought to be joyce is incomprehensible because he cannot help it he is an egomaniac the rousseau de nos jours all the aberrations of which we can see the beginnings in jean jacques reach an extreme intensity in him he is a contorted like Aquan in a death struggle with the serpent of his inhibitions he belongs to the most backward nation of the west and he has been condemned to do for ireland what rousseau had to do for europe what was almost a natural gesture one hundred and fifty years ago is an act of frenzy now rousseau was sane and tame compared to him and just as ireland itself is centuries behind the level of the european consciousness joyce is a man who has to leap a mile in a single stride his effort is superhuman and still he is not abreast his strength is spent in liberating the world from inhibitions which it no longer feels he has to achieve the evolution from mediaevalism to modernity in a night deep in him is the knowledge that he is the scapegoat of a race no wonder he is an egomaniac the purity of irish women the savagery of the irish clans the futility of irish humour the resentment of ireland against an alien culture the revolt of ireland against a church that has been european in every country of europe that but ireland these are a few of the instincts that joyce has had to satisfy by annihilating them in himself he is the voodoo man of san domingo appointed ambassador in paris he is the perfect cosmopolitan and the perfect savage qu'il est exotique jean jacques only came from savoy joyce comes from the hyperboreans jean jacques was the voice of his age joyce is the voice of dead centuries the history of ireland in the last few years will have its place a strange place in the history of the world ulysses will have precisely the same place in the world's literature i'm afraid my dear signimuk that these considerations will bore you they have so little to do with art but they should have some interest for you you are an american america is not so backward as ireland it is not so old but it has spent the hundred odd years of its life just like ireland in devouring the children of its womb your men of talent flee to europe but they do not belong to europe and they cannot become part of it for they are in a fever of rebellion against constraints which were abolished for europe long ago because they are conscious of their native puritanism they behave as the orgias of liberty the knowledge that they are aliens to european civilization drives them to assume the airs of superculture and they call their self lacerations art they rush into the service of flaubert where they can vent their exasperations under a mask of superiority like the priests of Arisia, they gain possession of the temple by slaying the priests before them and like the priests of Arisia, they are a prey to perpetual fears lest another priest may come and murder them they are the true outlaws of civilization they cannot rest in their own country and they have no abiding place in any other i tell you my dear signa muck that art is not european at all it is only the latest american invention it is a patented device by which backward nations and backward individuals in any nation can procure themselves the illusion of having got abreast ahead even of a civilization and a tradition which are not instinctive in them if it were not that genius is a phenomenon independent of civilization and tradition art would be as worthless spiritually as a vacuum cleaner but genius is as possible in a backward nation as in a civilized one but the device of art genius will yield only a fraction of its true potentialities flaubert cannot kill genius he can only deprive it of most of its value but he can murder a talent i think he has come near to murdering yours poor signamuck 
for i can see little of it remaining goodbye end of section thirteen end of discoveries essays in literary criticism by john middleton murray